Good morning and a warm welcome to all of you here at SOIS and those of you who are following virtually. Um, it's great to have, finally, to have an in-person annual conference again. We had to postpone this conference, which was originally planned for the spring of this year due to the pandemic. But because this uh, conference also marks our fifth anniversary, we definitely wanted to have a live event. So we postponed it. Here we are. Um, we are live and partly virt virtually here, but we're also almost six years old now. But I don't think that, that matters. Last night, uh, we had our official anniversary event at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences with many of you present here today, in addition to politicians, diplomats, journalists, think tankers, and fellow academics and students. And I will repeat what I said there last night. None of us feels in the mood for celebrations amidst, amidst Russia's war against Ukraine. Nevertheless, we decided to mark Tsoi's birthday, which has also shaped the organization of the co conference, of the program of the conference. And unlike in previous years, where we had chosen a particular theme that invited us to present uh, different disciplinary and methodologically diverse perspectives from the wider region of Eastern Europe, we have taken the liberty to use the Tsoi's research clusters as our structure for the conference program. And we were keen to showcase some of, the own, of our own research from the last five years. And we will draw on four of our research clusters today. We will draw on youth in Eastern Europe, conflict dynamics and border regions, migration and diversity, and political economy and integration. Researchers from the fifth research cluster societies between stability and change will, of course, also take part and highlight some of the cross-cutting themes between our research clusters. And obviously, we can't showcase all of our research. We also can't address all of the themes we work on and even all of the places, countries, regions we work on. So if you're curious about um, more research uh, done at SOIS, I recommend that you check out our eye posters, which we um, uh, display on the screen outside, and you will see an uh, even wider variety of topics we deal with. In line with our understanding of inter- and transdisciplinary work, we're also featuring research that engages with or borrows methods from the visual arts. And as we want SOIS annual conferences to be interactive meeting places, uh, we will also uh, invite you to explore a video and photo exhibition that you will be able to tour individually and also tour with respon responsible researchers and artists. Of course, we don't only want to focus on our own research today, but we want to place it in dialogue with you, with partners and guests who present work on related themes and discuss um, the work um, we are doing. Some of you have traveled far and we're particularly grateful to you. I also see among the German and international guests um, here in the room, but also on the screen, some who have participated in several events we've organized over the years. Some of you were present at our opening event in early 2017. And it's nice to see that cooperation and friendship have grown over the years. You have all helped to make SOIS what it is today. You were curious about SOIS, its research, its in, as, as a new institution. You have been open to meet and cooperate with us. You have provided constructive feedback on institutional and academic matters. And by engaging with us in our work, you have helped us take our place in the international field of East European studies. A big thank you to all of you. The ongoing war has, of course, shaped our conference preparations as we were adjusting the program that had originally been planned for the spring of this year. We decided uh, not to make it an entirely Ukraine-focused um, conference. We have held and will hold uh, many more events and workshops dedicated to research on Ukraine, the war and its implications. But this year, we're trying to combine a review of Tsoi's research uh, with uh, discussion about uh, the war and its implications for research not only on Ukraine but also the wider region of Eastern Europe. And our conference this evening will end with or will culminate in a panel discussion that addresses these issues. So before we move to the first panel, 
let me thank those who have worked very hard on the logistics of this conference. And they've done it more or less twice in the spring and now. And this is our choice communications team, our administration, our IT, and of course our student assistants. So please join me in thanking them. I look forward to our discussions and now hand over to my colleague Felix Kravacek, who is the head of the research cluster Youth Initiative. Okay, a very warm welcome also from my side. Um, I'm very glad to moderate this first panel on our anniversary conference which is devoted to how we research young people across Eastern Europe. And it reflects also on a personal interest that kind of I've grown up with um, because I've always, always found it quite fascinating to think about these very diverse political, social and economic conditions that we see across all of Europe really um, and beyond that and how that impacts on the political preferences that young people and as young people outgrow that status of young people, how that impacts on their political and social preferences. And that interest began personally when I observed how my own personal political and social views started to deviate in some ways and in other ways to affirm those that I was taught at home, those that I was brought up with at school or that we discussed um, among friends and how views among my circle of friends started to be more aligned and to differ more from those of other groups of friends that we no longer were in contact with. And looking across the region that we all in the room seek to understand, um, I personally think that a lot more energy can actually be devoted to understanding the role of these very diverse political, cultural, social and economic regimes because they impact on the habitat for young people and for their political upbringing. These regimes, they all matter, as we'll hear in our panel this morning, for the political ideologies that young people affirm, for those that they reject, what young people think about the idea of Europe, or how they relate to the multifaceted history of the region that they live in. And youth, of course, is important and interesting because it's such a social laboratory, laboratory for all kinds of political regimes. Even those young East Europeans that are fortunate enough to live in democratically governed countries are, for instance, very often exposed to dogmatic forms of patriotic education, to just give one example. It's an education, as many of you will know, that is projecting a very idealized, sometimes even sanitized version of national history onto young people with this idea to strengthen a sense of national belonging and national community. Youth is attractive for politicians in all systems, Seemingly, young people embody the future, even if today's young people, as we know, will be very different from those who will be the future grown-ups, in quotation marks. And we all realize that when we look into the mirror and think about, well, what would 21-year-old me think about my po uh, political or social views? But despite all the diversity that I've sketched now in terms of political, economic and social conditions, of course, young East Europeans, they all share one very important fact, um, and that is that it's the first generation that has to base its views on the Soviet or communist past primarily on mediation, um, since that's the first generation to lack a direct experience of the Soviet era. And how that past is mediated, how it is narrated, is an interesting result of competing actors trying to kind of gain an authority over what it means to continue driving that past forward and what it means for the political present. Beyond that, today's young generation is also the second generation to have grown up after the collapse of the Iron Curtain in 1991. So if you want to use that phrase, in a way it's the first post-Soviet post generation, which underlines what Gwendolyn Sasso was saying yesterday, that actually this paradigm of the transition away from communism is really no longer the one that we ought to apply to think about the region. So how do young people engage with these ghosts of the past and what political or social values do they articulate across the region that we are all interested in? What can we know about the reach of governmental initiatives at shaping young minds that is so central to many of the political systems across all of Europe? 
My name is Felix Kravacek. I'm, as Gwendolyn said, leading the research cluster on youth in Eastern Europe. And these are some of the questions that we'll explore this morning during our first panel. Three presenters are going to share their insights on the topic. And their respective research projects all stand at different kind of positions in the life shelf of a research project, just as they all stand themselves in different relations to youth. Each speaker will have a bit more than 15 minutes for her presentation, and I have some opening question for each talk. That, <laughs> that reflects very much on what we associate with youth. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so our first speaker is Veronika Pfeilschifter. Uh, she has a background in political science and is a PhD student at the University of Jena and affiliated with the research cluster here at SOIS. She will speak about her doctoral research, which is devoted to left-wing youth in the South Caucasus. Our second speaker is Marnie Howlett, who is somewhere on the screen and who is physically in Canada. And I'm very thankful for her to make the effort. And it's 1 a.m. and almost 2 a.m. now for her. Um, Marnie is a postdoctoral researcher from the University of Oxford. Um, she will offer a reflection on her finished doctoral work on youth but also the first postdoctoral research project that she has embarked on. Mani focuses on Ukraine um, and, um, as I said, kind of shows how we transcend temporal boundaries in academia, um, seemingly without any effort, if I look at her on the screen here. Um, and then lastly, there's Nina Fries, um, my colleague from Zeus, who is a scholar of Slavic literature and culture. And she'll speak about one of her latest research projects, which is an ambi ambitious collaborative research project, kind of which is, has been concluded um, moment on, for the moment. Um, I'm very much looking forward to all three of you presenting your work. And Veronica, the floor is yours. As they prepare, let me maybe just say, I'll have some opening questions to each of the presenters. Uh, we'll take them in rows, and then we'll open it up to you so that you can all join the discussion. I think the screen is almost ready. All right, um, so good morning, everyone. And thank you very much to Felix for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to have the chance um, to be part of today's event and I also would like um, to thank everyone who was involved um, in the organization. So I think that you can conclude uh, from the title of my today's presentation, New Horizons of Expectations, that I begin my PhD journey in a cautious, hopeful light, framed by, if you want so, Ernst Bloch's notion of the not yet. Before I start diving into this more, let me try to reflect on the post-Soviet societal moment around 20 years ago. The beginning of the 2000s is an episode which takes place rather briefly after the collapse of and dissolution of the Soviet Union. The end of communism has, as Enzo Traverso argues, broken the dialectic between past and future. Traverso states that we are in a time which is between an unmasterable past and a denied future between a past that won't go away and a future that cannot be invented or predicted except in terms of catastrophe. In his monograph, Left in Melancholia, Traverso maintains that the beginning of the 21st century leaves us without any utopias and left a present charged with memory but unable to protect itself into the future. According to Traverso, there is no visible horizon of expectation. Judging from the, two from the title of my presentation, you can assume that I want to make an effort at least to try to question this argument by engaging with the empirical realities in the South Caucasus. In order to do so, let me elaborate on the crucial societal developments to sharpen our outlook towards the region. Let's go into the year 2003. In Georgia, one head of state, 
The former Soviet foreign minister Eduard Shevardnadze is toppled in one charismatic but ruthless reformer comes to power in what is broadly refer referred to as the Rose Revolution. Saakashvili and his club of reformers had doubtful attempts of coming to terms with the Soviet past, and those attempts were certainly far away from what we could call reconciliation. In 2013, a transition followed. The new government announced to hold accountable those who committed human rights violations. This, however, turned out to be a mission which was based on retribution, on revenge, which didn't bring forward societal healing. In Armenia, the 2000s are characterized by the aftermath of the first Nagorno-Karabakh war, by rampant corruption in state institutions and profound material grievances in everyday life. Also here, little room seemed to have been left to come to terms with the Soviet past. The mid of the 2000s saw the rise of new oligarchic economic elites that acquired leverage over political structures. However, still, 15 years later, a sense of deep optimism and hope emerged in 2018 the year when a non-violent revolution took place, which led to the overthrow of the old corrupt government. In this context, the new head of state also promised the introduction of transitional justice to Armenians. Today, those talks have grown quiet in the wake of the horrendous Second Nagorno-Karabakh War initiated by Azerbaijan in 2020, which led to the death of thousands of in particular young men and boys on both sides. As for Azerbaijan, it has to be concluded that no attempt of coming to terms with the past has ever been a topic among the political elites. As many of us are aware, Azerbaijan has, with a six-year break in the 1990s, been ruled by the same family since 1969. Ilham Aliyev took the idea of dynastic nationalism further and consolidated an Azerbaijani nationalist concept, which is built in opposition to the Armenian one. Profound human rights violations in all dimensions have remained characteristic. However, as we will see in a minute, this situation does not at all remain without resistance from the Azerbaijani society, in particular not from its youth. On this note, let me elaborate on the role of youth. The 2000s can contradictory to the popular hypothesis of a weak post-Soviet civil society in all three societies be described as full of vibrant youth movements. Those visible youth movements mostly aim for liberal democratization and were outraged by everyday political and economic violence. Kmara, Georgian for Enough, founded in 2003, was probably the most famous youth group, which was liberal, nationalist, and anti-Soviet. These ideological positionalities aligned well with Saakashvili's government, and thus youth here stood for a new, modern vision of society. What mostly, though, is not being told as part of the whole story is that youth back then and also today was in no way homogenous or coherent. What we see is that the understandings of democracy, discontent, and justice sometimes were rather quite contradictory. We understand, of course, that a leftist conceptualization of democracy has different implications than a centrist or right-wing one. That being said, we can see is that parallel to famous youth movements, small collectives and groups emerged in Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. In Georgia, it was in 2011 that the first left-wing youth group was formed at Tbilisi State University. It was the first student group which tried to rehabilitate socialist thought. In years to come, a new, lef a new wave of leftist activism followed, and an alliance of young social democrats, feminists, anarchists, and communists emerged. Today, six years later, those young leftists have been growing up, and I'm referring to Felix, a new post, post-Soviet left has been emerging, though rather, of course, quietly. In Armenia, the leftist political landscape can first and foremost be widely characterized by struggle in terms of green anti-capitalist activism. An anti-mining movement which aimed to protect a forest in the northern province Lori became the epicenter of activism, which resisted neoliberal policies. Many intergenerational initiatives have been emerging since then. Another important branch of Armenia's left-wing youth are various feminist groups, which some of them focus on public education. And you can see one example here on the slide, which is called Fem Library, which is an open library in Yerevan um, aiming at um, increasing knowledge on feminist theories and practice. Coming now finally to Azerbaijan, we can diagnose here as well that there has been a form of leftist tradition among Azerbaijan's post-Soviet youth, in particular in terms of Marxism and anarchist ideas. Azerbaijani left-wing youth had another particular monument in 2020, 
when a group of around 20 young leftists published an anti-war manifesto and declared solidarity with common Armenians. So diving into these empirical developments gives, in my view, a different narrative of the South Caucasus, which is today still mostly portrayed through the lenses of government centricity, geopolitics and Europeanization. And whilst I do not want to diminish the value of these lenses, I think that they sometimes tend to obscure ideational dynamics in their own right. I believe that it is important to move youth research on the South Caucasus beyond an analysis of the famous movements, which have already been explored enough. I think it is important to introduce a different ratio, which does not look at youth as a form of instrument or as a, f as a movement. Instead, I want to make the point that it is highly relevant for us the Western, if you want German, most audience, but also for local academic communities and certainly politicians to understand what young people think, what are they, their ideas and visions of society, what they consider as just, what they consider as unjust, what they consider as painful, violent, what they make out of the past, what are their own experiences of everyday life and grievances. Then this could help to close a quite vast research gap on ideological analysis and critique of ideology in this part of the world. And thus, my research and the questions I pose and, and try to answer um, are the following. Which political ideologies does the new left in the South Caucasus represent? How has the new left conceptualized what transitional justice means to them with regards to the Soviet and post-Soviet governments, human rights, abuses and violence? Which intergenerational differences can be found? And also, is there any overlap or a contradiction between the state in use and grassroots imagined transitional justice? Thus, my four central concepts are political ideology. And here I apply an affirmative definition of ideology, which is a system of beliefs and ideas which are accepted and not immune to everyday life. <coughs> transitional or transformative justice, so the question of how to come to terms and reckon with a violent past. And here, mechanisms of holding accountable elites, but also of restoring one's rights, for instance, through material or social compensation, are possible. And in this context, we have to analyze, uh, underline that when we are looking at the South Caucasus, we are looking at the region which has gone through multiple forms of violence, so to name post-Soviet violence, post-conflict and post-authoritarian violence. The third concept is generational, generation intergenerationality. So the established main, mainstream literature looks at generation at a group of people which, the, which have the same foundational experiences. However, the argument I make, and this argument has been made earlier, for instance, also in Felix's work, is also to look what people expect and aim for the future. And then we can see that the young and the old leftists actually might belong to the same generation. And then the most crucial point, of course, is what, what, we have, what I've been asking myself uh, for a long time is, so what's, what's left after all, um, in particular um, in, in this part of the world? And um, I think here it is important that we distinguish between left is what left youth makes out of it, and we can try also to implement or introduce an idea from above. And there is certain tension there. We also can come to this later in the discussion. Also, one question that we can ask ourselves then, is there a right-wing hegemony among youth or is, is, this a, is this a wrong assumption? And also what we have seen um, in focus groups um, that were conducted in Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan is um, that there is a distinct understanding of left and right which does not necessarily correspond um, with our understanding of Western cleavages. So very often we heard um, that the opposition is considered as left and the government as right or the past is uh, looked at as left and the present as right. Um, so we have to ask ourselves how um, suitable the right-left scheme is to describe the societal cleavages. Now let me present what is really ahead um, So in my doctoral project. And um, so I will not be writing a dissertation, but it will be four um, empirical contributions, so four um, different articles. And uh, what I try to do in these articles is to look at left from various angles. So my first contribution focuses on the academic or the intellectual, what I call old and new left, probably the, the term needs to be rephrased. And I have chosen this case study since uh, leftist activism started at the universities and is most prevalent there until today in Georgia. And you can see that I'm applying different methods. I will come uh, to this in one minute. 
My second study focuses specifically on female leftists only and their transitional justice activism. So I do assume that there is a specific gendered experience of being a woman, specific rights violations um, which were committed against women, and um, thus specific understandings of violence, and also there is a speci spe specific way of how female leftists navigate through societies. And the third contribution, which is um, very much in the framework as, as the first contribution, um, looks at the intergenerational understanding of justice among left, the new left in Azerbaijan. And its novelty is probably the proposed method, which will be intergenerational focus groups, thus guided conversations between grown-up and uh, leftist and their younger counterparts. And the fourth contribution looks at the group of social workers, uh, which have organized themselves in trade unions and compares their political ideas and conceptualizations of justice in Georgia and Azerbaijan. And here the main reference point is socioeconomic injustice at the workplace and uh, socioeconomic rights. So let me briefly uh, give a bit more close um, overview of what I'm doing in two of the studies, in the first one on Georgia and in the third one on Azerbaijan. So the first study is a single case study, um, which consists mostly of structured conceptual interviews, uh, and the research is actually about to start this week. Um, and it will take place in Tbilisi, Batumi, Kutaisi, and this is the places where most of the young leftists are located, potentially also in Gori, which is uh, the capital, um, excuse me, the birthplace of uh, Stalin. And what are the central aspects of analysis? So one very important point is the ideological self-positioning. So here I will ask questions such as, how do you describe your own belief system? Is there an ideological tradition that you see yourself belonging to? Is there a motto uh, which sums up your belief system? What are your views towards the Soviet Union, towards Russia, towards the US? Their understanding of human rights and political vi violence do you think, for example, that human rights violations occurred in, G in Georgia, which were most characteristic? Can you rank the governments in terms of their level of political violence? Another aspect are the experience of human rights violations. So how, how do respondents engage with everyday life? In this, context, in this context, it is very crucial for me to understand the legacies of human rights violations on the minds um, of the respondents. And then another point is the understanding of and the demands towards transitional justice. So my, esti my basic estimation here is that the own experiences and the ideological self-positioning inform a certain outlook towards transitional justice. And here I pose qu questions such as whether they are familiar with the transitional justice processes in Georgia, what would be, be their demands, which form of society uh, do want to live young people in. And the third study on Azerbaijan is very similar. I will try to make this very brief and then come to my conclusion. Um, so this is also a single case study and the interviews will be biographical. They will also be on site observations. So where I basically look at the spaces uh, that young leftists um, engage in and we will have the intergenerational focus groups and the research takes place in Baku and in Lankaran, which is in the south of Azerbaijan where there were uh, student protests last year. All right, um, so then let me come to my last slide already, um, which is an outlook and, on, and a reflection on the opportunities and risks of this project, um, but also on researching left-wing youth more generally, in particular when the researcher herself is, is also young. Um, so one central question which deserves space for reflection for any scientific study, I think never mind if it is a historical or an ethnographic one, is certainly the aspect of how the researcher themselves is embedded in the field of study and the topic. <coughs> and I would like to say that my um, project aims what I call dialogic epistemology, which underlines the principles of egalitarianism and a form of co-creation with the research subjects. Um, so here it is important for me to reflect on the various power dynamics, horizontal vertical power relations. And another aspect is that though the project gives space to non-hegemonic voices, it does not aim to reproduce discourses, um, but aims to approach them critically. And here I think it is crucial to distinguish between the aspect of neutrality and objectivity. So while I think it is very hard uh, to to be neutral towards the topic, I think that ethical uh, research standards demand um, objective um, approaches, of course. Um, <clears throat> and my last aspect would be that um, the researcher takes part, however, is not part. This has uh, specific implications in terms of the research ethics, self-limitation and self-identification. 
So here I'm cautious to maintain a balance between being frank, what I write, but also aware that social science research is not a form of political activism. My own biographical availability with the topic, I have also my own political socialization, uh, which um, may play a role. However, there needs to be constant critical uh, self-reflection once navigating through. And uh, while I think that um, we sometimes tend to go into performative roles of empowering those uh, that we interview, I think we also must be aware that we leave the research field and the power political struggles continue to be carried out uh, on the ground in the analog world, not in the digital world. And let me conclude then now my presentation um, by going back to the beginning and to the title of my presentation. So I would like um, to quote the German philosopher Hans-Georg Gadamer who stated, the horizon is the range of vision that includes everything that can be seen from a particular vantage point. To have a horizon means not being limited to what is nearby, but also being able to see beyond it. And I think keeping this thought in mind when researching youth, in particular left-wing youth in a post-socialist context, shall prove to be somewhat helpful at least. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. Yeah, I think the last point that you made about the emotional and biographical proximity, which is both I mean, a unique opportunity to access the field, because you are kind of have maybe an easier way of opening the door to these interviews than someone of my age, um, undoubtedly a couple of years older than you. Um, and nevertheless, there are some threats to how we engage with that proximity and not being kind of taken hostage in a way by, by the interview. I think that's that's an important point that will accompany us throughout the panel as we kind of have different positions and relationships to youth. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, more related to the empirical material that you that you presented, um, of course, the left is by definition a transnational project, has a transnational ambition. And looking at the South Caucasus, how do you assess that relationship between the kind of unique South Caucasian features of the ideas of the left that you expect to encounter, especially in places where, as you rightly underlined, we wouldn't necessarily even think about there being a leftist movement, such as in, in Azerbaijan. Um, how do these movements relate to the transnational dynamics, um, both within these three countries, but also larger transnational field um, and there being kind of very unique or distinct ideas of leftism that you expect to encounter across across the region yeah very good question um, so I think what is important like to answer um, your question is to go back into the domestic context first then look at the regional context and then at the at the global context um, so I think that the left in all three um, societies has developed in a specific context and this is also reflected in the term in terms of their political ideologies so left is looked at differently in Georgia Armenia and Azerbaijan though there are certain political ideologies and mostly this Marxism and social democracy that are there um, in all three societies there is nuances and um, so for example in Azerbaijan there is definitely more prevalence of anarchist and feminist ideas in Armenia there is more prevalence um, of ecological ideas and then Ar and in Georgia it is social democratic um, and socialist ideas I would say and um, there is of course the question whether this is an interpretation uh, and excuse me, whether it is like a repetition um, of the ideas we see in the West, so whether this is a repetition of Western Marxism, and to a certain degree it is, um, because there is specific uh, traditions, ideological traditions um, that uh, those young people relate to. So we can say, yes, there is a certain form of, of Western um, repetition. Um, however, on the other hand, um, I would also say that there is not so much transnational relations between the countries and um, between the different left groups. There is attempts to have them now more. So for example, when the second Nagorno-Karabakh uh, war took place, there was more cooperation between Armenian and Azerbaijani leftists uh, in the light of everything that's been happening. But based on the informal conversations that I had so far is that the left, some of the leftists themselves would like to have like a regional alliance, um, but they say that they have not engaged with each other sufficiently enough, so they are more focused on the dom a domestic um, perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question that came up when listening to you now and thinking about what we what we discussed yesterday as well is that since February, the political discourse across Europe and I presume in the South Caucasus as well 
has shifted a lot to, well, what impact does Russia have on, on its neighborhood and how do we contain what Russia um, is doing, how do we engage with these, uh, with the threat that the country poses. Um, and as we know also from a West European context, the left doesn't always have a particularly easy relationship um, to the Russian regime or one that has been criticized now more severely. Um, I know that you've been researching the South Caucasian left also from here, from Germany through digital means. Um, how has the war impacted on the political discussions that you have been seeing um, and the field of political ideologies and maybe also the relationship to Russia that movements in the South Caucasus express? Mm. Yes, yeah, so I would say that there is really a, a huge uh, difference between how the governments uh, reacted and, and how the governments embed them ideologically and politically and how the left-wing youth uh, looks, looks at the conflict. So my, in, in the Georgian context, of course, um, we have a very specific political situation, right, because of the 2008 war and the occupation of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So there is, uh, among the Georgian government, of course, Russia is seen as the main threat. There is really, like, actual fear. Um, that um, that the security threats towards Georgia um, would increase. Um, however, I think among the Georgian left, there is a specific distinction in, t in terms of Russian language, Russian society, and Russian elites. This is at least what I observe. So while um, the Georgian left is very critical uh, towards the Russian elites, um, it behaves differently towards Russian society. So as we know, around 30,000 uh, Russians came to Georgia, and um, this created also so social tensions within the country. Um, I would say, though, that like those leftists that I observed um, look do not try to politicize the issue more. That's, that's what I would say. And in Armenia, the situation is difficult because, um, well, the second Nagorno-Karabakh war uh, took place two years ago. And um, in March, um, there was another aggression by Azerbaijan against Nagorno-Karabakh. So these societies have like their own conflicts and they are very marked by these own conflicts. So I would say that while there is solidarity among the Armenian left, uh, towards um, Ukraine and Ukrainians, and there is also an uneasy relationship um, towards um, what, ha what happened earlier when, when the Nagorno-Karabakh war uh, took place. Yeah. Thank you very much, Veronika. Um, and we now... Um, we will now try to get Marni on that screen. Um, I can already see on the small screen, as I said, Marnie joins us from Saskatoon, so it is 2 a.m. for her now. Um, and Marnie, you should just be able to share your screen. We can already see you. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, very a uh, huge thank you to Felix for inviting me uh, to be here today. Unfortunately, I'm not able to be physically present, but I'm glad that thanks to technology, uh, we can all be in the same space uh, and time virtually. Uh, today, I'm going to speak about uh, some of my research. Um, unlike Veronica, I have not studied re uh, youth in one uh, one holistic project, but rather youth weave through uh, much of the work um, that I have done up until this point in my career. So with this throughout my presentation, I am going to speak about a few different projects that I have worked on and am working on at this current time. Um, and with this, hopefully we can talk about uh, the methodological, the ethical, uh, and the positionality considerations that researchers uh, like myself and the others on this panel uh, think about uh, when we are researching young people within specifically the former Soviet space. So my presentation today will focus a little bit more on um, sort of what Veronica's last slide was about and extend to where my lessons learned through my own research, uh, the challenges, the disadvantages that I've um, encountered while working with young people um, and then I'll, I'll conclude with some reflections about uh, researching youth going forward within the context of the war. So throughout uh, my research I've realized that few studies have analyzed the ways that young people engage with politics and socio-political happenings or phenomena. Often and as I've seen uh, as a political scientist 
is that we consistently focus on the long-term psychosocial impacts, uh, the socialization and educational factors like Felix mentioned, but we don't always look specifically at the ways young people engage with politics themselves and whether or not they do. This often comes from the assumption that young people are not engaged with politics. Um, I'm thinking here about young people under the age of 18, but this can extend um, up until um, age 35 or however we largely define youth as a category. I've done quite extensive work uh, volunteering with young people in Ukraine, particularly individuals under the age of 18. And so this is where my own personal interest lies. This is how I would define the category of youth. Uh, and again, these individuals are more uh, likely to be excluded from larger political discussions, but we do see similar trends um, with younger people just uh, past the age of 18. There are Given um, my definition of youth um, and the people that I, I like to work with, uh, there are major ethical considerations, um, often in terms of getting um, ethical approvals by institutions to conduct research themselves, but also in terms of gaining consent and working with and accessing these individuals. Individuals under the age of 18 um, are not often considered to be full citizens or often don't have voting rights in their countries. And because of this, they're often seen to have less political power and or their, uh, their views to be considered less legitimate or important as those of older individuals who do have voting rights or are considered full citizens. In some societies too, uh, we see youth or young people generally having low social standings uh, within society and given uh, less responsibility or less power. Um, and with this, we can see um, that youth often leave the country, making recruitment challenging. Uh, they may have a different educational or work responsibilities compared to other categories of people within societies. Um, and more generally, we see age discrepancies, as Felix mentioned previously, between participants and scholars, which can not only make uh, recruitment challenging, but also make the study itself uh, challenging. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in my presentation, uh, but also within the larger discussion today. But this, uh, though, uh, begs the question of what is the value in studying young people? And as I believe everyone on this panel uh, would argue that there is significant value in studying young people and that they are uh, a significant uh, or a very informative uh, group of people in order to better understand politics as well as society more generally. And I found this um, within my own research. Uh, and so this is my uh, one project that I want to talk about today. So I've put the citation at the bottom, but what I did in this project was I analyzed 45 texts written by young people under the age of 18 in three different regions of Ukraine. These texts were written following a, um, a competition, following the Euromaidan. This competition simply asked individuals, young individuals, to submit any piece of artwork uh, or written contribution, poetry, prose, or otherwise, uh, that reflected what their daily life looked like. Uh, through my textual analysis in this paper, what I found is that young people very much engage, uphold, absorb, and even reproduce very similar national narratives and discourses that adults do within these societies, particularly those relating to violence and trauma. So while I was specifically looking at the ways that individuals engage with the Euromaidan, as this was in 2015, immediately following the demonstrations, what I found is that individuals under the age of 18 were very much reflecting uh, the same sociopolitical views of adults um, and mentioning things that an individual who is age seven or age 11 likely wouldn't be talking about. Or in this way, it was quite surprising for me to see that this political rhetoric very much came in their descriptions of their everyday lives. Um, here, many individuals talked about the war in Donbass. They talked about the annexation of Crimea, the trauma, the grief that they were experiencing. A critique here, and as um, I'm sure the other panelists have come across, is the argument that individuals own, or young individuals only parrot the views of adults or the adults in their lives. But really, as I saw in my own research, is while they might be reflecting or reproducing some of these larger narratives, they are very much aware within how they situate these narratives in larger national discourses, and that they do understand what these events mean uh, for the nation itself, for the Ukrainian nation in particular, as I saw in my own research. This matters for us 
um, as young people are the future of a country, they are future politicians, they are future voters, and they're also uh, responsible for future domestic and foreign policy considerations for their country. There, as I would argue, there therefore re um, remains a need for us to recognize the importance of youth, especially within the former Soviet state and in countries like Ukraine and even in Russia, uh, where we see nation and state building as an ongoing uh, process. During my doctoral studies, I also um, had to move much of my research online due to the pandemic. And with this, I have uh, I ended up analyzing or indirectly analyzing the experience of youth uh, by moving my research online and conducting it through digital tools. But rather than this being a hindrance to my research, instead I found uh, the ways that young people can actually tell us much more about contemporary lived realities than we perhaps give them credit for. This is because youth are actually much more versed in and familiar with digital tools and social media platforms than older populations. And this can really, as I've learned, uh, prove very beneficial for overcoming research challenges uh, like the pandemic, but also now uh, within the context of the war and other conflicts that we will likely see going forward. In this way, it is often easier to conduct research remotely when using and researching this uh, subset of the population. And while they might be more mobile and perhaps don't even live in the countries uh, and we might not be able to access them should we physically go there to conduct field work, um, they are more mobile um, while using these devices, meaning like I am on this call today, they can engage in conversation in a way that we might be we might not be able to should we be um, in person and they can uh, both literally and metaphorically show us much more about politics or about the socio-political happenings and I'll show you a brief slide in a second and as I, I did learn is that youth can also help us interact and engage with other people and this is really important when we think about the pandemic or we think about the war context is that because they are familiar they are using these platforms they can actually help us recruit and engage uh, with older participants um, in ways that we might not be able to do should we be conducting research remotely. I'm just going to show this very briefly. Uh, this is some of my research conducted um, in person in 2018 2020. Here I want to emphasize the ways that I was physically experiencing um, the context in which I, I was situated. Yet when I was conducting my research online, um, here's a photo of a focus group and here is a focus group um, where an individual just briefly left this call. What I was able to see here is that we can very much see our realities, but just in very different ways as individuals, specifically young people, are able to walk around and as is typically what they do in their everyday lives. This gives us a better feel for what are contemporary social lived realities and perhaps a better experience of, of um, the on the ground or the grassroots experience than might, what might be seen um, or understood when talking uh, with older individuals. Still, um, I do want us to recognize and talk about that there are major methodological considerations that need to be taken into consideration some of which I mentioned, but um, most obviously access and ethical considerations, building rapport and trust, which Veronica mentioned at the end of her presentation, um, thinking about ways we can adequately compare young people to older individuals with very different life experiences, um, challenges to finding young people uh, is significant, especially given um, First, especially young people within the post-Soviet space where we see significant migration and in a country like Ukraine, significant emigration um, and mobility patterns as individuals move towards Europe and the EU for work. Finally, there is a major consideration about our positionality as researchers and the ways that we relate to young people's experiences. Uh, well, I would say that I'm a relatively young scholar. Um, as I've conducted my research, um, I will I have seen and experienced the ways that we see different or differences have arisen in that in the ways that I interact with my researchers. And this is something that scholars of all ages need to consider and will consider uh, as they do work with this group of people. Yet, um, what I, I want to emphasize and highlight is that there are ways to overcome these, and this is really important. Um, for us to consider and think about ways that we can and should include this group of people. So while we might see access and ethical considerations, um, as I've done in my own research, is seeing the value um, of using prior networks. Um, given my volunteer experience in Ukraine, I've been able to draw on some of these networks. I've created new partnerships within country organizations, institutions, uh, like different universities um, in particular. 
We're also able to use similar platforms and programs as young people, which actually is a way in for us to build uh, rapport and trust as social media platforms, but also different telecommunication softwares. So using Zoom, for example, Facebook calls, this has really proven useful um, in, the, in the way that we can speak with our people, but also the platforms uh, through which we can speak across uh, and to them. Um, another consideration, something I'd like to emphasize is Recon the recognition that youth are not simply a category to be compared to individuals or older individuals, but they are in fact a unique subsect of the population in and of themselves that holistically help us understand society. Um, rather than us trying to compare them, um, realizing the value of studying youth in and of themselves. And I think this is uh, something my, my panelists or my fellow panelists will be emphasizing today. While we, we might see challenges in finding young people, um, these can be overcome and I'm demonstrating this right now. There are limitations in terms of recognizing sampling um, as I've encountered in, in my own research. Um, these can very much be overcome in the fact that we can use these digital and remote technologies and then be transparent um, and reflective about what we are able and who we are not able to access. And finally, um, when thinking about our positionality as researchers, uh, we need to think about ways in which we can bring other people and perhaps young people onto projects that might help um, to lessen this divide or this perceived divide between our studies of youth. I've done this by working with different co-authors, by hiring research assistants, assistants who are diverse but also might be closer in age to the people that we're studying, but also thinking about ways that we can use other methods and other approaches to analyzing young people, such as the textual analysis that I mentioned, uh, but also creating new partnerships, whether with non-governmental organizations or other organizations and institutions to help bridge these divides. Then just to conclude, I did want to speak briefly about the ways that we think about researching young people into the future. Uh, this is because um, of my own research within the context of Ukraine and seeing the challenges that I'm currently facing, or at least have based up until this current time uh, in terms of researching young people within a, the war and context. So one thing in particular is uh, that I have learned and I am constantly ongoing and uh, continuously thinking about is the ways that we think about researching vulnerable populations um, within um, a sensitive research topic and context. This is true for the war, but also in the, the pandemic and other socio-political events that may affect um, individuals at a personal level. There is a need for us to think about ways not to re-traumatize individuals, but nor ourselves as researchers. And we need to recognize the vulnerabilities and the experiences of some populations within context, how they might feel, um, how our questions may or may not be damaging to them. With this comes also the changing of context, but also the changing of sensitivities towards particular questions and issues, as well as even uh, changing self-perceptions of participants uh, and their own um, self-identifications. In and of itself, this could be traumatizing. So these are major considerations for us uh, to think about going forward within the context of the war or other uh, similar situations. In addition, and as I mentioned, there is this acknowledgement of the positionality of the researcher. Uh, we are often considered to be an outsider, at least many of us who are not directly from the country in which we study. And because of this, there are different physical and emotional barriers that uh, must be crossed in order for us uh, to research the context. This then begs the question of gaining trust or how we gain trust, rapport, and even consent uh, to ensure our research is ethical and transparent. And finally, thinking of ways that we ensure the agency of participants and that this is not lost when we publish us, uh, disseminate uh, our findings, especially when working with these sensitive topics and vulnerable populations. And finally, I think um, there are uh, opportunities right now for us to think about ways to engage with certain populations uh, using diverse approaches. Uh, so whether this be combining quantitative and qualitative research, thinking about other analyses such as the textual one, uh, textual analysis that I mentioned in that ethical approvals was not, were not necessary. There was no re-traumatization because I didn't directly engage with the population, but rather I was able to take what was already established work and work uh, or um, material and then work with that. But we see um, a huge body of material now available on social media platforms, whether in textual form or in video and a photogra or photographic form, such as on Instagram and TikTok. Nevertheless, um, there are many different opportunities that are worthwhile for us to consider uh, going forward within this context. Finally, then, I just want to conclude by saying that there are many different approaches to studying youth. There are 
indeed many challenges to setting young people, both in times of war and peace, but these can be overcome. And I found this in my own research in uh, through the use of perhaps creative and open approaches by scholars. Um, still, re our positionalities as researchers is significant and important, but it is not the only consideration in studying young people. Nevertheless, they are an important group of people that are often overlooked, especially within the former Soviet space, uh, and therefore they deserve uh, much further analysis than what we have seen up until this present time. With that, I uh, thank you and I open it up to uh, questions. Thank you very much, Marnie. I think we all agree with the need for creativity and um, kind of maybe less conventional approaches. And my feeling often is that when we research youth, you get some credit for it in the nevertheless still very tough um, review process. And Marnie, I wanted to get back on one project that is already published, but um, which I think also maybe particularly in the current context is, is an interesting one um, about the textual analysis that you've done. And it links to what Veronica was speaking about. Um, namely the topic of horizons of expectations and Veronica is trying to uncover some horizons of expectations that might still exist um, and as we all know I mean youth in public is very often associated with this optimism and going forward and driving societies um, kind of society progressing um, thinking about the work that you have done on young Ukrainians um, back a couple of years ago I mean what horizons of expectations did these young people express um, at the time, and um, kind of what what do you expect in the in the current moment of of the young generation? Um, I mean, are there any horizons of expectations left that are positive, um, or is your impression of the work that you've been doing and that you kind of I know continue to do as well one where where these horizons of expectations and therefore the future in a way has also um, collapsed for the young generation? Yeah, thank you for the great question, Felix. Um, at the time when I had done this research, so um, in about 2018, 2019, um, while I was analyzing the sentiments of young people, uh, it was not particularly surprising to me that the individuals who I had studied uh, were very pro-European. Um, I saw this across uh, the three regions that I studied. So I had approached, or I'd studied um, publication, or I guess these submissions from individuals in Zakarpatia located near the EU, near four EU countries in the West. Therefore, that was not surprising. But what surprised me the most is studying other regions. So I studied Volin and I also studied Chernihiv, which border um, other countries, um, specifically Chernihiv, bordering Belarus and Russia. And yet I saw very similar sentiments there where that individuals were almost unanimously uh, pro-European, speaking quite um, negatively um, about Russia and about Ukraine's position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. At the time, the young individuals were very angry um, about the protests, about the demonstrations, uh, but more specifically about the war in Donbass and the annexation of Crimea, often citing uh, that Crimea is Ukraine's and that it should be returned back to Ukraine which is quite interesting given that these individuals are under the age of 18, don't really understand uh, the significance in the way that an older individual might. Um, however, seeing them uh, place these narratives and many of the narratives or the discourses that were seen on the Euromaidan, such as Ukraine is Europe, uh, were then reproduced in a way that demonstrated they were very much aware of them, bringing in national symbols and connecting uh, these together, often using birds uh, which have come within Ukrainian folklore and connecting these um, when describing some of the protesters on the Euromaidan, uh, for example, shows us that individuals are very much aware of this and that they internally had this drive or this fight uh, for Ukraine to be part of Europe. Um, what is most interesting to me is that as these young people had uh, written these or um, these publications uh, in 2015. Um, now, eight years or seven years later, these individuals are the ones in many cases who are fighting on the front lines. So this begs a question is how these narratives, but also these traumas of individuals, these stories too, um, of what happened, this violence on the Euromaidan, how this has been internalized and now perhaps is being um, used as a force uh, to push them forward, to propel them in the war. Um, as we saw in 2015, they are very much aware of these narratives, these stories, what was happening. Um, and now seven years later, they are fighting for these same things that they were writing about uh, seven years prior. Um, so while I haven't done um, many interviews or research directly on Ukraine since um, 
the young people in Ukraine since February 2022, um, except for more survey-based research. Um, I do believe that uh, much of what I was seeing in 2015 has uh, been internalized by young people across the country and is very much propelling them uh, and their desire for the country to be separate uh, from their neighbor. That's a very interesting point. So the past, kind of the future past, in a way, the past future um, horizons of expectations, how they are being carried on, how they are reenacted then in, in this moment of existential um, crisis and might be kind of guiding or encouraging actions that we are seeing now. Another, I think, good reason why we actually need to look at um, what young people express, what, what expectations and, and what hopes. Um, Marnie, since you've also kind of used a large variety of methods now and you've talked about that, that already, I wanted to hear you speak a little bit more about um, kind of the challenges, the methodological challenges that we encounter when, when asking young people questions. Um, that would be one question that I do have. I mean, how do you think about um, kind of, you've done surveys now, not only among young people, but also among young people. I mean, we can't just take the world value survey and ask a 15 year old these same questions. Um, as we've recently seen again in focus groups that we've conducted, there's a significant gap. And so the survey based research that just replicates standard survey batteries is bound to miss a lot of the political and social understanding of young people. So since you have had a large, a larger kind of set of methods, um, how have you been thinking about these ways that we approach the topic of youth and more specifically about digital tools? Um, I mean one concern that, that I always have when looking at Instagram feeds, which I do very rarely, but is that there's a lot of staging, of course, going on and self-representation and young people look all alike um, on Instagram in many ways. So how do we as researchers um, kind of approach that source that is, as every source, of course, meant to be consumed by someone and therefore is an act of staging, not unlike historical sources in some ways, but maybe it's more pronounced in the digital world um, since, especially in the mo at the moment, we can't access the field. I mean, how do you work with cross-validation, um, be it of biographical, but also of um, social and political claims that you, that you see on, on digital media? these two elements. Um, if you could briefly respond to that, I would find that um, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean brief is hard as I am a methodologist. <laughs> I love this stuff. Um, I have indeed and used uh, a diverse range of methods in my own research. Um, and what I have found is that uh, one way to overcome some of these challenges is triangulating methods. Uh, so whether this be combining you know, focus groups with young people, um, with social media data uh, or textual analyses, that is one way uh, that has helped me, at least in my own research, more holistically understand and also kind of pull or tease out what these uh, what these definitions or what these words mean um, when individuals are using them, or to even see um, that you know some of the questions that we have don't uh, resonate with young people, or that they need follow-up questions, and that using a survey might not be appropriate as they don't understand things such as democracy uh, in the same way um, that an older individual might. And so this is this is one, I guess, my piece of advice, but also a lesson learned from my own research, um, is drawing together um, different. Uh, approaches to research. So this could be qualitative and quantitative. Um, but I found um, that social media is incredibly valuable, especially right now within the context of the war. I'm working on a project with a few research assistants uh, using social media data to understand the, re uh, the experience of living in the bunker within a war zone. And and the only way in which we are able to do this from afar is through social media, but there are so many different ways that social media can be and has been used, um, both visually, um, audio, like audio visually, um, as well as just the written text that is presented when we see different images or just experiences and reflections. Uh, one thing with this is also the allowing for open-ended questions, whether this be in a survey, uh, whether this be um, in a focus group um, or even an interview, is allowing young people or to understand their definitions of things is incredibly important. Um, and I'm not sure if you've seen this yourself, Felix, um, in your own research, but allowing um, the individuals to express their own narratives rather than pushing our narratives or what we believe are uh, the larger narratives on young people. So more come from an, um, a bottom up approach um, or an inductive approach rather than a more deductive approach, assuming that all individuals um, within a country or all populations see or understand things the same way um, is 
really something we need to think about. Um, and I guess and it really is something we should be thinking about when studying all people is that people don't understand any topic the same way and that actually allowing them to express how they understand the topics, the themes that we're studying uh, is important, whether or not they be youth and young people uh, or older generations. This is something we need to think about. And um, so I think, yeah, I don't know, keep it brief, um, but I'm happy to answer more questions on this after. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marnie. Then over to our last speaker, Nina. Okay. Soll ich die von oben oder? Also einfach hier oben, ja? Okay. Good morning. Uh, in my talk, I will introduce our interdisciplinary project, History for Young People, Historical Narratives and Perceptions, that was run by Felix and myself from 2020 until this summer. And uh, first of all, I would like to tell you how it all began. And as this is already the third talk of this panel, and some of us might already need a short break, I decided to do this in a way which might differ from what we usually expect from a conference talk. I will tell you about the beginning of our project in a way I would try to explain it to my older son, uh, who's five years old which hopefully does not seem completely inappropriate for a talk uh, on a panel about youth. Okay, so let's get started. So, how it all began. This is Felix. Felix is a political scientist. He likes surveys. That is, he asks a huge group of people what they think about a certain topic. He also likes focus groups. It's a little bit like a survey, but with being present and more dynamic and with a group. This is Nina. Nina is a scholar for Slavic literature and culture. She likes books. Because she thinks that stories tell a lot about people who write and read them, she reads all the time. Both of them are interested in what grown-ups call memory studies. In a nutshell, that means they look at the past and what becomes of it. Both of them work at Zeus. There, in a time when it was still normal to have lunch or a cup of tea together, they talked about their recent projects and found out that they have a lot of common interests and questions. Thus, they set up a project that includes questions related to memory studies and that combines their research approaches and this looked approximately like this. So, yeah, and this is uh, how it looks a little bit more serious uh, on the right side. Uh, and uh, so back to our project, in the remaining 15 minutes, I will introduce our key questions, say a few words about our methodology and our key findings. And in the last part of my uh, talk, I will try to reflect on what went well, what challenges we met, and what might be future perspectives for this kind of projects. So let me very... Uh, gonna, that's um, let me very briefly introduce our key questions, which look like this. How do young people position themselves in relation to the historical narratives which they are exposed to in culture, society and politics? Under what circumstances do young people question these narratives and when do they assimilate them? How are young people's perceptions of history influenced by cultural artifacts? In what ways do cultural memory narratives match or contradict young people's perceptions of history? Um, and I would like to add that in our joint project, we mainly focused on Russia, but uh, Felix also conducted data for other countries such as Belarus or Poland. 
What did we do? We ask ourselves to what concrete narratives young people are exposed to and analyzed historical narratives conveyed among others in recent Russian history books and literature and films. In 2018, 2019 and 2020 we conducted surveys and in uh, 2019 we did focus groups interviews in St. Petersburg and Yekaterinburg to identify young people's perceptions of history. And at a workshop in 2020 and in the preparation of an edited volume that was published earlier this summer, we also compared historical narratives and their perception by young people in Eastern and Western Europe. Let me move to our key findings. Not surprisingly, World War II, or to be more precise, the Great Patriotic War, is the most important historical event also for young Russians. Again, not surprisingly, these figures grew from 2018 to 2020, when the Kremlin intensively prepared for the 75th anniversary of the victory and the Great Patriotic War. Young people share heroic narratives about war, which are known as extensively used and abused by the Kremlin. And in these narratives, the focus is on feats and heroes and less on losses and victims. In short, you could say that young people remember is the victory itself and not the tragic path to this victory. And this is a focus we also observe in official Russian narratives. On what was very interesting, that on the contrary, in the cultural sphere, it is nearly always the tragic path that makes the story. So you can't write a book only about the victory. You somehow have to have some suspense and to show how this victory is actually achieved and that makes your story. It is, however, remarkable that young people often do not agree with the way the Great Patriotic War is remembered in Russia. Especially young people that position themselves as critical to the regime or even as political indifferent uh, would prefer another, a quieter way of commemoration. But of course, I have to add that this is a research that was basically done in 2020 and how it looks today, this is a complete other question. Complete the other question. Um, we were really surprised. Um, so let me just. Um yeah, we were really surprised that historical narratives concerning World War II or the Great Patriotic War were more diverse than we expected, especially in the cultural sphere, at least again when we conducted our research. Especially in school, there were spaces to come into contact with historical narratives that differ from those propagated by the Kremlin, particularly in Russian literature lessons where teacher were or maybe even are rather free um, to, to choose what kind of texts they would like to read with their students. And just, just a short note, I think this would be a very promising um, research field to look on historical narratives uh, transmitted in literature lessons, because most of us, or most uh, research dealing with this kind of stuff, they focus on history lessons, but actually they are much more uh, in, um, times, um, in terms of um, how, how many lessons they are, they are much more liter literature lessons than history lessons in Russian school, at least at the moment. So if some Okay, so if somebody is aware of any research doing on this topic that already exists, I'm glad for any references and hits. But uh, time is flying, so let's move on. A relative majority of young Russians think positively about Stalin. Focus groups helped us to understand that this is pretty much related to the role that is attributed to Stalin in achieving the great victory. Even if most young people in our focus groups were aware of Stalinist repression, which is somehow um, surprising, Stalin's merits seem to outshine everything else. Uh, and even among young people that position 
themselves as regime critical. We found statements like, uh, and I quote, we, we would not have won the great patriotic war without a strong dictatorial hand, end quote. In contrast, we find a lot of critical content on Stalin and Stalinist repression in contemporary Russian youth literature. This is very different with another topic that is an absolute taboo in today's Russia. Um, uh, and this is the, the Red Army's crimes against civilians. Um, um, they are completely blank spot, not only in politics, but, uh, and this, is, uh, this surprised me very much, also in culture. And not surprisingly, most young people do either completely deny such crimes or they excuse them by referring to the specific circumstances of the war or the crimes uh, that were committed by German soldiers. So very briefly, I would also like to mention our output. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, our project was rather fruitful. So I listed just uh, our um, joint publications. And I would like to bring your uh, attention, uh, especially to uh, an edited volume that was published earlier this summer. You see our nice cover here, um, which was um, well, done by a, a young uh, Kazakhstani artist, which I really, really uh, like, um, this work. Um, and um, this uh, volume includes research by researchers from different disciplines, uh, and they focus on youth across Europe. So, to save some time, I will um, skip the next slide and move on to uh, second thoughts about our project. Um, first of all, um, I will um, I ask myself, so what went well? Um, I think we very successfully combined quantitative and qualitative, uh, qualitative methods in, in our project. We included sources um, we would most likely not have included in our usual disciplinary research. And this brought us new insights into how history is told for use and how it is perceived by young people. Uh, we reflected on a general narrativity of historical narratives beyond literature and film. And of course, keeping in mind Hayden White's research on this topic, this is no new finding, but maybe something we as scholars of memory studies should remind ourselves more, frequent, more frequently. Finally, we understood uh, that young people's perception of historical narratives depends on a multitude of factors, uh, and that we analyzed only some of them. So I will come back to this point in a minute. Of course, we also faced some challenges, and most of them were related to the fact that most surveys uh, and focus groups were conducted before we started our joint project. Thus, we could, for example, not include more specific questions on reading behavior, which, uh, which would have been very interesting, especially for me as a scholar for literature. Um, um, this is, of course, something that we could easily uh, include in a future project, and I guess it would be very fruitful. Another point we are still struggling with is a typical chicken-egg problem. That, uh, so what was first? Was it the young people's alternative historical narrative or the alternative historical narratives in the cultural sphere? Um, but I guess this might be very promising to refer once again to Paul Ricoeur's circle of mimesis here, but it was something we haven't done so far. Okay, so let's already move to my final slide. Let's talk about perspectives. Uh, in general, I think uh, it's of course a great idea to combine our interdisciplinary methods in an earlier stage of a future project, um, since this kind of project is never really over. But of course, after the beginning, after the beginning of Russia's war in Ukraine, um, things changed a lot. Uh, but it became, I think, um, more important than ever to find out what's, what youth really thinks. But at least at the moment, this is very difficult uh, to do in Russia, uh, and uh, to some extent, of course, also in Ukraine or uh, among Ukrainian youth. 
Um, and here, especially in a Russian case, we could, of course, think about other sources um, uh, to get insights into society. And I think uh, cultural artifacts uh, might be some of these sources. No doubt we should, in a future project, also pay more attention to Ukrainian youth and to young people in Belarus um, or of Belarusian origin who both to a large extent have left and still, le still are leaving their, their home countries. And I think these are only some points um, we, we could look at in the future, but maybe Felix, as the, the co-editor uh, of this project, would like to, to add a few more. And I'm now in this um, uniquely pleasant situation that I can ask a question to my um, to my colleague um, on a project to, to whom I've contributed, um, and I don't have to answer the question. So that's very pleasant for me now. Um, and I mean, one of the things that you've already mentioned during your talk, of course, is that we are now in a completely different situation, and this kind of research that you're referring to. Uh, um, Having a discussion with young Russians about the crimes of the Red Army is obviously impossible in 2022 um, and also in the foreseeable future, I think. Um, and it's, it's the legal challenges, but of course it's also the social and cultural situation that, um, that has developed. And maybe that underlines even more why we need to look at the cultural realm, because that at least is text-based and we can access it, um, it from afar. Um, and so there are, there are two questions, I think, that derive out of that, Nina. Um, one is, since February, the kind of producers of culture that you are researching, that you've been following, do you see that there is a kind of shift in their discourse when it comes to also the discussion of history, since historical representations have been so central to um, the war since, um, well, the escalation of the war um, since February? Is that something you observe? Or do you also um, kind of, do these actors also realize that the shrinking space for public activism and especially the legal constraints and the number of cases that have happened. I mean, young people have been imprisoned for posting um, pictures on Instagram or elsewhere that don't correspond to the historical norms that the Russian regime wants to kind of impose on society. So is there a self-restriction that you already see among the artists um, or not? Um, and linked to that, then this question of um, the penetration and the far-reaching control of public discourse over history. Do you think this is going to be successful or are the counter mechanisms, the transmission of history, in particular families, um, going to work against that and going to make the life of the autocratic regime rather, rather difficult? How much time do I have? <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, okay, um, I try to be brief. Um, well, I, well, I'm in uh, the wonderful situation to look at um, actors who mostly produce alternative narratives, and I can't see that I stop doing that. Uh, I guess a lot of them already left Russia, or when they, well, they, when they produced their narratives we looked at, they already not lived uh, in, in Russia. So uh, they are somehow present in, well, in social media. Um, I, I don't know exactly how uh, accessible this is still from Russia, but it, I mean, it's, it's accessible from the outside, so we can still see that. I checked some publications I looked at for uh, especially children's books and youth books, and they are still available also uh, on huge platforms like Ozone Rule uh, and things like that. And there's one publishing house um, I really like, and I publish a lot of great stuff, and they they are still working. They still have their their books on their um, on their site. They have a even. I think that was before uh, they, they had this before. But of course, after February 2020, it uh, becomes um, well. It, it, I I look at this and somehow differently. Um, they have a serials about the war, uh, which of course is not about the war going on now, uh, uh, and they have very critical books in this series. So they are still there, they are available, you can order them, uh, not only via this platform, uh, uh, via their platform, uh, but also via um, 
bigger platforms. I have no idea how it looks like in uh, Russian bookshops right at the moment. Uh, of course, books are only a very, very small part of the cultural sphere, but they were a relatively free part uh, until this year. But I can't see, I, I just think that the Kremlin doesn't care about literature. So uh, this is very positive for us is because uh, Kremlin is not interested. They can, especially in this um, um, segment, uh, use literature. They can do whatever they want to do because uh, Kremlin thinks they don't reach so much people. So, okay, I'll let them be. Uh, however, after February, I think this is worth mentioning at least that this is still... Um, that you still can get there. But we, I think, should uh, in future look much more on um, narratives we found on Instagram, we found on TikTok, um, uh, YouTube, of course, um, because uh, these are things young people are much more uh, connected with than, um, in, in their everyday life uh, than they would go to a bookshop and say, hey, could you please uh, recommend a book uh, on World War II, which is a little bit, which differs from uh, the heroic narratives the Kremlin uh, wants us uh, uh, to, to know every day. Yeah, so there, there is still um, some, some room for, for this, uh, but nobody, of course, knows how, how long this is going to, to continue. Okay, uh, could you just help me out with the second question? Um, kind of relates to yeah. what you've said already about the, yeah. the reach and yeah, for the... Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, this is something we already figured out in our research. I mean, the, the Kremlin wants its used to believe uh, things, but uh, I mean, the, there are a lot of possibilities to influence on use, especially in school and other educational institutions. But uh, this, well, they, right at the moment, they are not everywhere. It's it's still not China. So I mean, they they co don't control the internet in a way that young people can't uh, get alternative information. Uh, so this is information is still there. The, the question that maybe is uh, something you could answer is how young people, so are young people still interested in this kind of other narratives? And this is something I can't um, answer from my perspective as a scholar for literature. Yeah. Okay, and then a second question, Nina, since we, we've done this book and we've been kind of looking at how various histories of violence or experiences of violence have been commemorated over time, how young people have been taking that up, um, what type of initiatives have maybe worked in post-conflict societies to deal with these legacies um, of bloodshed. And in the book, we've got numerous examples um, that, that authors study. And of course, we are in the midst of war, and um, it's very difficult to think about that right now. But um, So I don't want to over-politicize the question, but thinking about the, the book that we have done, I mean, and the current situation that we're in in Eastern Europe, I mean, are there elements that you think are more or less promising thinking about the future development of that region and in how to deal with these um, legacies of violence given kind of the work that that you've been doing yeah i mean this is a super difficult question uh, right now because the war is is going on and we don't know um, what what is going to happen i think um it will depend very much on how this war ends, so what happens to Russia and with Russia. Um, I mean, you're talking about how to bring people again together, because, I mean, they, they will, there's Ukraine and there's Russia, they wear a lot of relations uh, among families, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, and so on. Um, and in our book, uh, we basically deal with uh, oh, this question was basically touched by scholars who looked at um, what happened in one society after um, violence. So, for, um, for example, in Spain, so where this pact of silence uh, was rather successful for 30 years. Um, I don't know whether this might be a solution. For the Russian society, maybe yes. For Ukrainian society, I don't know what going to happen between them. I, I'm not sure if this is really a good idea. It, yeah, uh, then we had this ideas that uh, from France and also from the Northern Irish case um, about uh, this 
antagonistic memory. So we bring together people with very different views on history. Uh, but I mean, these views are based on on a truth, and the Russian point of view is based on a lie. So all this who war is based on a lie. So I, I imagine it's very difficult to bring together on one stage uh, a Russian person who just believes in, or maybe still believe in, in a lie uh, in the Ukrainian person and they will just, okay, um, you tell your story and then um, the Ukrainian person tell you, uh, tells uh, uh, his or her story. I don't know. I think this might be not very successful. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I would love to, to answer this question in a way uh, that is more um, yeah, <laughs> positive, but I really can't think uh, of something we met in our book uh, that would work out here. So I think this very much depends what is going on in, in Russia. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. Then on that, we've got a few more minutes um, to open it up to the audience. Um, I'm sure there are a few questions that that have emerged. Um, I see Juliana first at the very back. If you could just briefly introduce yourself um, and then say to whom the question is directed. At the very back. Thank you. Um, Juliane Fürst. Um, I'm the head of the Department Communism and Society at the Center of Contemporary History in Potsdam and also a historian who has worked um, on you. So I've been following this panel with great interest and want to thank you for all the really interesting contributions. I have actually have a number of questions. I'm trying to condense them and group them. Most of them actually to all of you. Um, one of my first ones is that you all actually skirted around a little bit the question of how do you define youth, um, which I know is a perennial and a uh, rather boring one, but in a way it is sort of relevant. And I think it came out most in Veronica's talk where she said, well, there are these um, left-wingers and then there are the next left-wingers and are they actually the same or they're the different generations. But uh, do people suddenly stop being youth because they turn 18? Or is, what is your definition? Is it, is it a um, social one, an age cohort, or is it, is it a more mental one? Um, and then I was very much struck by how uh, all of you um, spoke about positionality and our role. Um, and I want to ask a provocative question. You all assume that proximity to youth is somehow good, but is it? Is actually proximity to our subject something which is desirable, or is it actually also a, um, a hindrance? Um, and I was wondering, is it not more a question of epistemological power insofar as um, this is a power relationship between us, the researcher, and, and our subjects. And at some points, the subjects have more power and so far they hold the information we want to have. But then, in the end, we do the uh, writing up, so the final word is ours. And I always actually, when I did write up interviews, I found that there was a certain kind of almost violence inherent in the, in the fact that we can now do with these words whatever we want uh, to a certain extent because we have the final epistemological power. So I was just wondering, how you experienced this. And then I have a few questions to Veronica, uh, whose paper I found very interesting. Um, because these left-wing youth, I mean, not the least because, of course, the only armed resistance which supposedly might have resist, uh, arisen in Russia is calling themselves the National, I think the Nationalist or National Republican Army, who claimed uh, responsibility for the murder of uh, Dugina. Um, also seems to be coming out of that left-wing milieu, if indeed they exist. Um, but uh, there's sort of all sorts of questions about left-wing milieus in, in the post-Soviet, post-socialist space. Um, one of them is their sort of relationship to nationalism, which is different uh, quite often than in the global left-wing uh, milieu. And I was wondering how do your correspondents uh, really relate to, to na nationalism in their respective milieus, obviously. And then um, the question is how does this relate to the global left-wing youth milieus, which of course came about, I would say, very much with the um, Occupy movement, um, very much a neoliberal critique, and I was uh, surprised to hear the word neoliberalism not mentioned because it's so ubiquitous. Actually, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't mentioned to a certain extent because I think it obscures in our region, but I was sort of wondering, so how, how do they relate? Because obviously there is this sort of kind of global relationship between left-wing milieus, mm -hmm. uh, youthful or not. Um, and then on the other hand, you have this left-wing milieu now in times of war going down a very different route to um, left-wing milieus in Ukraine, um, in Georgia, who very much um, do not uh, see NATO, the West, um, as, the, as the bogeymen because of their recent experience of violence from 
from Russia. So I was wondering how, how do they square this? How do they suddenly feel isolated in this global world or how, what, do, what do they make of it? Um, and that's basically it. I think that's enough already. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Juliane. Are there other questions? Because I fear if we give the word back to the panel, then it's game over for questions. Yeah. No. Yeah. Question. Okay. So we'll take those two and. Okay. Hello, I'm Ivaivo Dinev. I'm seen Cyprus in Zoys. Uh, I'm political scientist. Uh, I have question to Veronica to the first presentation about the new left. So uh, concerning the the new left and when you are analyzing the new left, uh, usually we're looking at it as a social movement. Uh, because it's emerging as an attempt of grassroots small groups to uh, become political movement or political force. And I think uh, it's a question, but also a recommendation, I think, would be, uh, and do you consider it to use uh, some instruments that are usually tradition to social movement literature? Because in your approach, for example, political opportunity structure will be really uh, important in understanding if you ask questions as why there is difference between the four cases. Uh, also discursive opportunity structure in the case of difference in the historical context and the use of uh, leftist ideology before the emerging of these new left groups. Also framing in the case how they actually build their ideology, how they use uh, in strategy the framing to the public because probably there were uh, difference in the way how they use publicly uh, and the ideology, uh, what are the strategy to uh, to build the political movement, and what actually they are thinking about certain issues, but are not uh, publicly discussing this. Uh, it, it's also a case of master framing. Uh, it's related to the previous question, actually, how they try to relate to the national context, to the uh, let's say the hegem hegem uh, hegemonic discourse in the in the countries, and um, try to drift this discourse to more leftist interpretation of historical events or current uh, events in these countries and also the diffusion of ideas. So the question of the new left actually as a global movement which emerged in the, in the beginning of 20th century with the global justice movement, Occupy movement in the last decade and um, uh, authority movements. So this usually in Eastern Europe, new left is really connected in a global network uh, with particular um, discourse about the uh, uh, capitalist transformation of Eastern Europe, uh, the role of um, new regime, and usually new left uh, has in Eastern Europe this problem of connecting the national context with the new left uh, hegemonic ideas. Uh, in other countries, new left has these problems with uh, staying in the academic field, in a small intellectual circles without connecting to, for example, trade unions. Uh, so I think using these instruments from uh, social movement literature, uh, it could be really important in explaining uh, differences between the cases and the success of new left emergency and development. Thank you very much. And the last question, and then we can... Yes, hello. My name is uh, Anna Yerman. I'm from the University of Cambridge and also previously in the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. So I have two questions, but um, the first is for Moni. Uh, and I noticed that you said that um, your previous experience as a volunteer provided you with access, but I guess it was also somehow problematic to navigate uh, that transition from from friend and fellow activist to researcher. So I was wondering if you could say two words about that. And the second was to Veronica, and your very rich and very um, fascinating project, uh, and the intergenerational aspect. Um, if you could just like provide some illustration or examples of what, what you think will arise there in terms of um, sort of, um, yeah, shared and recreated experiences and expectations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll need to come back to the panel now since we are otherwise running out of time. Marni, I would like to give you the opportunity to, to come back in to begin with um, since you've been waiting patiently in front of your computer. Um, so may you start. Uh, sure, I think I'll start with the last question and then I'll briefly touch over the definitions because I think the rest is mostly for the other panelists. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Unfortunately, I, I can't see exactly who asked all of these questions. 
Um, but in terms of being a volunteer, if anything, I found that it really helped me familiarize myself and kind of lay the foundations uh, for fields work and for, I mean, all of my research within Ukraine more broadly, but especially in terms of conducting uh, focus groups and interviews, knowing how to interact with and some of the social norms um, around um, working with young people uh, in Ukraine. Um, but then there is exactly that transition, like you mentioned. So I didn't uh, work or research any of the specific individuals that I had um, worked with previously uh, for ethical concerns. I didn't use any of the individuals involved with um, the organization, but rather I used the organization as sort of um, a way or a network uh, for me to access an other individuals um, as sort of a larger snowballing process. But nevertheless, it comes with a challenges in um, shifting that role from being someone advocating and working with as a volunteer uh, with vulnerable populations uh, to then becoming someone who researches them. If anything, I found that it was beneficial and helped me um, know these things, as I mentioned. Uh, but there was that shift, and I think this would be true for anyone conducting research with groups that we are familiar with, uh, whether this be from our previous experiences volunteering um, or even just our familiarity within any specific context. But this is something I think um, would be worthwhile to reflect on, or I could even would reflect on it um, more in the challenges that I overcame uh, there. Uh, in terms of definitions of youth, um, I think that's a fantastic question, and I tried to allude to it a bit in my presentation. I've typically, um, I'm interested in young people under the age of 18, or at least under the age of 20, um, because I think that this specific group is quite understudied, and specifically their role within politics. Um, however, I think uh, we could contest this uh, for quite a while longer than we have time today about how when we see the cutoff or where we see the cutoff, whether this is age 35, I would push against this and say that an 18 year old and a 35 year old have very, very different life experiences. And I think it would be problematic to put um, them all within the same category. Um, but I, I think that what, uh, the, um, what was asked in terms of whether this be an age thing or whether more of a social experience or social experiences or a mental thing in terms of our definition is probably something worthwhile uh, for all of us to consider and how we do see this group um, and you know where, where do they begin and end. Um, but I'm going to let the other panelists speak a little bit more on that because I'd be curious to hear their thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marnie. Um, Veronica, you got plenty of questions, which is um, an excellent sign for a promising PhD project. Maybe you pick your favorite questions, the ones that you have the best answers on. Um, that's, that's how I will do it, yeah. <laughs> Tremendous questions, thank you very much. Um, I will answer the one on the social movement uh, and on the methodology and the theory. So. Looking at New Left as a form of movement was something that I considered to do for the first year of the PhD, but then, so there is no left movement as such in the South Caucasus. I wouldn't call it a movement, it's collective and groups. So I think this is in order to name it adequately the first thing. And then in terms of this theoretical outline of it, I will also not refer to the to the social movement movement youth literature, social movement literature, because I look at everything from an ideological perspective. And I try to apply the concept of political ideology and how people understand transitional justice. So I'm also not researching what is their success or how could they increase their counter hegemony, something like that. So my interest is very much political theoretical in this, in this regard. What I'm interested in is how they look at the past, how they look at the Soviet Union, how they look at the post authoritarian phases, if there is any kind of competing narratives and how their own identity as a leftist um, plays out. So that's that's a different, um, I think, aspect or um, way to look at it. And as for the um, as for the question of nationalism, um, that's that's a very central one. So I think probably I should say something about how I try to approach the left. Um, so usually we distinguish between left and right, right, and then we look at like the forms of state intervention. But what we try to do in our focus groups with Felix um, is that we introduce the category of individualism and groupism. And groupism tells us something about um, the value or the importance of looking at national culture. And um, so we would expect that we find more of this left-wing groupism um, in all three societies because I would say that the outlook towards nationalism is, there is a lot of tension, but I would also say that very often it is considered as something that gives emancipation, um, which is also related to the post-colonial uh, heritage. Um, yeah, there is, I don't know if I have more time to, to answer. One more, one, one more okay. Um, maybe about the one, the intergenerational one. 
Um, so what we are trying to do methodologically is to have intergenerational focus groups uh, for this one project in Azerbaijan. And for the Georgian case, there is a generational comparison. So basically to see those that are 18 to 25, like in which regards or how does their understanding of justice differ from those that are younger or elder. So there is like a generational comparison. But as for the intergenerational one, what I would like to do is basically to make very young leftists speak uh, to those who lived through the uh, transition period and also those who lived um, in the countries before. And then we will certainly see that they have a different understanding of socialism and also of violence. And, and maybe coming back to your question and connecting it with something that Felix said before about past, future and future past. So my assumption is that the youngest generation in terms of their understanding of the Soviet Union is close actually to, to the elder generation because I would say that um, there is less critical uh, view towards the Soviet Union among the youngest. There is more critical and more nuanced um, analysis among, let's say, 25-year-olds. Yeah. Right. Well... Thank you very much to everyone. There are, I know, a few more questions in the room. I pr propose we take them over to the coffee break, which, which starts now, and then we reunite in this room at um, 11.45 for the roundtable, the everyday of geopolitics, and I'm sure you'd all happily join me in thanking Marnie, who joined us from Saskatoon, Nina, and Veronica. Thank you very much.
the microphone is on. Do you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Um, well, welcome to the roundtable or session on the everyday of uh, geopolitics. Um, this uh, session is um, meant to represent some of the research of the research cluster Conflict Dynamics and Border Regions um, and also um, projects and people we are co cooperating with. So um, we have different disciplines here to address the topic, uh, theology, geography, anthropology and also political science. Um, and we have also um, different methodological approaches um, to, to, to approach the topic. And uh, finally, we have uh, very different stages of the research um, people are uh, presenting here in, in this panel. And uh, since we have a lot of speakers on the panel, I will try to be short, but I will introduce um, who is here and who is uh, speaking today. And we have, first of all, Regina Elsner. She is a theologian since se September 2017, researcher at SOIS, and here she's investigating the dynamics of orthodox social ethics in Eastern Europe since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, with a special focus on peace, ethics, and uh, gender-related topics. And she will speak today about this notion of being just orthodox in a context of orthodox churches um, in, in heavy conflict. Um, I'm very happy that uh, John O'Loughlin uh, accepted the invitation to come from Boulder, Colorado, uh, to Berlin. He is college professor of distinction in the Institute of Behavioral Science and Professor of Geography at the University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, his research interests uh, are in the geopolitical orientations of the populations of the former Soviet states, public opinions um, in the de facto republics, and here we are cooperating with a research group, with a British US American research group, and um, on uh, the social and political effects of climate change in Kenya. Um, we have Tatiana Zhezhenko. She is since um, June 2021, I think, um, at SOIS, working in the project <coughs> The Liberal Script in the Contested Border Regions of uh, Ukraine. She has graduated in political economy and philosophy from the Karasin Kharkiv National University in Ukraine. And her research focus is on memory politics, borders, and border and identities with a special focus on the Ukrainian Russian borderlands, but uh, also beyond, and um, as well in gender politics in Ukraine and the post-Soviet space. Um, we have Claudia Eckert. Eckert. She is a social anthropologist and researcher since September 2021 at SOIS, and at the same time a PhD student at Manchester University, and uh, where, where she is writing her dissertation um, on large-scale geoeconomic transformation and geopolitics as lift from the perspectives of market traders in uh, Odessa and Bishkek. And at SOIS, she is um, part of the research uh, of my research cluster, Conflict Dynamics and Border Region, and developing within the uh, project of Limb Spaces, um, a project on lift experience of custom regimes in, in Moldova, uh, Ukraine, and um, Kyrgyzstan. And uh, finally, not sitting here, but still in the audience because it's so crowded here. I'm very happy that also Gerard Toll accepted our invitation to come and to comment on this panel and on the presentations today. He's a political geographer and one of the key figures of critical geopolitics. And uh, at the moment, a professor of international affairs at Virginia Tech campus uh, in the greater Washington DC metro region. And, um, one of his um, very, yeah, very important books, also in the context of what we are discussing today, today is a near broad, Putin the West in the context of Ukraine and the Caucasus, not only did uh, win an award, but also is a very good book um, with the approach of thick description, what he is um, kind of uh, yeah, proposing and putting forward to um, analyze and um, uh, combine different political levels and developments in societies to better understand um, uh, yeah, political and societal uh, developments. And I want to leave it to the short introduction and give the floor to the presenters. The idea is that everyone is um, having 10 
um, to 15, but rather 10 minutes of presentations that we have after that, short questions from the audience, and then uh, have a broader dis discussion um, in, at the end after the comment. Okay, and then I give the floor um, to Rina. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to, to be here with you to present my, my research. Being a theologian in an interdisciplinary institute is always a little bit like an experiment. And I think it's this, um, what I will present to you today in this 10 minutes is just a, a glimpse in how, it, how we try to work together, how, to tr we, how we try to um, yeah, have inspiration from the other disciplines and to get together different topics and different disciplines. So I'm working on orthodoxy in Eastern Europe and this is quite a huge field and I don't want to bore you with all the details, especially on the situation in Ukraine, which is very complex and, um, and difficult. But nevertheless, um, this um, notion of just orthodox seems to me to be one of the, of, of a good example to take this frame of geopolitical and everyday, which we discussed about in our uh, research uh, group. And so I just want to take you with me in my thoughts about how it applies to, to thinking about churches, about theology and social ethics, which are my main focus. So the landscape of Ukraine, the religious and the orthodox landscape in uh, Ukraine especially, is very difficult, very complex. Um, on this graph, you may see, maybe as some of you have this, have, have it now um, in their hands, that there are at least to make it a little bit easier, three Orthodox churches to talk about. Um, and if we look through the last ten years or twenty years, even um, how the the amount, the yeah, the significance also of the churches in Ukrainian society developed, you can see that it is quite dynamic, that all those graphs are going up and down um, of the three different churches. And there's one graph very interesting, this is the group called Just Orthodox. So these are believers who in surveys uh, don't want to define to which church they belong in this complex situation. So this is the group which I'm, I'm interested in here in this, in this talk today. Just very shortly about what are these free churches about. There's first the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. This is a quite new church. It was acknowledged in 2019 as a canonical church, so as a valid church, as a, as a church recognized by other churches in, in world orthodoxy. This church was very much pushed by Petro Poroshenko in his election campaign in 2018, so this church has a political... Um, yes, yeah, site, I would say, um, which is um, important in assessing how the church behaves in society, how it is perceived in society. And you have to know about this church in this context that it has very much support in the diaspora, especially in Northern America, but also in other diaspora regions in the world where Orthodox exist. The second one is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. This is a church which belongs or refers to the Moscow Patriarchate, to the Russian Orthodox Church. It has autonomy within this church since 1991, but it is nevertheless in a spiritual community with the Russian Orthodox Church, I would say until 2022. So I don't want to go into detail this situation actually now in Ukraine, but it is important to know that those churches are referring to other churches outside the borders of Ukraine in different ways. The third church he, depicted here is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Kiev Patriarchate, a church which was quite important until 2019 and then ceased to be that much important. This church split from Moscow in 1992, so it wanted to show its detachment from Moscow, from Russian Orthodox, Orthodoxy. It has a very strong Ukrainian national identity, and it, but it is not recognized by any other Orthodox Church. It has not been recognized by any other Orthodox Church. So what I want to show you here is just how those different churches 
uh, relate to Ukraine and to um, religious uh, institutions, religious um, communities outside Ukraine. When asking about the geopolitics and, and how church is connected to geopolitics, then it's interesting, and Ukraine is, a, is really a brilliant um, example for this, um, that ecclesial, so church geopolitics, especially in the Orthodox world, very much overlap with political geopolitics. So I tried to show you here to, to, to make visible how different claims, different churches, global churches, try to make a claim about Ukraine. You have a Ukrainian Orthodoxy very much um, yeah, fond to say that they are that there's an independent tradition of Kievan Christianity, how they call it. They perceive themselves as defending the Christian core of Europe. So they perceive themselves as European, but being special in a Christian sense. But at the same time, they try to be a bridge between East and West, to perceive themselves as Ukrainian Orthodoxy being a bridge between Eastern churches and Western churches. The Russian Orthodox Church is a transnational church. It perceives itself as a transnational church. But it has, of course, also a geopolitical interest um, on the one side because it is linked to the Russian state, on the other side because it has a political claim on societies outside the Russian borders. So you have those ideas, narratives of one baptism, one civilization. Ukraine and Russia belong together and Belarus at, uh, at the same time. They are those traditional values Russian Orthodoxy is, is uh, pushing in these territories which it perceives as their own. Um, they have this liturgical language which no one else uses in the world community, only those churches belonging to the Russian Orthodox Church, Old Slavonic. And they perceive their church and their churches belonging to them as a stronghold against Western liberalism. So Ukraine is perceived to be the place where orthodoxy fights Western liberalism. And this church fights the power claim of the ecumenical patriarchate. So a patriarchate and orthodox church which thinks it is responsible for all orthodox in, in the whole world. So this ecumenical patriarchate is the third player in Ukrainian church politics, geopolitics. It also claims to have a, that Ukraine belongs historical to this church. It has a distinctive theology which differs from the Russian Orthodox focus uh, as a theology of dignity. It wants to show that Ukraine is part of the global Orthodox community. And it is also at the same time, it perceives Ukraine as a stronghold against Russian imperialism. So Ukraine is perceived to be the church defending orthodoxy against Russian imperialism. Thus, it is also fighting the power claim of the Moscow Patriarchate. Maybe one back, you see this meaning of borders, of intersecting borders, of different claims, which very much remember the political discussions about Ukraine and um, who claims to have an impact on, on Ukraine. I just want to very shortly show you how those geopolitical questions per transform in everyday relevance for faithful being in their parishes in Ukraine. So you have this huge questions, geopolitical uh, level. Does the church belong to a certain, certain cultural concept? Who defines what it means to be orthodox in Ukraine? Who is the head of Ukrainian orthodoxy? Which church is recognized by whom and all? What means independence if you think that orthodoxy thinks of itself as one church, one global church and not different uh, Split, splitted churches. And then there comes the local level in. What does it mean when a parish does not commemorate, does not think about pray for one patriarchate in another country, as at the moment is the case with Patriarch Kirill? Does the political conviction of a priest somehow has an impact on the validity of the misery, so of my personal salvation? So I'm going to, to perceive communion or to be baptized. What does it mean? if the church is the wrong church? Is this parish canonical in which I go every day? Is the Holy Communion valid when I perceive it? Will the priest bury my relatives if maybe they don't belong to, the other, to, to this church or the other church? And can I tell my classmates, and this is in fact a, a quotation of a person I talked to in Ukraine, can I tell my classmates in which church I go on Sunday? Does it, will I have problems when telling in which, to which church do I belong? So you see how geopolitics turn to very practical everyday things. And the question for me interesting is, what is the, the move 
on the, on the opposite. So from these everyday experiences of conflict, um, how do they transfer to the geopolitical level? The just orthodox graph in these surveys is interesting here because it seems that they could be somehow uh, s somehow a uh, yeah, solution for this problem, for this question, to be not bond to any church jurisdiction, to be just orthodox. This could be, in fact, and um, they, they try to detach themselves from this politicization. Um, they don't want to have religious identity bond to political identity. They challenge this huge orthodox discussion about ethnophilitism, so about nationality being more important than the faith in orthodoxy. So maybe this could be a potential to develop peace ethics in orthodox churches, to talk about peace and reconciliation. But the problem is with this group, that this group is also, as we see in surveys, the group which is most uh, or less, <laughs> less um, prone to go to church regularly, less re uh, religious, in fact, less, um, yeah, uh, less within the religious discourse and, and religious community at all. So it is interesting how to, how to somehow um, transfer the idea of religious potential for making peace, for making reconciliation, with, with the understanding that religious identity is important to somehow have an understanding what religious may mean at all for religious, for, for social society, for social reconciliation processes. So I, I have here a lot of question marks, which mark all the things I'm thinking about when talking with my colleagues from other disciplines about what the geopolitical everyday gap means for theology and for my question of social ethics, in fact. So I leave you also with this question marks and hope that we can talk about this later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regina, for this um, insight in this uh, complex topic, but uh, seldom really um, looked at. Um, I just want to ask if there are right now questions of uh, understanding, quick questions we have to, to address now. <laughs> I, hope, I guess there are. Oh, P Peter. Have you at all studied Greek Catholicism? <laughs> because when you're speaking about this bridging yeah. between Eastern and Western churches, I mean, yeah. yeah. They, in fact, the Greek Catholics, which for those who, who don't, do not know, are uh, churches of, of Byzantine liturgic, but, uh, but acknowledging the Pope of Rome as to be the head of the church. And they are very important for Ukraine. And of course, I, I, I have a look on them when talking about this also because they are very... They have a rel very um, developed social ethical theology because they are linked to the Western theological tradition. Um, at this case, I'm, I'm not looking at them because I want to understand the inner orthodox dynamics and how orthodox church as the majority of Ukraine can have an impact or, or what impact do they have on social discourses. Um, but of course, they're interesting, especially in, this, in their try, in their attempt to have an impact on orthodoxy with their Western um, experience in theology. Okay, there's another quick one in the end. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Very quick. Is uh, just orthodox uh, your terminology in your service or is it an officially uh, no, survey term from whatever Ukrainian census or the like? Yeah, it is. Um, if, if you look at the, at, at the picture, it is from um, Razumkov uh, surveys, which they provide every year about religiosity in uh, Ukrainian society and the impact. So it's their term in the survey. There would be a lot of questions about how the questions are posed in this survey about orthodox belonging, in fact, but that's another topic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then I think we turn um, to the next presentation by Donna Lachlan. We are close. <laughs> oh. 
You opened it a while ago. It must be on it. Mm. Shall we maybe t take another one first and you try to get the... Um, okay, we have a technical problem with the presentation, which is not... I can do interpretive dance. <laughs> well. <laughs> Shall we maybe... Yeah, maybe we can... Claudia, you want to be the next speaker, and we will try to get the repaired okay. uh, presentation. Okay. Let's see if mine is working. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So. Okay, straight. Yeah, we have seen it, right? Um, I don't see her at the moment. It's Anya. Okay. But Henry will try. We will get it. Okay. We short okay. reorganization and we um, continue with uh, the presentation of Claudia Eggert and we'll turn to John O's presentation um, when we have the repaired, repaired version. Sorry for this. Thank you very much. Glad to be here today and thanks for coming as well. I will present um, a project that is very recent yet. Um, I call it Waiting, Lift Geopolitics at the Border Crossings in Bessarabia. And um, this, well, preliminary uh, presentation today is based on a one-month fieldwork that I um, spent in Moldova this year, in the summer. And um, I conducted this fieldwork in the context of the Limb Spaces project, which Sabine uh, just introduced, where we are looking at everyday lives in regions bordering uh, the European Union, mostly Moldova and Ukraine and study collective practices and strategies um, to cope with situations of high uncertainty. And, of course, the war has intensified many of those already existing uncertainties and also produced new ones and also new sites. And um, one such side stage of the, currently, uh, of the current situation in Ukraine has emerged at the border triangle between Moldova, Ukraine and Romania. But before I will start with outlining my research, as anthropologists like to do, I will go for a short anecdote from the field. Um, the field stay at that border, where I actually talked with drivers, lorry drivers mostly, um, in order to understand how uh, they cope with this waiting time, which amounted up to two weeks at that time. And um, the waiting was based on the lengthy process of costumes clearance. So, um, just to give you a brief image of where we are in terms of geographies, this is the southernmost part of, um, of Moldova. And, um, well, while being there, I've been, as I said, talking to drivers. And one of those was a Bulgarian uh, driver, but he, in he introduced himself as a Bulgarian without a passport. So, um, he actually lived in Moldova, but has a Bulgarian heritage. And um, he told me the anecdote of the fate of a wine trader who uh, disappeared in 1933 in this very same border region. Um, while traveling on a horse carriage, this man left his hometown in Bulga the Bulgarian town Tvardica. You can see this red dot on the map. And um, he, uh, this, this region is located in the Burjak um, region, a multi-ethnic southern part of uh, Bessarabia, that at that point was administered by the Kingdom of Romania, which is, uh, has been administered by the Kingdom of Romania in the interwar period. So his costumes documents were actually administered by the Romanian legislation, but while he was waiting to cross over the brood to the other side, the Soviets took over. He showed the new Soviet administration his passage documents, but they told him that his costumes need to comply with the Soviet tariff system. The Operation Barbarossa then was faster than uh, the Soviet customs officers, and before the wine trader managed to obtain the necessary documents, the Romanians were back in power. Finally cleared, he managed to cross the route to bring his load to the other side of the border, stayed there for a while, but uh, his way back to the other side wasn't smoothly either. 
So he got into trouble because the Soviets were quite suspicious of this wretched Bulgarian trader who had a bag full of Romanian money, and they directly sent him to Siberia, where never has heard of him ever since. Then this driver told me that, you see, if this, if this wine trader came back to the border today, he would have uh, the impression that not that much has changed in the past 70 years, actually. So what is going on at this border? Why is there uh, such a troubled situation with customs? And why do people have to wait so long? Um, as you all know, the war in Ukraine has many implications. One of those is the temporary closure of the Black Sea ports. Uh, some of them are opened again, but in July this was a very different situation yet, and the global food crisis was actually looming large. So grain can be delivered from southern Ukraine to a replacement port in Constanza and Romania to partially mitigate the risk, but the need to feel the word matter really with uh, the slowness of customs procedures that choke the flow of goods across these borders. And um, the rise of truck traffic at that time uh, increased by 395% in comparison to the same period in er a year earlier. And um, this obviously forges major logis logistical and bureaucratical challenges. So what I argue here is that uh, this border triangle has turned into a choke point. And um, a choke point, to start with, is a site where geopolitical power struggles slow down the flow of resources, information, and bodies. Um, but uh, there is more to choke points, and I will try to explain the concept a bit more in depth. So uh, what do I mean by talking about choke points? On the one hand, this is a concept. And on the other hand, this is also a very concrete site and experience that can be made at the site. So, um, it is a concept that describes the, how the flow of goods is choked at a narrow passage. Or that can be a tunnel, that can be a border, that can be uh, like the rocky tunnel, for instance, <coughs> sorry, in, in Georgia, or between Russia and Georgia, is also often called a choke point. But this can also be bureaucratic restrictions that produce a kind of uh, choking of procedures on the bureaucratic level. So choke points... <coughs> Choke points materialize if an intensification of traffic meets with authoritative regulations that choke movements. On the one hand, we have the concept, which is very often also used in geopolitical, geopolitical thinking to coerce, control, or exploit strategically important locations. But it is also a site that produces its own and often very messy uh, practices. And um, these practices, in turn, again, very much also changed the need impl implementation of top-down policies. So um, my, my example here of a, like what I call a choke point is the border crossing between Ukraine, Moldova, and Romania. And doing ethnographic research there and talking to drivers, I uh, really got first-hand insights into how these choke points affect lives and practices of actors involved, how these choke points also bundle together a whole specter of geopolitical dynamics in a very narrow passage, and how this is also a very productive site to learn how actors make sense of their experience in relation to larger geopolitical transformations. So I would like to give you some excerpts from the talks that I had with the drivers at the border. Um, and I will read them out because I think they're yeah, barely visible. So the drive, one driver from, U from Ukraine was telling that he had been waiting at this border for 10 days. There are no provisions for drivers. Local people feel pity and bring us water and food. They don't even want money for this. As you see, here is only the road, the open field, no shadow, no shower, no running water, nothing. Another driver told me that some days ago someone died. They say he had a heart attack, but everyone knows that he died because of the heat. Everyone now no, no talks about Africa and how people will suffer without our grain and oil. But no one cares about those who transport them. I tell you, it's the Romanians. I'm from Gagauzia. I also like coffee and smoking, but I have to, if I have to work, I work. Ever since Romania has become part of the EU, they want to show us that they have a higher standing. That's why they let us wait. And this very uh, driver from the beginning, from uh, the Bulgarian Moldovan, told me that I used to do the Russian tour, and everything was fine. Now the waiting time at the border is unbearable. 
My wife and my daughter keep telling me to come back home and find a job somewhere close. There is no work in Moldova. I can either sit there and wait without being paid for it, or here, where I can be at least feed my family. Then a uh, last quote is from a driver from Moldova again, who told me, um, when it comes to customs, I change my mindset. I switch from waiting for into waiting as a way of being. So what I found striking in all these commentaries were the notion of waiting and how uh, waiting can really open up a whole uh, uh, kind of world of personal context dependent, but also very situated and historical, social, political and economic conditions and how they are experienced in time and across uh, spaces. And uh, what I suggest to, to really trace this or, or un, uh, unfold this, this notion of waiting is a thick description of how that, that looks at waiting um, not from the narrow focus of waiting for something, but waiting as an entangled process in itself from which we can learn about the make making of social life fields and the role that different actors have in shaping it. So the analytical value I think here is really that uh, waiting can elucidate um, the shifting nature of bordering and regulations and power struggles um, and the ways in which actors negotiate these conditions or mitigate them on the ground. But also then in turn, and this is what was Regina also just um, mentioned, like how these then interact and so intersect with top-down regulations. So there is, a, there is a dynamic in between, which uh, is what we are, I think many of us are most interested in. And um, last but not least, I think that uh, uh, focus on waiting at borders can also very much problematize the prediction of globalization, which uh, where things are supposed to move in order to produce profit. So there are these places of friction that can really learn us a lot about uh, the, the side of uh, practices and doing of globalization. And um, so what I, what I would now like to point out here is that we have been talking a lot about how, how geopolitics are uh, acting from top down, or here we discuss a lot how they are actually um, working from below. But I suggest this concept of lift geopolitics as to emphasize um, really, like it brings to the fore not simply a shift from attention from top down to bottom up, but it, it focuses on this intersection and their co constitutive effects. And to really more fully grasp this intersection, I argue that we uh, need to encompass the discursive and the everyday level. So uh, this is a plaidoyer for ethnographic immersion, after all, to follow these relations and their implications. And in my case, uh, I find it very productive to look through this concept of lift geopolitics at the nexus of unstable borders, customs regimes, and the negotiation of flows across geoeconomic power blocks. So to conclude, um, what are lived geopolitics and how can we study them? I see these choke points as a really ideal kind of uh, locations to study this intersection of top-down and bottom-up, because they, they, after all, are a result of the shift of global power dynamics. So they are, um, they can be, can be uh, used to understand um, the practices that are a result of geopolitical transformations, how actors make sense on the ground of them, position themselves in a web of commerce and power. But they are also, um, choke points are also a transferable tool that can be applied to different places, to different sites and in different situations. They emerge, they disappear again, and they offer an, a window into into understanding the intersection of top-down geopolitics and bottom-up practices. And with this, I want to conclude, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Claudia, for this um, insight in your, yeah, not so, well, 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 very recent um, <laughs> empirical work, just, I think, a month ago. Um, are there immediate, um, Questions for Claudia? Elda. 
Hello, thank you very much, Anna Zatulmetz from the Viedrina. Um, I very much like your concept of lived geopolitics, and I was wondering if you have other examples also that you could give, um, except in shock points, that would also speak for that concept. Thank you. Yeah, very much. I mean, in my dissertation, I look at these two markets mostly, seven kilometer market in Odessa and the other one in, in Bishkek. And I conceptualize those two as, uh, well, one is a node and the other is a portal. And these are all these kind of formations that, that offer a window into lift geopolitics. So they're, um, the, the everyday practices at those markets are closely bound to geopolitical transformations because they, they produce profit by channeling goods across disparate places. So they need to cross international borders mostly to produce profits. And in order to cross these borders, they uh, need to be very much aware of the border regimes, the customs regimes that are in place there. And uh, I take these markets as sites where you can really learn how people negotiate, share knowledge, uh, accumulate knowledge about geopolitical transformation. And after all, these markets are also meeting places for people from many different sites. And um, very brief example from Kyrgyzstan. So there, the custom situation is such that in recent years, the garment industry has grown exponentially. So there is a real effect of how people take advantage of the geopolitical situation and uh, thereby shape like the, the very social and economic opportunities that are in place. And if there are no other questions right now, we turn, hopefully... No. No? <laughs> we we not turn to the presentation of John O yet, but... Yeah, more, um, da more dancing. <laughs> more dancing, yes. <laughs> um, maybe we can then first turn to um, the presentation of um, Tatiana Zhenko, if that is working, and I hope that uh, we have the opportunity afterwards. Good evening, everybody. Did mm -hmm. you hear me? You have, I have this old-fashioned <laughs> microphone. Um, so actually, my uh, initial plan was to, to present on this conference. It was something else. Yeah? Um, Sabina mentioned um, that we have this project scripts, um, uh, contestations of the liberal script in Ukraine's border regions. And I was supposed to go to the border with Russia in March this year. I uh, already identified places where I wanted to go. I started to make contacts. I started to like, make appointments. Um, and then the war broke out. So I could not go there physically, but I also could not kind of just give up these people and... Um, I thought the only thing, or the least I could do for them, and um, for that matter for all of us, is actually to document what is going on on the occupied territories of Ukraine. So both, both uh, places, um, small towns at the border with Russia, Vovchansk and Kupiansk were occupied in the first days. But then the project, uh, um, it became kind of ad hoc <laughs> project, um, it, it became a kind of um, uh, much bigger than I thought. And um, I also would like to acknowledge the help of Anastasia Magazova, who is here. She helped me with collecting information. And so what I'm going to talk today is, is um, Russia's um, rule on the new occupied territories of Ukraine, terror collaboration resistance. Um, it's a bit different from the, the other papers because I don't have like a fancy theoretical framework here. It's more like um, 
an attempt to document what's going on. And um, if you, I will not have time, of course, to tell you all, all the um, aspects of my research, but you can read the German version of it in the forthcoming Osteuropa uh, issue. So how do I move? Uh, yeah, so this is just a map um, to illustrate the scale um, of the Russian occupation of the Ukrainian territory. Uh, I think it's the, the end of August, the state of um, um, the situation, yeah? And uh, to start with, um, I just would like to remind you that the, the, the occupation is not something which started in February this year. We are actually, actually dealing with the Russia's occupation of the Ukrainian territory uh, since eight years. And there are some parallels, some similarities, but also there are striking differences in, in this kind of second wave of the Russian occupation politics. So briefly, to remind you, Russia's occupation of Crimea uh, mm, happened actually very quickly uh, without much like use of military force. Russia officially uh, denied being involved military and only one year later, Putin admitted that it was a special military operation. Um, it was an annexation um, through the quasi-referendum, which was staged uh, staged in haste in, in two weeks, basically everything was done. And um, so there were um, internally displaced uh, uh, persons leaving Crimea, but mostly because, not because of military actions or the conflict, but because they politically disagreed with the occupation. Russia's occupation of Donbass uh, looked uh, different. Um, it uh, um, developed as a result of the military conflict, leading to thousands of victims and also millions of uh, IDPs. Um, Russia's aim uh, in Donbass was not an annexation, but at least until February this year, it was the aim was the kind of reintegration of this region into Ukraine. Uh, but on Russia's conditions as an autonomous pro-Russian entity. And unlike in Crimea, this kind of uncertainty lasted for a long time, and even like Ukrainian and separatist institutions and actors coexisted for quite some time. Um, but at the same time, uh, Russia obviously supported politically and military uh, really and economically, these so-called republics, and, and there was a kind of creeping integration of these republics um, with Russia or into Russia on many levels. Um, so what happened in these eight years was a kind of normalization of this situation, and Ukraine's response was uh, that we uh, do not accept this occupation, uh, but we can fight for our territories uh, by political and diplomatic means. In 2016, the Ministry of the Reintegration of the Temporary Occupied Territories and IDPs was created and entrusted with a, as a number of, of tasks, of, of, of aims, uh, protecting also rights of Ukrainian citizens um, uh, on the occupied territories and on living on the co along the contact line, but also IDPs. And this all uh, uh, has changed, uh, as we know, in February this year, when Russia officially recognized um, uh, People's Republics in the administrative boundaries of both oblasts, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, and promised military help. So what makes this occupation different uh, from the previous one is this full-scale military invasion, the fact that Russia does not hide its goal of, of land grabbing, uh, territorial expansion, yeah? It's all explicit now. Uh, what makes it different also that, that Ukraine is in a different uh, 
has been in a different position. Uh, uh, unlike eight years ago, when it was political crisis in Ukraine and the state was weakened, now um, the state and the civil society showed quite some resilience and there was no pro-Russian mobilization from below. So Russia actually tried to use uh, some, um, implement some political projects on the occupied territories and use scenarios they kind of um, um, already used before in Crimea and in Donbass, like creating new people's republics. Um, as, as there was some point uh, in the first weeks in Kherson when they tried this and actually contacted the deputies of the Oblast Council and tried to bring somehow this, uh, so the Oblast Council to, to this idea so that they announced like um, People's Republic, but it did not work because the majority were against and they even issued, the Oblast Council issued like a declaration saying that we support territorial integrity of Ukraine. So no republics. <clears throat> uh, then there was a moment uh, they, they talked about like direct annexation without a referendum. So the signal was like, why do we need this referendum? Anyway, the West does not care about our referendums. And then the answer from Moscow was like, no, no, we want it as legal as it was with Crimea. So what is uh, left is, <laughs> is actually the idea of referendums. And we are witnessing uh, <laughs> for, for weeks and months now how the, actually the deadline is, is uh, <clears throat> moved, uh, has been moved many times. I think the last one was uh, September 11, right? The, the regional elections in Russia. Uh, but it was already, so there, there are already some rumors that it's going to be postponed again because the security situation does not allow it. Um, so uh, I think important point is that uh, the territories occupied eight years ago are actively used by Russia as a kind of springboards for the integration of the newly occupied territories. Speaking not only about like military bases, but uh, filtration camps, um, about logistics, about um, detention uh, and arrests of Ukrainian activists who are kept in, in, in Crimea and in, in Donetsk Republic. Um, and also in involvement of the local elites from these regions in, in, um, uh, in Russia's politics on the newly occupied territories. Um, you know that uh, from April this year, Sergei Kriyenko, uh, the vice head of Kremlin was, uh, Kremlin's administration was made in charge. Okay, I have <laughs> to move um, um, past them. Was made in charge of, of Donbass and the occupied territories and he tries to consolidate uh, Russia's policies. So, uh, so very briefly, <clears throat> There are different types of occupation and different experiences of the occupation on the ground depends on the duration of the occupation, of course, on the military situation, how hard the military uh, fights were on this territory, the level of destruction and depopulation. So just uh, uh, compare uh, Luhansk and Kherson, um, sorry, um, Mariupol and Kherson in this respect, but also uh, Russia has uh, somehow, uh, the interesting fact that Russia actually uh, respects Ukrainian administrative boundaries. So they really have like different plans for Donetsk and Lugansk republics and, and they, for Kherson and Zaporizhia. So they are thinking in terms of this oblast, yeah? what, what to do with, uh, with these territories. And of course, then for example, parts of Kharkiv oblast without Kharkiv, it really um, does not make any sense politically, um, makes it very different to deal with this kind of fragments of, of the territory. So the, the humanitarian situation, probably this is what we all know from many reports and uh, how the everyday looks like um, and at, at these territories where 
there is kind of absence of, of rule of law. Uh, people are fleeing, also fleeing from those territories who are now, um, uh, who, who were relatively safe in the beginning. Uh, problems with water supply, electricity, heating, so, uh, shortages of food and medicine, prices are rocketing, uh, supermarkets, Ukrainian supermarkets close and, and Russians come. But meanwhile, there is a kind of uh, um, like a backlash into the 90s with street trade and, and markets and uh, yeah. And uh, so speaking about Russia's policies on the occupied territories, um, they started to create civil, military civil administrations, um, putting pressure on local politicians, municipal leaders, journalists, uh, pro-Ukrainian activists, and so on, forcing them for some kind of co collaboration. Instrumentalization of humanitarian aid. We know, of course, media and propaganda play a very important role. Also cutting Ukrainians from information networks and putting pressure on Ukrainian internet and mobile phone providers. Um, pressure on local business, forcing them to like, uh, re re register according to the Russian rules, introduction of Russian currency, passportization. Uh, cultural politics and symbolic politics. And now I switch to resistance and my last point will be uh, collaboration. So resistance, there are many forms of resistance and I, uh, there are some kind of apolitical ones like local networks of solidarity, mass volunteer activities, people support each other, but there are also political protests that have been in the first weeks and first two months. And there are other forms, yeah, like removing Russian symbols, Russian flags, making public, marking public space with Ukrainian symbols, but also like boycott, sabotage, and we have been seeing a number of attacks on local collaborators and occupiers and even assassinations. Ukraine criminalized, um, um, criminalized um, collaboration uh, during the first week of, of the invasion, there was a, the two, two new laws were adopted, which made collaboration with the aggressor state uh, a criminal offense. Um, of course, one thing is uh, um, the law, the other thing is the reality, and here there are, of course, 50 shades of collaboration People collaborate for various reasons. It can be like situational decision because they have no choice. They cannot uh, leave the territory because they are in uh, like leading positions and they have to take decisions. Ideological collaboration. So there are different motivations from fear, submitting to blackmail, to ideological uh, motives, political revenge, because many of these people, they were kind of losers in the after after Euromaidan Ukraine, and of course economic interest, because uh, many local politicians are uh, having their own business there, and as you can imagine, business interests play a very important role here. I think I have to stop. Okay, so the rest, um, as I said, you can read in Osteuropa, and one chapter on education under occupation in Ukraine, uh, will appear this week in Spotlight on Soros website. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, for this important insight in the yeah, current developments in the occupied territories. Um, again, immediate questions for um, Tatiana. There's one. There. Please maybe also name yourself in your institution. Just Hello there. I'm, my name is Sherzad Yadkarov. I'm from the University European University of Viadrini in Frankfurt Oder. I'm a student and here for, um, according to the invitation from Professor uh, or Professor we came here as the students from the university. So my question to um, Tatiana Zhushenko was um, that you know uh, that uh, the Russia is influencing all these territories of Ukraine to be part of it, and 
was it but according to the Ukrainian constitution or the laws, would it be possible for Ukraine as a unitary state? Uh, was for these territories uh, the possibility for them to become separated from Ukraine without the influence of Russia? For example, knowing that the Crimea is uh, autonomous, for example. Um. Yeah, I don't know how to answer this question. I have to first to understand it. So you mean, what should I do with this question? <laughs> Maybe you can also digest and we can come back yeah. to this question uh, later. Is that okay? There's an another question or two, two more immediate questions. Tatiana, you said that it will be published in the spotlight, so maybe um, you could foreshadow that a little bit. I would be interested in the cultural and symbolic politics in the occupied territories. And it was how you tell the story of the war has been a huge, um, there's a huge effort invested into that in the Russian educational system, but I have the impression we know very little about how that is being extended onto the occupied territories and maybe also how beyond those occupied territories the war is being narrated in the educational system. Could you speak about that a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, there have been a lot of activities, of course, around the 9th of May, which is a very important symbolic date and which Russia traditionally uses for kind of pro-Russian mobilization in the post-Soviet space. So there were um, uh, all kind of uh, activities from, I don't know, like paying veterans uh, um, some kind of one-time benefits, like uh, according to Putin's order, and so there were um, immortal regiment uh, um, events, celebrations, concerts, and uh, the occupying authorities claimed this is for the first time that the Ukrainians can freely celebrate this holiday because they were like prohibited from celebrating the 9th of May before by the fascist government. And uh, so they, I, I think it was more or less like Russian narrative extended to these territories and the, the banner of victory, for example, was used um, along with the Russian flag. Um, I think part of it was that uh, probably uh, in Moscow they thought that people are like um, the older generation. For, for them it's easier to somehow to, to, to accept the, the Russian rule through the Soviet symbols rather than if you just come with Russian flags and the imperial narrative. So the day of Russia, for example, was celebrated widely on this occupied territory. So they tried to integrate these territories into the uh, symbolic space, uh, Russian symbolic space in this sense. And, and also like imperial narratives are inscribed in the public space, like Kherson is a Russian city, Potemkin, Pushkin, uh, Suvorov, I don't know, so these kind of posters are put on, on prominent places. This is just one example. There's another brief question by Cassie. Thank you. Uh, a short question. I, I'm wondering the, the categories of resistance and um, collaboration, where do they come from? Is it your uh, categorization or the legal ones or, yeah, thank you. Collaboration is a legal category. Uh, as I said, there was um, new legislation on collaboration. Um, and um, uh, actually, then various state bodies and also NGOs developed like guidelines. What is collaboration? What is not? What you should remember? Uh, where are the red lines? I think there is a lot of then kind of uh, coming from, from the top, a lot of... Um, explanations how to avoid like uh, col uh, collaborating because of not knowing the law. So it was uh, like a campaign to explain what does it mean. And currently the Ukrainian government uh, actually suggested to make some amendments to this legislation so that some activities which are uh, important like for the for the survival and well-being of the population are exempted from this legislation so if you kind of for example if you sell medicine humanitarian aid 
uh, I don't know, like um, the producing like food. Um, so this, if you do this, and of course you have in a way you are, you cannot avoid in a way uh, collaborating with the with the Russian authorities. But uh, this, uh, if if it's like um, uh, forced by the circumstances, it would not be a criminal offense. So it's a lot of discussions, what is collaboration and what is not. Uh, resistance is, is a more like a term coming from Ukrainian media and social networks, and, and so the, 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 uh, the people call themselves like partisans uh, uh, there, and of course we don't know who are these people, this is all kind of... Um, um, but but the, certainly there are actors there who are doing these things, like, uh, yeah. Okay, hey, thank you. Then I hope <laughs> <laughs> finally we can turn to the presentation. Yes. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> no more table dancing. We all. We all can use. Never mind. <laughs> we have enough of it. Do you remember which one is yours? <laughs> From this one? Keep on drinking. <laughs> There's one free. <laughs> well, I can start while uh, <laughs> this is set up. Um, you have plenty of time to anticipate this presentation. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we've teased you now twice, and this is the third time, and hopefully lucky. Uh, converted it to a uh, PDF, so hopefully it can be readable. Um, so this project um, is going back a long time with Jared, who's going to commentate on his own pro project, which is a little strange. <laughs> so it's like a self-reflection. <laughs> um, but also, more recently, with uh, Sabina and Gwen and Zoys. Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks for the invitation. The project goes back, as I said, to the Kosovo uh, recognition of 2008. And um, the the project was funded by NSF, National Science Foundation in the US at the time. Okay, thank you. Um, and it was to try and see if other um, unrecognized, self-declared republics uh, would have the same kind of international recognition as Kosovo, but also um, to what extent the people in those places um, were aware of the bigger geopolitical questions and also uh, what they felt about it. So one of the things we've always done in this project is to try and understand what ordinary people are thinking as opposed to what political leaders are saying and negotiating and shouting at each other. Um, the good news about this project is that we have repeated the same questions numerous times, actually close to 15 times in various places. So we have uh, 12 years of data going back to 2010 when we did the first, first survey in Abkhazia um, and also uh, up to the present in January of 2022 in the Donbass republics. The um, idea, and I'll give a very brief uh, background to it, but um, it actually was, this presentation today was stimulated by a paper that Jared and I and Kristen Bakke and another a former student of mine wrote was published in Political Geography in 2018. And there, um, because Kristen is a, uh, how can I describe Kristen? Um, she was a dyed-in-the-wool political scientist, right? And she was all about credible commitment and what kind of support the de facto leaders had and to what extent that support was um, comes from outside. Um, from the patron, which in this case is Russia, for the most part, and also um, how people felt about the patron. But I don't know about Jared, but I always was a little bit skeptical about the 
direction of the relationship. So in her view, um, credible commitment, which is measured by various um, indicators of state strength and, and um, um, people's support for the regime and uh, that sort of thing, um, that, was kind of, that was the um, dependent variable, right? The, the outcome variable. And the patron's activities and perception of the patron was the independent variable. And I was never quite convinced that that was the right direction of the relationship. So I thought, well, let me go back to this question and uh, reverse the direction of the relationship. And here, start out by what people in the de facto states are thinking about the nature of their state and how satisfied they are with the republic. And then how that um, impression, perception, um, how that relates to what they want in the far future, the, the final status of the, of the republic. So in the surveys, we have three consistent questions that we can use for the independent variable, for the mediating variable, which is trust of Putin, and then the outcome variable, which is either independence or uh, joining Russia. Um, there, there are other options in the questions, but they're so small, uh, in, which is returning to the, p the parent state, um, you know, are returning to Azerbaijan in the case of Karabakh, returning to Georgia in the case of uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, returning to Ukraine, uh, and, or Moldova in the case of Transnistria. So let me um, go quickly to the, the modeling. And uh, those of you who, um, who are familiar with statistics, um, this will be a very simplified version of it. Those of you who are not, hopefully, will gain something from this. But if you look at the uh, slide here, the independent predictor in this case is the rating of the region as going in the right or wrong direction. It's a classic question. It's used widely uh, to gauge the overall a feeling of a population about what's going on in their area, in the country, in this case, in the de facto republics. The outcome variable here is join Russia or not. So um, the, if you think of it as a binary choice, one is join Russia, zero is every other option, and don't knows, and refuse to answer the question as well. That's typically in modeling, you have what is written here as a direct relationship, right? So you put in the various variables into the model, you have a series of demographic controls usually, and then you look at the coefficient for the key uh, variable of interest, which in this case is uh, independent predictor, region going in right and the wrong direction, and you would also have in that box of predictors trusting Putin. Okay. But there's another way of doing it, which is to think of trust in Putin, trust in the patron, the leader of the patron state, as a mediating variable. So in other words, rather than a direct relationship as in the top here, there is a sort of an indirect relationship as well as a direct relationship for some people. So here the idea is you rate um, how the region is going in the right or wrong direction. You also are asked to rate Putin, whether you trust him on a three-point scale. And then uh, there's a way of modeling this to, and to calculate how much uh, of the outcome variable here joining Russia is mediated, it's affected by directly uh, the trust in Putin. So um, here are the list of surveys. There are, uh, you can see, uh, 13 of them here. Uh, four for Abkhazia, a um, couple for Karabakh, three for Transnistria, two for South Ossetia, uh, two for the Donbass Republics, and maybe three if you count the Keys work in the uh, Donbass Republics. I I'll skip the uh, case uh, example for reasons that I can really explain in detail, but you probably don't want to know what it is now. Um, most of the surveys are face-to-face -face surveys, but over time it's been increasingly difficult to do face-to-face -face surveys. So a lot of it now is done by uh, computer-assisted telephone interviewing. Um, here in the overall sample size, it's uh, 10,700 people pooled sample. Um, and of that, about two, about two thirds are face-to-face, uh, -face, but more recently, as I said, and, and large samples um, are the um, telephone interviewing. So <clears throat> if we just look at these two options, and I said the third option, fourth options are, are very small, which are uh, independence or joining Russia. Uh, the blue bars on here are the uh, independence choices, and then the uh, 
orange bars are joining Russia or Armenia. In the case of Karabakh, it's not about joining Russia. Um, you know, there is sizable variation in these bar graphs, you can see. Um, South Ossetia, for example, has overwhelming majorities who want to join Russia and very small numbers who want to join, uh, who want independence. By contrast, in Abkhazia, um, there's always been a very high rate of preference for independence, especially among the ethnic Abkhaz. There's a very strong nationality difference in that place. Uh, more recently, in the um, People's Republics in the Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk, um, there you can see the numbers who prefer to join Russia based on the Levada surveys are very, very high, you know, well over half of the, of the numbers and relatively few, less than 10% who want independence. Um, so those are the kind of outcome variables. In terms of the regional direction, which is, is it going in the right way or the wrong way, actually, on the average, most people in the de facto republics are happier <laughs> with how the region is going than most people in Western democracies, um, which is not something that uh, politicians generally want to hear, but it's, it's true. The ratings are actually quite high. Obviously, uh, significant variation. Um, there is some temporal variation within, um, let's say, Abkhazia. You can see in the earlier samples in 2010 and 2014 have higher ratios of uh, going in the right direction, and then more recently, um, those numbers going in the wrong direction have gone up. But overall, it's a relatively positive picture from the perspective of the uh, residents. And then in terms of um, trust in Putin, which is the um, graph here, the gray bars is not at all. The uh, orange bar is a little, and then the red bar is a lot. <laughs> you might like my choice in color, but anyway, um, you can see, again, significant variation between the republics and very high uh, rates of uh, trust in places like South Ossetia uh, and in the Donbass republics. So, in terms of modeling, um, there are, as I said, two ways to do it. This is the direct relationship. So we have a whole bunch of controls here, nationality, age, gender, you know, what your status uh, right now in terms of income affordability, uh, whether you thought the end of the Soviet Union was a right or wrong step. Um, there's also some controls for um, how the interviewer, the enumerator, rated the respondent's comfort with the survey. Okay? This is something we always do. We ask at the end of each um, survey, can you rate how the interviewer uh, felt, sorry, how the uh, respondent felt about the survey? And again, they usually do a four-point rating from completely comfortable to not so comfortable with certain questions. Um, again, not surprisingly, we see a very strong relationship between trusting Putin and preference for joining Russia. But what surprised me, and maybe somebody can help me understand this, I thought, going into this, before I did this analysis, that if you rated the region going in the right direction, you would want independence, right? Because, you know, frankly, joining Russia gives up a lot of autonomy and you're, you're kind of giving up control of the region. But in fact, the relationship is strong and it's positive. So in other words, um, rating the region going in the right direction actually increases the uh, motivation to say you want to join Russia. I think, and as I'll show you here, this is strongly affected by the results from Donbass because there the samples are very large and the um, strength of the relationship is very, very strong. So it tends to pull the whole pool sample in that direction. Um, so let me <clears throat> show you here at least um, how, it, how it varies because <laughs> Kristen is not here so I can uh, criticize her. <laughs> um, political scientists typically pool. They're looking for a general relationship. Um, sorry, Gwen. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> oh, you don't. Okay, good. Um, we geographers tend to um, we tend to split samples apart and look at the context-specific motivations and differences, right? So, if you look here as a simple example, you can see the shaded gray areas are the ones which are not significant. The um, clear colors are significant, but again, there's big differences between the um, between the samples. Um, I just got a message from <clears throat> Sabina to hurry up and I've finished, but I will. Um, anyway, here is the mediated model. By the way, I, ha I do have a paper. I have written it. Um, it's very rough, <laughs> um, but if anybody's interested, I can certainly uh, send it. Um, if we look at the 
pool sample, which is the column on the far left, right? The ACME is the mediated effect. The ADE is the direct effect. And then the calculate, so then you have a total effect, and then you can calculate what proportion of the, the, of the overall effect is mediated by trust in Putin. Right. And so what you can see here is, especially in the overall pool sample, again, it's very positive, um, very significant relationship, and it's also quite high. The mediated ratio is about 18%, which is high for these kinds of models. But it's especially high for the Donbass republics. So you can see in the 2020 survey, in I think it was September of 2020, the ratio is 31% mediated by trust in Putin. And then the most recent survey in January of this year, it's actually up to 82% mediated by trust in Putin, which is extraordinarily high, right? In all of the other, most of the other places, there's hardly any mediated effect that's worth talking about. There's a test for, um, called the Sobel test to see if a mediated model is better than just a direct relationship. And in almost every case here, the uh, answer is yes. The Sobel test shows there is a, a mediation effect. So to kind of summarize this uh, very quickly, um, I would say that rather than looking at the pool sample, it's almost better to not show it or forget about it because, as I said, the results vary significantly from de facto republic to uh, one to another, which is, I guess, the kind of the geographic me message, right? That, that it's, it's a mistake to lump all of the de facto republics into one category and see them as sort of um, polities within um, kind of a comparative um, model. It's much better to sort of look at them as specific places with specific conditions, characteristics, which drives their um, the uh, interests of the, um, of the residents in either joining Russia or being independent. I think, as I said, these, these particular results, I think, are really strongly uh, driven by the uh, relationships that have appeared um, in the last couple of samples in the Donbass republics. And therefore, um, I think it's fair to say that whereas overall, if we look at the kind of the five regions here, the Donbass republics certainly fit the model. Trust in Putin is very high. Join, wish to join Russia is very, very high. The same thing is true in South Ossetia and to some extent in Transnistria. In Abkhazia, as I said, it's quite different. There's a very high ratio who want independence. Again, the ethnic Abkhaz, it is an ethnocracy, and um, they are quite happy with that. I would like it to kind of certify it more directly. And then, of course, Karabakh is a very different condition because of Russia as kind of a secondary patron of a patron rather than Armenia as the most direct one. So think of them as five different places, different relationships, but the most pro-Russian, the most uh, strongly pro-Putin are Transnistria, South Ossetia, and uh, the Donbass republics. And I'll stop there. Thank you. See, you had to wait. <laughs> Well, thank you for this, um, uh, yeah, insight into comparative uh, uh, study and time and also between the de factos. Are there immediate questions? Irina. Uh, yes, thanks a lot for this presentation. Could you just uh, tell us if uh, about this question of whether respondents prefer independence or uh, joining Russia? they also had the possibility of saying that they preferred joining again their previous state of parent state yes uh, yeah. yeah thank you yes so so th uh, typically they had uh, four options um, jo independence joining russia or armenia in the case of karabakh right and then um, rejoining the parent state again depending on where they are um, but then there was al also another option which was other and then you know list the options uh, under the other category what do they mean <laughs> you know? um, but i will say that overall you know well over 90 percent said either independence or joining russia um, the other ratios were very very small and i think um, again it was i i actually don't think there was anybody in the karabakh samples who ever said they wanted to join uh, azerbaijan because 
of the almost complete ethnic cleansing, everybody in the sample is Armenian uh, in Karabakh. There was a slight difference in the other places, but in general, the ratios who wanted to rejoin the parents is very small. Hello? Yes, I know this goes beyond your survey, probably, because the, the last survey was taken before the war, right? Mm -hmm. So could you just speculate? <laughs> the, I mean, war is a very different condition from right. what they've been living in. Uh, um, well, you think there's a change <laughs> uh, in the course of the last uh, six months? I'm not going to answer that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we... We did a presentation, I don't know, when, when was it? In February? Right before the war? Yeah, just the day before the war or something. Um, that because in, in the Donbass, uh, we had three different companies surveying on both sides of the line of control. And um, we got very different results in the Donbass republics to um, the people who answered the question from Kiev, from Kiev in Kiev versus the people who answered the question from Lovada in Moscow. And so we're trying to, or at least I'm <laughs> trying to think what happened here. And we've been trying to follow up. But uh, actually, a lot of it has to do with, with telephone networks, which ones were operating and which uh, telephone networks people were using. Because Kiev were using uh, Ukrainian networks that were still operating in the Donbass republics. And then the Lovada were using local networks. And so there's a very, very, very big difference there. Um, but I don't know what's happened since uh, February, um, and I, I suppose it'll be a while before we ever find out. Yeah. A very brief, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. C could you please uh, elaborate a little bit more on the potential of preference falsifications mm -hmm. uh, during this uh, surveys? Mm -hmm. Because I noticed that you mentioned that uh, these correlations between um, pro-joining Russia and evaluation of the um, good directions that are taken in these republics, uh, you tell about this right after that, uh, mentioning that uh, you had a question about the overall uh, anxiety about this survey, uh, how it did play out. In your, in your opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I, as I said at the end, I, I think I made a mistake by showing the pool sample <laughs> because, um, you know, when you, when you pool and you don't wait, and these are not weighted, um, then you tend to um, have a, an effect which is perhaps a bit biased in terms of one particular sample pulling the overall direction of the relationships in, in, that, in that way. And so I think what happened here is, as I said, the um, ratings in the Donbass republics for the region going in the right direction and for trusting Putin are very, very, and for joining Russia, are extremely high. They're almost like a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. It's, it's a, and elsewhere, it's a mixed uh, picture. And so what happens in the overall model is that you get a... Uh, strong uh, average effect when you, uh, you know, kind of average it overall because one place is particularly strong. Um, so, the the I, I mean, if you're asking about the, um, sorry, are you asking about the trust in Putin uh, no, ratings? No, no. I, I asked about trust in Putin. Yeah. Less than that, perhaps yeah. in the surveys. Yeah. Um, that is fact that Lubada. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Probably, yes. Um, I, as part of our kind of follow-up to understand what happened, um, I, there was a graph that I went through very quickly, but it showed that the people in the Donbass republics who answered the key survey, the ratio of those people who said they wanted to join Russia or independence is less than 10%, right? And the ratio who said they wanted to rejoin Ukraine is much higher. There's also, by the way, for the Keys ratio, a very, very high number of people who said don't know, which is a typical way of avoiding a controversial question, right? Um, and so, in part of our follow-up to understanding this, we contacted uh, Volodymyr Paniota, who is the head of the Keys um, survey company. And he said he wasn't surprised by the results at all, um, that um, he thinks that the uh, People are responding to 
uh, companies that they trust in terms of the origins of the uh, company. So that if you're calling from Keys into the Donbass republics, you know, you're not so sure. But it, Moscow is more, in a sense, more reliable or more trustworthy. So yeah, I think there's a very strong effect based on where they are calling from. Um, it's, there's a lot of problems with the, um, the usual checks of surveys in, um, in all of these places, but especially in the Donbass republics, because it has to do with um, there's no reliable demographic data, so waiting and so on is, is a kind of a shot in the dark. Um, the kinds of um, stuff you would like to do in terms of underground checking you can't really do because of authorities won't give you permission. Um, in Abkhazia, as an example, uh, in 2020, the face-to-face -face surveys were interrupted when the interviewers from Levada were arrested by the authorities. And so we uh, had planned 800 uh, surveys after 268. That face-to-face -face was stopped, and then we went and finished it using the telephone surveys. Um, so there's you know, lots of difficulties along those lines. Okay, now, thank you. Are you going to go to Jared? So there's a yeah. question there. Or? <laughs> there's, um, but we, we are somehow running out of time. So if it is a brief question. I was going to suggest maybe you could turn it into an empirical question. So instead of wondering about how much of an effect it has, you could you leverage the fact that people respond to the questions differently from different yeah. places. Well, that's what I need to talk to Gwen about later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we... we keep that for later talks in, in, in coffee breaks or lunch breaks. And um, I, I think I want to hand over now to Gerard, who has the challenge to, um, yeah, and here's the microphone, to um, comment on all have a slide uh, okay, the papers uh, we listened to. Okay, uh, so there are how many minutes left? <laughs> Um, and I'm the only person standing between you and lunch, so it's a great position to be in. Yes, <laughs> use it. <laughs> um, okay, so let me make a few uh, general remarks um, about this idea of uh, everyday geopolitics and lived geopolitics, because I think there's, it's worth kind of teasing out whether that is a material reality or it is something that is discursive. Uh, where we understand it in um, as through consciousness and through uh, the particular uh, political discourses that we're exposed to. I, I think, in general, before uh, the war, there was a paradox in that how everyday life was effectively shaped by geopolitics of various sorts. And, and when, I'm, when I'm using the term geopolitics, I'm really referring to great power competition and zero-sum competition. Um, so how everyday life was certainly shaped by that, but it was not experienced uh, as such. So there is a hidden geopolitics to how the world is structured, how the infrastructures that we have are sort of shaped by competition between great powers. But what has, of course, happened with the war is that hidden geopolitics has suddenly uh, come to the fore. We, we have now moments, we, have, we had in the past moments of geopoliticization when, for example, in the past, Russia would cut off uh, oil or cut off um, gas supplies to Europe. We'd have a crisis, and then the infrastructure would be seen as weaponized, and there would be a moment of geopoliticization, which would then fade away, and then you would have, quote unquote, back to normal, modernity, globalization, markets working, and the like, even though there were, this was all structured by geopolitics. Today, we live in this incredibly geopoliticized moment because we're in the aftermath of a geopolitical shock. So the whole infrastructure is exposed as geopolitical. And we have a cascade of zero-sum logics unfolding in different domains where weaponization is what is occurring in terms of the West's response with sanctions, uh, SWIFT and the like. Um, 
and then also how uh, you know Nord Stream 1 is now being closed. Uh, so it is weaponization of infrastructures. That's a particular moment that we're in right now. Um, and I think to kind of go to Ivan's point uh, last night, the challenge of the current moment and for the next six months is whether we will retain a sense that we are in a geopoliticized moment and whether people, ordinary people, will see uh, their gas bills as a function of geopolitics and as a function of the, 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 the need to have solidarity with Ukraine uh, requires us to interpret the crisis, the energy crisis, in a geopolitical way, or whether it'll be interpreted as simply incompetent government, incompetent government as you know a crisis of hydrocarbon capitalism, and so on and so forth. And so that's a, a moment where I think it's worth thinking about everyday geopolitics as something which is not innate, but it is sort of it's a consciousness which may wax and wane. And so the research question for the future is geopoliticization. How long will that last? How long will those Ukrainian flags fly uh, and the like? And the, the challenges from other discourses. So that's a general point. And it's a general point to kind of frame uh, my comments on all of the presentations, which I really enjoyed and I hope you did too. In terms of Regina's uh, presentation, the question I would have is whether do, do people experience themselves as living a geopolitics at the church. I, I really like the questions you asked at the end where it gets to the sort of the intimate, you know, wh whether the church will bury your relatives or not. And so whether in this moment that is seen as um, is something that is, that by virtue of continuing to go to that church, you are therefore a... Um, opting for a geopolitical identity and geopolitical position. Or, given what you said with the just orthodox category, that's a de-geopoliticizing moment, a de-geopoliticizing de uh, opportunity where people can experience religion, you know, spiritually rather than geopolitically. And so I think that's, uh, that's an open question I would have there. The second question I have is, has to do with the the notion of the sacred. It's not part of your paper, but I've done some research on this as, as to what is sacred, because I'm very interested in whether uh, territory is sacred now to Ukrainians. And I've done some uh, actually empirical research with, with a colleague at George Mason University, uh, Karina uh, Korostelina, uh, on this. And um, what we found, we asked about uh, how much does the sacred come from religion? Uh, in a particular survey that we did in July. And I was quite surprised that there was a variation, a significant variation, but about 50% said it doesn't come from religion at all. So that the sacred is you know, commitment to the self, commitment to the family, commitment to uh, community, commitment to territory, uh, to the independence of the state. And so that's, that's a kind of uh, interesting question. Um, so... Um, Claudia, I really uh, uh, very much uh, like this paper. I think it fits in very well in terms of uh, the, the moment that we're in, in terms of infrastructural geopolitics, your emphasis on choke points and uh, the ways in which bureaucratic procedures are weaponized. Uh, and so what you're really looking at are these flow missions and the control of them. Um, I, I wanted to I sort of make a provocation to you, and that is that sort of you have the lived geopolitics has been associated with the, the uh, people at the, uh, on the ground at the bottom, but there is a lived geopolitics in the foreign ministry, not so far from here, and they are also waiting. There's a waiting there for the right diplomatic moment mm -hmm. in which to... Uh, for diplomacy to come to the fore again. Um, and uh, there is also, I, I think, a particular temporality to how you experience, whether the people in line experienced it as geopolitics or whether they experienced it as climate change. Because you talk about how hot it was and the person that died. So how we live and how we understand the particular moment that we're in is part of what we need to kind of understand and whether it's going to be geopolitical or whether it's going to be environmental and climatic uh, is 
I think, one of the things we have to, to address. Um, so I would urge you to think about the, the notion of lived geopolitics as being something that could be researched here with diplomats in terms of what they have to do and how they're trying to uh, negotiate the, the everyday. Uh, Tatiana, um, uh, also a very, very relevant, extremely relevant uh, paper. It's, it, it is those that are um, experienced uh, Ukrainian scholars is, uh, and everyone involved uh, in, in knowing these places is just shocked by what has happened. And the degree to which there is, um, uh, and, and this is a question I had, the degree to which there is a blueprint behind this or there is an ad hoc quality. Uh, and so I, I wanted to ask you about whether there's a room for disaggregating the category of occupied territories. Because you talk about how Crimea is occupied in a particular way, there's very little resistance, even there's, there's out-migration, then the Donbass is, it happens in a different way, um, but um, what happens thereafter is even more radical. These are places where there was no support, or very, very little support, and we know this from, from our service from 2014 and, and, and onwards, very, very little support. And so it's a radical program of demographic uh, re-engineering through violence. And so a lot of the things that I saw in Bosnia when I was doing research there, I, you know, you see them again. So this idea of refuge chest, the idea of uh, effectively uh, herbicide, destroying places, completely flattening them, uh, and then re renaming them. I'm just wondering about uh, the degree to which there was a blueprint or whether this is an ad hoc thing, or this is something that, you know, is a memory from World War II, uh, if you could explain that. And I also explain why the sort of Novorossiya signifier uh, disappears, because the, you're right, the, they do have a problem in, in that there is a certain respect for the um, administrative boundaries of Ukraine, the oblast boundaries, but they only control certain uh, of these. And so what does that mean in terms of how this can be sold uh, at all, uh, if it can be sold? I, I'm just kind of wondering about that. Um, lastly, to, to Jono, um, this, uh, and I've read the paper, is your sort of dialogue with political scientists. It's your attempt to try to think like a political scientist, <laughs> and so I commend you for that, <laughs> because <laughs> essentially what you, you're doing is you're looking at, you're almost saying, okay, it's an abstract question about patron relationship with de facto states, and so maybe you could have uh, Taiwan in there as, a, as another aspect. But in practice, what you come back to is the material geopolitical conditions of the field that these states uh, that these sta how they're uh, formed and the conditions under which they're formed and they're very very different, right? Uh, so the you know the the, ter the relationship of um, South Ossetia to North Ossetia, which is always going to be different from Abkhazia and the particular nature of Abkhazia, because South Ossetia uh, was essentially ethnically cleansed. There's only uh, Ossetians left there, uh, whereas Abkhazia, um, though massive uh, forced displacement from there, but you have this multi-ethnic quality to it, and you have the uh, sons of the soil who see it as their particular uh, home, and therefore have a very different relationship to Russia than Ossetians that want to want kinship with the North Ossetia, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I think the geopolitical field dictates patron trust, that the territorial, the demographic, and the cultural material givens almost dictate that you're going to, that people in Karabakh are going to have trust in the Armenian leadership generally, or people in South Ossetia are going to trust the Russian leader no matter who it is, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I, I'm just wondering whether that those sort of very basic geopolitical uh, dynamic forces which are enduring shape it. And then when you come to the Donbass, well, it, you know, th there's a, there's a, 
there's a potentially a category error when you put in the Donbass with these other de facto states. Because Ukraine didn't have a de facto state until 2014. It's very, very different. It's massive compared to these other places. You know, you're talking millions of people. And, and, it, and it's very much created. It's a, it's a project to break the territory of Ukraine. And that's different from the evolution of Transnistria, the evolution of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh, which were more uh, sort of contingent and involved a, a weak center. Um, so those are some comments I have. I probably have gone on way too long. Uh, lunch is, uh, I'm sure, ready. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to some really great papers. Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you wanted to say that we have somehow to negotiate now between everyday needs of having lunch and maybe the need or interest to discuss, uh, or if you want to comment, but on, on what uh, Gerard said. Um, but I think maybe we combine that at the lunch. Yep. Maybe we combine right. that at the lunch and, and meet there and continue. So thank yep. you, everyone for uh, Tanya, Claudia, Regina, Renaud, and Gerard for all your input and uh, um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you.
And she's actually in Paris this year, and I'm hoping to bring her up for a talk. So maybe. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I think we're on now. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. No more gossiping. Yeah. Hello. What, what's that? You hear me? Yes. I, okay, you do. I hear myself too. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, after a suspicious technical interruption, which may or may not have anything to do with the topic of the panel, I welcome you to the first panel in the afternoon. Uh, my name is Beli Lojakla, and I am currently co-shouldering the research cluster, political economy and integration with my colleague, Julia Langbein. Today's uh, uh, panel, um, Beyond the China Threat, how China shapes development in Eastern Europe is um, a part of the research we do in, the, in, in this uh, cluster. Uh, it is um, uh, one that we want to spotlight today, thematize uh, today with, the, with different uh, inputs and perspectives. But beyond um, what China does and studying China and the research cluster, we also cover topics of political economic integration and disintegration uh, with an eye towards um, uh, partnership agreements with Moldova, Ukraine and uh, Georgia. Beyond that, we look at resource uh, extractivism and uh, other issues. But today, eyes are on China. And I would not like to take the floor for a very long time, but um, introduce um, my speakers, um, which will cover different perspectives of, um, of Chinese engagement, including terrorizing um, infrastructural engagement through China. I'm joined today with Valentin Kusman, um, my colleague at SOIS, and uh, Samuel Rogers, Sarah Eaton will be discussing uh, the topics. Um, Valentin will be, um, well, Valentin is a researcher and doctoral student at SOIS, and his uh, research focuses on both the objectives and the outcomes of um, Chinese infrastructure engagement along the Belt and Road Initiative in East um, Europe and Eurasia. Um, Samuel Rogers, um, he is a postdoctoral researcher at the Open University, where he works on an ERC-funded research project uh, that looks into dynamics and effects of Chinese infrastructure investment in Europe. He's at the same time a visiting researcher at um, a Free University in Berlin. His principal research interests are on the political economy of infrastructure, illiberal capitalist development, and rentierism. And his forthcoming book investigates the changing dynamics of the post-2010 Hungarian political economy. Um, Sarah Eaton does not require an introduction, but I will still do so. She's a professor of transregional China studies at Humboldt University Berlin and a co-founder of the Berlin Contemporary China Network. She's interested in the study of contemporary Chinese politics and political economy from comparative and transregional perspectives. Um, I myself also a SOIS researcher, principal investigator, and uh, as a critical geographer and institutional economist, I study infra infrastructural uh, processes, resource extractivism, and authoritarian governance. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Valentin. Uh, Valentin will take a zoomed out perspective on the question of China, the Chinese threat, and, and uh, give us an understanding of, to, 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 he will take the discourse of colliding scripts between different models of development, EU versus China, and um, yeah, he will give, give, uh, test this, this discourse and give us a bit more um, insights on that. The floor is yours. All right, so today I'll be presenting um, the paper um, called Colliding Scripts, Comparing the Belt and Road Initiative and the EU Approach to Development Corporation. Um, it's, uh, it's a co-authored paper by Tanja Bertzel, um, Julie Langbein, Wu Lunting, and, and myself. So our paper is set against the backdrop of debates on, on the BRI's presence in Europe and on, on whether the BRI serves as a, as a purposefully designed instrument um, to challenge um, global power relations and, to, and liberal hegemony. And so we ask ourselves the question um, on whether it advances an alternative script to, um, for economic development. Um, and, we, and so in the sense, we explore um, the degree to which the, um, the BRI is compatible with the liberal script of economic development um, or an alternative to it. And we do this essentially by comparing the similarities and differences between the script um, embedded in China's Belt and Road and the EU script of um, development cooperation. 
And this comes at a particularly um, relevant time, um, particularly in the context of a growing sense of disenchantment, of discontent, of disappointment uh, among Central and Eastern European states with, with China, also including the BRIs, um, particularly due to a lack of tangible outcomes with cooperation with China, including in the um, China CZE Cooperation Forum, 17 plus one, which is now of course down to 14 plus one as the Baltic states have, have all recently left. Um, also, the EU has um, repeatedly um, been raising concerns about the BRI's compatibility with the EU development script um, by insisting that the BRI has to be, that relevant aspects of the BRI have to be in line with EU law, rules and policies. So, kind of in a nutshell, in order to explore whether the BRI is in fact an alternative to the liberal script, we first compare the, the China model of development, so how China itself developed to the BRI, and then compare these with the EU script to look for possible areas of, of collision. So, as, as a first step, um, we define key planks of the China model, which describe the essentially the political economic pillars which supported China's domestic development, and then explored what degree um, these pillars are relevant in key BRI policy documents um, to see how um, the degree to which they reflect. So while there is no formal consensus um, of the China model, um, of what it exactly it constitutes, we identify six planks, um, or eight here, um, of, to China's economic development. So, so first is the notion that China's leadership it views political stability as kind of the overriding con condition to anything else, um, and that all policy decisions are, ref are, are reflected um, in this logic. And, and this requires a, a tight Leninist style of political control. Um, second is the prioritization of economic development. Um, and this. Um, essentially represents the notion that economic rights um, take precedence over, over the development of civil and political rights. And, and this is also where, where pragmatism in Chinese policymaking comes in. Um, so if, if one approach to development is, 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 one approach is, is conducive to growth, then, then that's a, that's a, a sensible choice. Um, and this has led to, to quite a form, strong form of exclusive development in China um, with strong wealth divides. Third, um, the principles of gradualism and experimentation. So this stands in, in contrast to the, to the shock therapy mode of liberalization, the idea that, that, that policy reform um, is gradual, but also that certain policies are results of local experimentation. Then fourth, the centrality of the party state, um, including allocating the factors of production and in guiding, and in guiding um, the market. Um, this is also, for example, um, um, evident in strong industrial policy. Then we have the notion, the principle of the rule by law, um, as opposed to the, to the liberal notion of the rule by law, oh, sorry, the rule of law. And then, and then finally, the, a localization of policy, which is linked to the Westphalian principle of sovereignty, that, that, um, econo that, that economic development should follow um, local or, or national conditions. Um, and when we look at the, at, the, at the policy documents of the Belt and Road, we find that there are overlaps with the China model that we defined, um, but the BRI does depart substantially from the China model in, in certain areas, and it is largely compatible with the key principles of the liberal economic order. And this is, for example, particularly due to extensive commitments in these policy documents to market-led development. Um, so these documents, they say that the market should play a decisive role in resource allocation, um, that the, and that the BRI is designed in a way to uphold um, global free trade regime. These documents, they also show a strong commitment to align the initiative to um, with international norms and standards. These documents, um, they, they also claim respect for local rules and local conditions. So these, this is where China's, China's well-known principles of non-interference and non-conditionality come in. Um, and they also reflect the, um, the um, Westphalian principle of sovereignty, also a pillar of the, of the liberal order. Um, and they also have the goal of bringing about inclusive growth. So there isn't really all that much at these points which, which explicitly challenges the liberal order. But in, in areas where the BRI does um, overlap with the China model, such as regarding um, its claimed pragmatism um, and its contestation of liberal universalism, which is, for example, um, 
um, illustrated in the fact that BR the BRI is, according to these documents um, and according to Chinese rhetoric, open to all countries, regardless of their political and economic system. But it does this in a way which is, is doesn't doesn't really directly, explicitly challenge or reject um, liberal principles. And then, as, as as a second step, we then we then look at the BRI at its level of implementation. So we move away from from what's written in, these, in, the, in policy. And here we do find a, 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 a decoupling between declared policy program and, and practice. And this is driven by some of the principles and norms from the China model, which creep their way back in, into the implementation of the BRI. And it is, it is here where we see the strongest potential for collision with the EU's liberal script. So a first area of, of, of this decoupling concerns the principles of non-conditionality and non-interference. Um, as BRI loans in practice are not exactly fully devoid of conditionality. And in the paper, we identify several um, forms of conditionality. Then a second and important um, decoupling exists regarding the BRI's commitment to, to markets and market-led development. Um, in BRI implementation, the market is, is not always decisive in, in resource allocation. The state continues to play a major role in resource allocation, and, and this is despite um, a commercialization of, of, the, of the initiative in recent years. Um, actors, particularly SOEs, they're supported by the state and they act, behave differently um, according to different risk calculations um, than, than market entities would. And also there's often limited participation from host countries here um, where, where, where funding and project execution often both come from the Chinese side and that is contained in a Chinese, Chinese loop within, within the Chinese state system. Um, and then third, the, the BRI is not always um, attentive to local conditions, as it says in policy documents. It's, for example, often at odds with local procurement policies, um, such as the case in, with, in Hungary with the Belgrade-Budapest railway. And often, although this little bit less of the focus towards the CE region, but um, economic environments characterized by by low savings rates, they're not always necessarily conducive to, to infrastructure-led development. So in, in sum, um, the BRI implementation su suggests that several tenets of the China model have um, entered the BRI through the back door, but without going so far as to promoting it as an alternative to the liberal script. And this suggests that the BRI is, is more focused on supporting China's um, domestic economic development than it is as a, as a vehicle to export China's mode of economic governance. So then in, in, in the final part of the paper, um, we, we turn towards the EU and, and we outline several pillars of the EU script for development and economic governance and, and how they play out also at this programmatic policy level and the, at the level of implementation when the EU engages with, with member states, with candidate countries or third countries. And, and here, um, so we, we discuss how compatible these features are to the BRI. So at the policy le level, um, so the EU it has developed um, integration strategies for its peripheries um, in order to mitigate negative externalities associated with market, with market integration. The EU has developed a set of tools and institutions at the supranational level that focus on enabling um, prospective members to, to anticipate challenges and to manage, develop, manage developmental consequences. Um, so th th this notion of trans-liberalized, embed, uh, transnationalized embedded liberalism in the EU's um, engagement with states, with weaker developmental capacities, with weaker, with weaker state capacities, it's a much more comprehensive and balanced script than for development that, that, than the BRI is with its, with its focus on connectivity and on infrastructure. Um, also, both scripts, they, they're similar in the sense that they, at the programmatic level, in the sense that they pursue inclusive and sustainable economic growth. They both equally subscribe to global free trade and an open economy. Um, but, but for the EU, the link of aid, trade, um, link of aid, trade and investment to the fight against corruption and good governance is, is much more generally, more broadly, is, is also key to, to preventing rent-seeking and state capture by local elites. Um, so then on, on the programmatic level, the EU strongly emphasizes rules-based development, which is anchored in, um, strong liberal, in this strong liberal conditionality. Um, these rules, they're, they're anchored in the Copenhagen criteria, which, which links a functioning market, market economy to democracy. Um, 
the rule of law to impartial institutions, um, they're, and they're key parts of the liberal script that the EU seeks to export through its relations with members, candidates, neighbors, and third countries. So unlike China, the EU um, uses development cooperation more strongly to support its liberal script at home, but also to export it to other country, countries, particularly if these countries um, seek closer, closer relations to the EU or want to become um, EU members themselves. Um, and the EU does this by making its aid, trade investments uh, more conditional upon commitment to and compliance with liberal norms and rules. So, um, so in the sense what the EU, um, for example, presents its global gateway its infrastructure initiative as, as a rules and values based model as an alternative to the BRI, it's the BRI um, and its flexible nature with its flexibility, its pragmatism and openness. Um, it might actually might in the sense help avoid collision at this at the programmatic level. Um, yes, the, the way the BRI is implemented, um, it does undermine liberal principles and rules. Um, that the EU seeks to um, protect and to promote, such as the rule of law, the fight against the corruption, the protection of markets. Um, but, but at the level of implementation, the EU use development cooperation script. It also significantly, um, sh there's also signs of decoupling between declared policy um, objectives and implementation, which um, somewhat ironically reduce the potential for a collision with the BRI. So at the, at the level of implementation, this is, this is, particular, this is due to a, kind of a, a lack of willingness or capacity on behalf of the EU to make countries adhere to, it, to its script. Um, the implementation of EU policies is in practice also um, characterized by pragmatism that the BR, uh, flexibility and openness that the BRI defines as one of its own um, trademarks and the extent to which the EU um, to which the EU promotes and protects liberal norms and procedures beyond its borders. It also differs across time and across peripheries as well. Um, for example, the EU's efforts in, to promote state building in the Western Balkans, that they have, they've been limited. There's been a lack of commitment um, to European integration among domestic political elites and the absence of, criteria, of clear criteria for successful state building. They're perceived to be as key factors which undermine the EU's efforts to support state building in, in, in the Western Balkan region. And so, and, and the EU's um, rules and value-based approach towards countries with, without a really credible um, membership perspective is often also compromised by, by a um, democratization, st stabilization dilemma, because asking non um, or li illiberal regimes to adopt a liberal script is difficult and ultimately requires regime change. And the EU's relations with Hungary, with Serbia, with Turkey, they're, they're examples of how um, the EU and its member states, how, how prepared they are to, to compromise on the respect for human rights, for, for um, the rule of law, democracy, and good governance. So, in, so while conditionality with Chinese characteristics, um, it renders the BRI far less open and flexible than it, than it claims to be, um, but the EU itself also tends to compromise on its liberal conditionality, often um, leading towards exclusive development like the, B like the BRI often does as well, or at worst, the consolidation of, of rent-seeking structures both w within and, and outside of the Union. So, the e so as such, kind of the, the EU, it, it also consider considerably waters down its liberal script during its implementation and political values, um, they often get lost in putting EU development policies into practice. And, and this, this idea, it reduces the potential for collision with the BRI. Um, so to sum up, Ch China, the China's China model um, of development is at odds with the liberal script of democracy and markets. Um, but at the, at the programmatic level, not all of this is reflected in the BRI. Um, and so the BRI is not um, fundamentally at odds with the liberal script. Um, and like the EU, the BRI claims to pursue, um, pursue inclusive and sustainable economic growth, and it also subscribes to, a, to, a, to free trade and an open economy. But um, in its implementation, the BRI introduces the China model through the back door, and this creates potential for conflict with the EU's um, liberal conditionality. Um, but the implementation of EU policies um, is also characterized by pragmatism that the BRI claims at the programmatic level, democracy and rule of law often get um, watered down in its implementation. And so economically, the development script of the BRI and the EU are largely compatible as they both subscribe to economic liberalism. But 
but politically, the potential of collision is reduced by the EU itself compromising its um, liberal conditionality. Thank you. <laughs> Valentin, thank you so much for this, um, for this presentation. Uh, for two reasons, my, my gratitude. First of all, for giving us an overview and, and a and a more nuanced hands-on understanding um, about these seemingly or allegedly competing at odds development uh, models where we see they, they do overlap, they do converge, they, they share maybe contradictions. And second of all, this is a co-authored paper with three more authors and to present a co-authored paper is uh, never an easy task and to do that well within time, thank you very much. <laughs> that being said, um, I think it is a, it is a nice transition. Ein, zwei, yay. <laughs> I just wanted you to, you know, make an effort and approach the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, third try. Um, it is also a nice transition from a broader perspective take on um, um, China's model. Some of, uh, you start with some, busting some of the myths and uh, move towards getting more and more concrete and then have a look at what we're talking about. And we're talking about infrastructures in this particular case. And next talk by um, Samuel Rogers will be looking at um, the question of uh, infrastructure failures, when and why infrastructures fail and how to conceive that. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Is this still on? Oh, okay, sorry, one more word. I um, A word on business, um, order of business. So what we're going to do, we're going to go through with the presentations. Each speaker has um, 15 minutes, after which I will not take questions, but uh, leave the floor to Sarah Eaton for uh, discussing all of this, all the, the ordering some of the mess, perhaps slightly grilling us, and only then we will open the floor for discussion and your comments. Right. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, and um, thanks for coming. And I'd like to also thank uh, Beryl, especially for inviting me to talk uh, today. So uh, the, the title of my talk has changed slightly from what you might see on the program. And I've kind of tweaked it, uh, especially for the center uh, in which we find ourselves today. Um, so um, as has been mentioned, this, this research is part of a a larger project um, which we're conducting at the Open University uh, in the UK, um, reorienting development, the dynamics and effects of Chinese infrastructure investment in Europe. Um, within this project, we have four case countries, uh, Hungary, Germany, Greece, and the UK. So they're, they're quite diverse. And um, if you would like to know more about this project, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about that um, later. So, this whole uh, topic came about because while we were uh, talking amongst ourselves, I mean with colleagues in our team um, a year or so ago, it came up within discussions that the, the topic of infrastructure failure is simply just not talked about enough. Uh, when people do talk about infrastructure failure, and this stretches between the academic and the non-academic uh, worlds, they usually talk about uh, collapsed bridges or, or birth pipelines and the immediate impact those things might have on uh, society. Um, people might think it might evoke in people if you see a collapsed bridge, okay, that's a terrible thing, but I also can't get from A to B. However, there's a lot more going on than, than that. And this is uh, the topic which I would like to talk about today. Um, to, to do this, I've created a, a quite a simple working definition of infrastructure failure. Uh, these are projects that, for various reasons, were unable to deliver their original plan. Um, what we want to do, uh, colleagues and I, uh, within this framework, is to move beyond uh, these limited understandings, um, to develop an infrastructure failure research agenda. Uh, this is quite ambitious, but the way we see it is when we have um, these global uh, 
uh, infrastructure umbrella programs, such as, of course, the well-known and well-discussed Belt and uh, Road Initiative, but um, also this Build Back Better World, this Global Gateway, and, of course, we don't know what might happen um, with other forms of outward um, infrastructure pushes from, from different parts of the world either, but it seems to be a certain trend at the moment, so it would not be surprising if there were to be more in years to come. And of course, thirdly, we would like to disseminate our research, and we have a special issue, uh, the deadline of which is the 1st of January in competition change, uh, which I'll mention shortly. Um, so. I think, and so do colleagues, that this uh, kind of success versus failure uh, is a kind of a false dichotomy. There's a lot of uh, space in between uh, this when we come to talk about uh, infrastructure projects, especially large-scale ones. Uh, so, I mean, I put, just put a quite an arbitrary benchmark here of $100 million plus, uh, but of course there are some projects which go into the uh, billions uh, so this is a, a, a critical zone of uh, contemporary capitalist development. And just to give you a brief statistic, which is of course now out of date because of the COVID pandemic, uh, but Asia alone apparently uh, requires $26 trillion uh, in infrastructure investment uh, to 2030. Um, and to put this in, into perspective, the Chinese GDP at 2020 levels was just over 50% of that. So this is a serious uh, movement of capital into this particular uh, sector of infrastructure. But of course, you know, infrastructure is, is quite a diverse uh, sector anyway, and cannot just be bracketed within, you know, the visible tangibility of roads and bridges, etc. We also have this uh, apparently post-COVID uh, recovery phase, and I don't just want to, as I've already alluded to, just pick on you know, the Chinese uh, side of things, but uh, to highlight that this is a, a global uh, phenomenon which has led to some scholars uh, describing this as a, an infrastructure scramble. There are success stories, and these are typically uh, measured by uh, cost efficiency, um, so there's so some interesting work done by Ben Flifberg at uh, Oxford University on this, and um, he, uh, well, him and he and colleagues uh, talk about um, the importance of uh, cost efficiency within an infrastructure project. There's also the side of the management and financing arrangements, and then there is the there might be the presence of absence of trust. Uh, these are just three I've lifted from some literature, but the this is not an exhaustive list. It goes on. Uh, more kind of well-known uh, failure stories um, have talked about, um, for example, discourse and practice. So this is the um, insight of, you know, uh, post-World War development and bureaucratic power, in, um, especially in the, the global south and the, the effects it has to, in terms of failure. So often these are quite disastrous effects. Um, this Seeing as a State book by James C. Scott talked about high modernism and how uh, developers from the what we would now call the global north uh, kind of ascended on global southern countries to impose their understanding of what modernity is and should be, again, with disastrous effects often. And then finally, there's a, a book about a decade ago that highlighted the gaze of experts, especially the privileging of uh, economists, and how they, again, come in, they design uh, these infrastructure projects with a view to making these cost efficient, etc. And to repeat myself, with often disastrous effects. Um, moving forward, as I said, there is a lot of space in between uh, failure, so success and failure. Um, and infrastructure projects, of course, can be affected by uh, many varied types of factor. Uh, these are just some of those. But again, this is not an exhaustive list, and this would go on and on and on, I imagine. Uh, so this comes a problem of how do we uh, kind of move forward with conceptualizing and theorizing uh, this uh, problem. Um, and one way to do this, at, at least this has come up in our discussion so far, is to, um, is to use a kind of sliding scale of uh, failure. And this goes in the kind of geographical language across spatiality and temporality. And, um, you know, I've been fairly convinced by uh, Bob Jessup's work, if it's, if it's not sometimes, it's not always sometimes convoluted, 
Um, but you know, just lifting three aspects from here, there is the accumulation strategy, the state project, and the hegemonic vision, which could be quite um, um, helpful in how we move forward with understanding these. But the idea of you know, this kind of geographical approach is to highlight the polycentricity of uh, failure and uh, how we then go on and understand that. Um, with, the, with respect to China, um, obviously it's well known about, uh, we know much about the Belt and Road Initiative, but we also know, don't know much about it as well. Uh, we know, for example, some costs, uh, where infrastructure projects have been developed, uh, into what sectors they may have gone, etc. Um, the silk roads have now become proliferated into uh, different types of road. Uh, so this is, again, this highlights the, the almost uh, endless uh, forms of infrastructure umbrella programs which he, we have seen uh, proliferated over the last decade or so. Um, there are a lot of tension and fusion points with, regarding, with regard to Chinese outward capital. Um, and I, again, I've just listed some of these here. Um, but um, as I've already mentioned, there are, you know, this. I don't want to just pick on uh, the Chinese side of things because infrastructure failure, as we are trying to conceptualize here, is uh, a global uh, issue. Um, empirically, um, I just wanted to show uh, you, to, to kind of emphasize my point really, uh, three um, infrastructure failures um, in across Eurasia. Uh, so the first one is uh, the V0 railway in Budapest, the V standing for Vashwood, the Hungarian word for railway, uh, which was to be a, a, a kind of ring railway around the city uh, to help speed up uh, interconnected rail links. Um, this kind of uh, failed at the pre-construction level. Uh, so on this kind of point of this uh, scalarity uh, topic, uh, pe people got together, uh, they decided that they, this, would something, this would be something they would like to do. They talked about the costs. Uh, they may have uh, decided uh, some labor relations, etc. But ultimately, uh, th it did not get built. This was about 10 years ago. Uh, however, uh, during recent field work, and, well, field work I did in Hungary a, f a few months ago now, um, this might be uh, reanimated. Uh, which then talks about of how, how do we you know, conceive this failure? Is it really a failure if it's going to get built anyway? The second topic is, um, is this kind of uh, failed uh, during mid-construction. So if you go to uh, Nur Sultan in Kazakhstan, you can see that they were going to build a, a light railway and just the, the stumps have been built and they're sticking out the ground so there's no rail connecting it. Um, and the third, uh, probably most well-known uh, of these three examples, is this uh, Nord Stream 2. And uh, this has been built, but uh, recently it's been decided it will not be used. Uh, so these, uh, you can see that these projects are, being, are failing across uh, different parts of their scale. And uh, this is the kind of thing I would like to uh, get into, at least in a theoretical um, perspective. And, and then finally, the, the last uh, row has uh, these apparent reasons why they failed. Um, I can't see my screen. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, the, there are some interrelated uh, contributions here. Um, uh, to, to kind of reiterate, what we'd like to do is uh, develop some theoretical approaches to how we understand this. Uh, we want to be uh, quite pluralistic uh, in this regard and then encourage uh, people to talk about it from different disciplines, sociology, political economy, um, etc. but also engineering uh, to kind of find out uh, some um, hard data, if you like, uh, on this topic. Um, we would like to certainly analyze the, the Chinese story of infrastructure failure across Eurasia. And um, we would certainly encourage uh, people to, um, to think about this in a, uh, you know, in a way that discusses their scalarity or, to put it another way, across the project's uh, life cycles. Um, um, and then, yeah, in terms of the research trend, we also want to encourage, uh, you know, perhaps not just yet, but perhaps further down the line, um, contribu contributions to um, talk about how this uh, develops in other world regions. 
Again, the importance of this is, is manifold. Uh, when, it, when, in, when a large-scale infrastructure project is designed or decided, or an ownership and capital starts to move, um, it, it becomes quite critical to really understand how and why, uh, the, the how and the why in infrastructure failure. Um, not only does it talk to Chinese capital variety, whether that's state, private, or a hybrid of either, of both. Um, there's, there's, of course, the environmental aspects, sectoral politics, how this is framed in a Sino-US global rivalry um, or other rivalries. And there are, of course, institutional blocks at play. Um, the labor relations are, are very important. There's the, t there's the tangible, such as the road and the bridges, and the intangible, such as um, uh, undersea cables or 5G networks. There's the accessible, uh, things, uh, infrastructure projects for the public good, um, so schools and hospitals, but also the inaccessible, for example, um, nuclear power plants. <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning we have a, a special issue. Uh, this is going to be in competition and change, uh, the deadline for which is the 1st of January. Um, so, you know, I would like to in encourage uh, people to uh, contribute this, or at least uh, spread the word. And this is across Eurasia, so this is why it's it's uh, very uh, relevant to talk to people with specialisations in in uh, post-socialist Europe and beyond. Um, and we're aiming this. Uh, well, we specifically invite uh, early career uh, researchers because we think uh, that's an important way of how we can understand uh, this topic uh, moving forward. And finally, um, just to kind of uh, sum up really what I've been talking about, um, this is um, this topic, uh, infrastructure failure, I, I've always put this in brackets because they're not essentially failure in the black and white sense of the word, but this requires extended research. Um, and Eurasia is uh, one of those critical zones, not an exclusively a critical zone, of course, but it's uh, given, uh, for example, the, the BRI, what's been happening in Ukraine this year, this, um, uh, well, the other forms of capital, for example, Indian capital, um, this is a very uh, important zone, uh, we think. Uh, we certainly uh, would like to encourage um, theoretical uh, pluralism in thinking about this topic, um, including uh, methodolog methodological diversity and uh, conceptual uh, novelty. So I look forward to any uh, questions and comments you might have because this is very much an ongoing uh, topic. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Samuel, for helping my talk as we approach towards getting hands-on about infrastructures and how they structure our societies. Now, a bit of um, power abuse because I have the microphone for my own talk. Hi again, my name is Belo Jacken. <laughs> um, and this final talk uh, I would now like to take you to a very concrete case of so-called Chinese infrastructure and slowly over the next 15 minutes remove the label and see what lies beneath and what that means for how we understand the Belt and Road Initiative and infrastructure projects that become associated um, with this label. Okay, um, you might ask why BRI and infrastructures at SOIS. I hope you don't, but in case you do, China has become an undeniable uh, actor in our geographical focus with an undeniable um, influence. Um, for the reasons, thankfully, my uh, speakers before before me highlighted. But what we what we see prevail is um, that this course of uh, or perception of China as a threat, the China threat, especially prevailing in Germany and in, in, in Western uh, policy circles. And uh, taking this as um, our departure point at SOIUS, as part of a broader research network called D-Link Relink, we um, study new spatial configurations and local perspectives on transregional infrastructure projects, such as the BRI 
itself. So the argument, connectivity, infrastructures leads to economic development, leads to development, so development follows infrastructures. It is um, nothing but linear, and we know more that it tends to fail more often than not, and even if they don't fail in the um, construction phase, but they might feel people and their lives, uh, there's still, um, it, it, this, this linearity still continues to uh, dominate how we perceive infrastructure projects. And um, Given the global infrastructural push that started with the BRI but will not end with the BRI, Global Gateway, um, and all the others you've, you've, you've mentioned before me and the G7 initiative now, uh, we have the imperative um, to understand um, what these infrastructure projects do and uh, if whether or not they lead to developmental uh, outcomes um, in our region. So we do that by juxtaposing different actors, um, starting with China, but not stopping there, their agendas, actions, uh, with the results they produce, reactions they elicit, and relations uh, they forge in mid-term and long-term. One of the um, specific infrastructure projects or cases we look within this project is um, the East-West Highway project in Georgia. We spent uh, this year uh, with Valentin, um, uh, six weeks in May and June, and uh, basically going up and down on a highway. <laughs> and um, this highway construction uh, is, according to the Georgian Roads Department, something that have everybody dreamt of, but that is now finally being built. This is the road... Um, uh, network of Georgia. The routes in red indicate ongoing highway constructions. The ones in blue are planned, so there is some construction going on in the country. The bit in the red square is um, our uh, study area, um, the Ricotti Pass Road that is uh, currently under construction. This is the section of the road, um, the, the green one actually, that connects the country's east to east um, uh, west on the Black Sea shore. But the Ricotti Bypass Road doesn't only connect Georgia's east to its west, it also connects Irkestam in Kyrgyzstan on the Chinese border to Brest in France on the Atlantic coast, running a total of 8,200 kilometers. So it is the 51 kilometers of this 8,000 kilometer um, highway that is called Ricotti Bypass Road that is under construction and that is under critical scrutiny by our research team. So, Ricotti Highway, the project of the century. Just like the BRI, uh, the Ricotti Highway is dubbed the project of the century by political discourse. It is a road that everybody despises. Um, this uh, transit route, both for people and goods, runs through a very difficult terrain. It is narrow, uh, it is uh, dangerous. And I think the best way um, for me to give you an idea, a sense of the road and, and place you on the road is to show you a snippet of uh, one of the videos I took when we were on one of these occasions traveling the highway. This should work, yes, okay. So there's no other way than to take this road if you wanna travel across the country from, from east to west for improving country's connectivity, for reclaiming its position on the new Silk Roads as a trade and production hub. The road has been tendered by the Georgian government several years ago. The existing road goes through villages and has over the years become a source of livelihood for many. A road means coffee shops, a road means restaurants, a road means vendors who want to sell their agricultural produce, their clay produce, sweet nazuki bread for everybody, for, for, for um, what people come across um, the country to this road. The highway we found out is connected to multiple narratives. For the Chinese contractors, and I will get to that in a bit, um, with whom, uh, wh with which workers we were able to, on a couple of occasions, informally converse, um, this might have um, association with the Belt and Road Initiative. For EU, 
it is part of the country's deeper integration to the European markets and regulations, and with that, the Trans-European Transport Network. For the Asian Development Bank that considerably funds the construction of this project, it is part of the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Corridor Network. The road is the 51 kilometers, is split into four sections, and some parts of the roads are built uh, anew, some are uh, rehabilitated, and prior to our field work, we were puzzled about the number of Chinese contractors that was involved. So that was, this was a road that was being built by, uh, we thought four, by now we, we think it's five uh, different Chinese contractors. And, and to, to put it differently, um, we didn't know, so they tendered the, the road in four different tenders, and every each time Chinese contractor won um, the contract. So it was very interesting, a Chinese, um, Infrastructure, right? Or is it? Well, what we found out is that it is a truly Eurasian endeavor. And what I mean by that is the more than billion dollar infrastructure is um, funded by the European Investment Bank, by Asian Development Bank, by World Bank, and also some contributions from the Georgian um, government. It is designed and supervised by um, contractors from um, Italy, uh, Turkey, sorry, Turkey, uh, South Korea, Germany, and this might be just tip of the iceberg. And contractors, yes, they are Chinese contractors, subcontractors also, but not just. We have also heard that there are subcontractors from different countries too, and it was extremely difficult to uh, receive information about the project and, and, and its extent and the, the actors that are involved in, in the making of this project. And altogether, the constellation of actors come together and build 88 bridges and 51 tunnels. This entails resettling of roadside villages. So a new road, however sought after it is, might after all not only mean new or alternative connections, but also lost or perished connections. So then, coming to the final slide, what decides if the new road uh, construction um, leads to improved connectivity and development, or if it ends up bypassing lives, I would say, if it ends up failing people's expectations. And where and how does China and the BRI figure in these outcomes? Well, our research in Georgia provides four uh, preliminary cautious uh, insights. First, um, we, we suggest uh, as a more productive way to view the BRI as an open-end, relational, and at times contested process. There is no BRI script or map for reasons uh, that uh, some of us know. Well, you know, even if it would be beneficial for Beijing to present, the BRI is a coherent strategy, but not having a script or a map also shifts the um, goalpost. And related to that, um, this is BRI can be understand, or China's infrastructural engagement can be understand by a process that assembles multifarious actors beyond China. Their discourses, policies, and projects, oftentimes we are believed to or anticipated that will compete with each other, right? But what we see in, in case of Georgia is that they align uh, in, in the most unexpected ways and actually cooperate with one another. While Chinese contractors execute the project, there is no question there. And there are, um, and actually not just the, the case of Ricotti, but over the last 12 years, when you look at all the road and railway tenders in Georgia, most of them have gone to Chinese uh, contractors. There are definitely question marks there. But the entire project is owned and promoted by the Georgian government, by the EU, ADB, but also Chinese contractors for whom all of this still might be a BRI project with a developmental mission. What I want to say is that BRI is dynamic and it is discursively mobilized for different purposes that might at times cohere as a geopolitical and geoeconomic strategy, and at others, not. That takes me to my third point, which is um, a way of avoiding some of these traps or having to bring our, ourselves in a position to decide, or is, is China good or BRI bad, um, is uh, actually um, studying these projects uh, on the ground, situating them in concrete places, and um, and uh, projects. In Georgia, what we find out that despite the ha fancy handshakes of 2016-17, um, there is um, 
only limited to Chinese investments. What we see is Chinese companies, central, state and provincial, winning international tenders. Um, but this does not mean that China is not interested in Georgia or is it only there to make money. China has been in Georgia since the 2000s, way before the official ceremonies around uh, the BRI. And even the fact that the existence of the contractors is, is very visible and palpable, that might, need to, um, might lead to an establishment of network through which uh, Chinese contractors can gain intimate knowledge about inner workings of Georgian um, business and politics. So what do I want to say with that? Well, the, 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 these contracts may well be a low-level in involvement as an investment in future when the time is ripe. And, speaking about that, transit through Georgia is already increasing since the war in Ukraine. So whether a project is a BRI project or not, um, might miss the bigger picture. And it is also by taking a um, grounded approach that we were able to ha have um, uh, in-depth insights about the status of Im implementation status of the project and some of its current consequences. And there I want to spotlight uh, transparency and participation. Um, there is very little information about the project. The people whom we uh, we talked to, who live and labor at the road, uh, found out about the project um, when actually it started. It was started to be constructed. Um, they have not been provided meaningful space or or room for. Um, taking part in decisions that will affect their future, their resettlement, their alternative livelihood uh, um, plans. This, uh, is, uh, this speaks for a lack of enforcement. Legal framework is definitely not there. It is strong. Oh, sorry, I'm giving up my point. So it's it's, it's a strong, stronger over the last years due to the European integration processes. But um, uh, the enforcement is, is lagging behind. And at the end of the day, it is the, however many Chinese contractors are working on the road, constructing the road, it is the Georgian government that is the borrower and implementer of this project and many other road projects, because there are many, um, yeah, that bears the responsibility. So now this brings me to the final and fourth point. What I want to say that is that, um, what uh, and how China is engaging in our region through infrastructures is not decoupled from, from, from understanding or of these infrastructures. So there is a social materiality that is social and material uh, that comes together and do things on the ground. And, and infrastructure uh, are hands both processes and products of democratic and or undemocratic governance. No one is against a good road, a better, a safer road. Despite grievances, we heard from our interlocutors more than once, well, at least the Chinese are building it. They were alluding to many other roads that have been planned, tendered, but ditched and not materialized. What this all adds up to is that infrastructures in a truly global economic, uh, political economy are never not Chinese or Chinese. They bring together various actors from the East and the West. And the outcomes they produce are however best understood as part of the broader uh, globalization processes on the one hand. On the other hand, democratization processes that are situated in different political economies and geographies. In case of Georgia, we observe a road that for no reason reinforces power inequalities and represents creeping authoritarianism in material form. Thank you for listening to, and this uh, it takes a team to do this kind of research, and this is the team behind. We are, of course, on our beloved highway, and also with our research assistant, Tatia Vatatgasa, that um, supported the research immensely. Thank you very much. And with that, Sarah, license to kill. Okay, <laughs> license to kill. Um, does this microphone work? Yeah, okay, great. And I think I can give you this one. I hear this work. I will speak with it. Yeah. Please allow me a second to grab my reading glasses, otherwise, <laughs> trouble with my notes. Great. 
Now I can see, excellent. Um, first of all, thanks uh, so much for inviting me to this panel and organizing it, Beryl. Um, this is really, really exciting work and it's really an, an honor to be here to hear about these exciting um, projects uh, unfolding. Um, apologies in advance for what will be a slightly unbalanced uh, response to the presentations. Um, and that's a result of the fact that uh, I had a paper from, from, from Valentin uh, to, to pour over and to, to think about responses to. Um, and uh, with uh, Samuel and Beryl, I had uh, something shorter as well, these really, really rich uh, presentations. Nonetheless, uh, I'm someone who is uh, limited in my spontaneous abilities. Um, so I will have more to say about um, Valentin's paper. Um, so, um, you know, Valentin, I'm, I'm very inspired um, and very happy to see uh, this kinds of uh, project developing. Um, as I understand it, you're sort of uh, one of your normative purposes, as it were, is to sort of dissect um, some of the more critical, call it China threat, takes of, of the BRI and to sort of stand it up next to uh, another major development actor, the EU, to put them side by side and say, you know, what are the uh, true commonalities and differences here? I think that's really really worthwhile. Um, I'm also, you know, predisposed to like this paper because I have a son named Valentin, so um, uh, this is a very, very exciting work. Um, so I, as I understand it, the sort of main takeaway here, uh, the re core research question, what are the similarities and differences of uh, China's BRI and the EU's script of, of development co cooperation? And the main takeaway, lifting this straight out of the conclusion, um, is that the BRI is unlikely to collide with the liberal script promoted and protected by, by Western countries. Um, so a little background about, about me. I'm uh, a Chinese-focused uh, political economist um, and have, while well, my work uh, doesn't deal with BRI in, in, in uh, any deep extent, um, I have worked a bit on, on, on China model-related topics before. So uh, uh, this is a, a, a forewarning that I'm going to be a little bit nitpicky on, on the China model of things. I mean, in general, I'm really, really um, in, in inspired and excited about this work, um, but I have a, a couple sort of nitpicky points here. There's a, there's a broader thing here, which is that I think with, when we talk about, Beryl was sort of pointing in this direction just a second ago, that when we talk about um, both the quote-unquote China model um, and the BRI, we are dealing with extraordinarily slip, slippery concepts. And also, you know, beyond the ordinary, you know, uh, slippery concepts that we deal with in academia, social science, um, but they're also heavily politicized in a, um, you know, a strikingly um, divided uh, geopolitical context. And so I think it's... Um, one thing that I sort of would um, uh, uh, be happy to see you um, take up a little bit more explicitly in the paper is to think about um, the geopolitical context of these particular terms and sort of um, uh, wrestle with that a little bit more directly. And this, I'll come to this in the context of, of the China model first. Um, I mean, um, anyone who, who takes up uh, this, this topic is, is brave uh, because, as you know, um, uh, Valentin, you know, there's, there's a huge literature on uh, the China model and its kind of weird sister con concept, the, the Beijing Consensus. Um, you know, again, coming back to the sort of um, geopolitical context that really matters here, when we think about Joshua Cooper Ramos coming along and coining the term Beijing consensus, right? This was a person who speaks to policymakers in, in the US primarily, and he's not a China scholar. Very interesting uh, observations and clearly uh, stimulated this, this huge debate. Uh, but there was a particular purpose in the, in the points that he was making that had a deep, deep resonance in, in the beltway, let's say, right? Um, and so I think that's a, a sort of important part of the story here. Um, you know, um, people like Scott Kennedy, and you, you cite this paper, came along with the myth of the Beijing consensus afterwards and pointed out that the things that, that sort of tinge of Chinese exceptionalism that was coming out in Ramos's take on the Beijing consensus really doesn't stand up uh, when you look sort of point by point at a comparison of the so-called Beijing consensus against the Washington consensus. Beijing has learned a lot from the Washington consensus, right? Um, so I think that's a useful um, critical engagement with the concept. I love, um, and I don't think that I did see this on your uh, bibliography, Matt Fershen's um, 2013 piece um, looking at uh, is there a China model uh, or uh, in, in the first place, and he is really um, 
great at not only shining a light on something that gets a little bit lost in this discussion is that Chinese scholars themselves, Chinese policymakers themselves, have been in a deep and contentious debate for a long time about these, these very questions. And he sort of illuminates that, brings them to the attention of, the, of, the, of, a, of an English-speaking audience. But he also says, look, you know, um, this is, there's a big um, geopolitical context. The China model increasingly in, in the Beltway, already in 2013, was used as a kind of stick um, to get angry about those Chinese. So that's, you know, get sort of um, reckoning with that, I think, is, is important. Uh, and here I'm getting even more nitpicky, and I'll apologize in advance, but um, on, on the six planks, so we have political control and stability, economic growth, gradualism and experimentation, strong party state intervention in the market, rule by law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think... Um, what, what I struggle with, you know, as um, someone who's, who's looking at these issues, is that when we talk about, when we try to describe this as, as, a, as, a, as a model, there's so much in motion here, right? Um, there's so much that's uh, changed, and there's so much nuance in, in all of this. Um, so, for example, on the strong party state intervention in the market, well, yes, when you look at, for example, the way that SASEC manages the central SOEs, but no, if you look at um, the activities of um, textile exporters, uh, electronics exporters in um, the Pearl River Delta region, right? So I'm sure you're aware of, of Margaret Pearson, Pearson's work on the, the tiered notion of the Chinese political economy, and I think that's really useful. Um, and it sort of, but it, it also raises the question about, you know, in um, China of today, what really is the role of the state vis-a-vis um, -vis the market? And I think. Um, it's a little bit more um, complicated, a little bit more nuanced than, than the story you're telling. Um, you know, so too, um, in, you're sort of juxtaposing the BRI script with the China model script but later on in the paper, paper and arguing that in the BRI, um, the so-called decisive role of the market and resource allocation stands in stark contrast to the China model, right? There's this sort of disjuncture here. But, you know, even in... Um, uh, 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 the sort of primary authors of what, whatever the China model is, have said um, as recently as in the beginning of uh, Xi Jinping's reign, using this exact term, I'm thinking, reciting here the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress, because you're a China nerd too, uh, that here uh, there was talk about enshrining the decisive role of markets, right? Um, so there's just a whole lot of, uh, this, this is so complex, right? And there's also a lot of moving parts. Now, I think Xi Jinping of 2013 is a very different Xi Jinping than, uh, than 2022. That comes to another point, pragmatism. When we look at something like um, the Common Prosperity Initiative, right, which was very, very um, prominent and present about, about a year ago, um, and you know, may have died off, maybe there was pushback from within the state, there's certainly a story to tell there, but you know, if we take at face value what uh, Xi Jinping was sort of pushing there, which is like you know, quite radical interventions in the market to, um, to, um, to deal with inequality, um, then this is this is a bit of a departure <laughs> from the, the the Deng Xiaoping, I would say, also all the way up to the Hu Jintao era of, of pragmatism. So I think I'm not sure that that's. Um, I think that there's there's more um, in, in more change and and, and flux uh, there as well. Um, and then so that's I'm done with my pickiness. Um, one one sort of prior question though that that strikes me as uh, worth thinking about. I know, and I know that this claim is out there, that, um, that, the, that the BRI is being as a, used as a sort of tro Trojan horse for the big bad China model, right? Um, and so you are pushing back against us very effectively in the paper, and I think that's great. Um, but one sort of prior question is, you know, um, why even would we expect that, right? Um, why would we um, expect that the BRI, um, if it, you know, could decide on, on what a China model is, why would it want to sort of propagate that through, through the BRI? Uh, yes, you know, uh, you make the point very well in your discussion of um, conditionality with Chinese, Chinese characteristics that uh, Beijing wants to use the BRI to serve its um, articulation of geoeconomic and geopolitical interests around energy and resources and that, right? But that's, that's slightly different than sort of propagating um, uh, an ideology for thinking about state market relations or, you know, how to organize social, political, and economic life, however you want to slice it. So, you know, what would be, why would Beijing even want to create the world in its image? Wouldn't it be harder, actually, to deal with foreign actors that are organized in the same way as the Chinese state? Um, so just as a, you know, and this is not a criticism of you per se, it's more of a, a criticism of that um, 
that assumption out there. And I think you might um, play with that a little bit. Likewise, I think the, the BRI is a very slippery concept. And I agree very much with what um, Beryl was talking about just here. Um, but I think that's also maybe sort of worth um, taking up more clearly in the paper. I think that's true both programmatically and then also in terms of an implementation. Um, you have probably seen um, Zhang Jinghan's good paper, 2019 I think it is, um, in which he talks about how the BRI has been repurposed within the Chinese state by local governments who are pursuing interests, initiatives, and projects that are completely at odds with what Beijing is talking about, right? And even within Beijing, right, you have the, uh, the Fagai way, the NDRC saying things, you have the foreign ministry saying things, right? You have the Ministry of Commerce saying things. So it's become this kind of catch-all, call how, right, um, to uh, talk about the things that uh, departments want to do when they frame it as, as BRI. Um, and so there's, a, there's, I think that you need to sort of um, deal with that maybe a little bit more more direction uh, directly. And then, you know, uh, Beryl has just made this uh, point re really well on the implementation side, that when we, th there's a huge amount of variation in how BRI projects are defined and are rolling out in different places. So I think it's, I'm really, really um, well disposed to projects um, like uh, Beryl's and, and the team here at Zoys, uh, looking in detail at this 51 kilometers of, of, of road. And I know you were involved with that as well. Um, you know, uh, Deborah Brautigam and uh, Maria Karai, um, she's at NYU Shanghai, are people who are systematically trying to map the rollout of, of the BRI. And I think that that sort of um, meticulous attention to detail um, will be really, really helpful in getting a clearer picture of what is an extraordinary complex phenomenon. So, um, you know, this just to say, I think that... Um, you know, I applaud you on the one hand for taking on these slippery concepts and using them in, in what I think is a really productive way. Um, at the same time, I think um, you could deal more directly with the, what's, what, you're, what you're confronting when you, when you talk about these things. Um, and then, so um, one question that I had at the end. So what's kind of the overall purpose of the paper? Yes, I understand the, and you made this point very clearly in your presentation, about the um, policy um, debates that you want to make an intervention into. What about um, in IR, in political science, what are the, uh, what's the sort of uh, conventional wisdom that you maybe want to challenge or, or, or turn here? Um, I think that could be kind of pulled out a little bit more clearly. But again, really excited about this, and I look forward to um, seeing it in print. OK, um, and now some, I promise, much more <laughs> concise comments about, about Samuel's paper, which I also, also think is really, really um, exciting and really, really creative. To me, it's sort of like you know, seeing, seeing this question of infrastructure from the flip side, right? We always think in terms of success, but I think there's a lot that, that um, a new kind of horizon that's opened up with, with thinking about, about failure. Um, so I'm here kind of going from, from the abstract and from the, um, from the presentation. Um, but uh, I have a couple of, 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 of uh, questions. Um, in the abstract, you talk about infrastructure failure. You know, it's obviously the definition is unfolding. This is, um, you know, this is a project that you guys will be working on for a while, and that's great. Um, you have in the definition, the working definition, as projects that for various reasons did not deliver on their original plan. And that got me thinking about what that sort of encompasses. Um, I think in the presentation you were sort of suggesting a different thing, um, but let me go with the abstract version. So if it's projects that don't deliver on their uh, original plan, and in the abstract you talk about the cancelled coal plant ventures that China um, was rolling out in various parts of the world, well, looking at that, right, um, is that a case of infrastructure failure? Or is it instead more like a partial victory of China's or the globe's strengthening climate policy, right? How do we, the, the sort of framing of that is, 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 is really important and, um, um, and strikes me as, as um, something to think through. Um, I, sh I'm, I'm, I know you will. Um, wh and what about then, so if it's projects that don't deliver on their original plan, what about original plans that kind of get skewed um, over the course of design implementation? Maybe not because of some um, inherent deficiencies of the planners or the builders themselves, but maybe there's some kind of um, adaptation to better suit local needs, for example, right? Um, 
you know, Beryl's story suggests that this kind of engagement with local needs is not happening, at least in the, in the Georgian case. But um, Maria Karai, who I just mentioned, um, has some really interesting work looking at railway projects in Africa. And her um, kind of surprising finding is that these Chinese SOEs leading these projects are learning. They're making mistakes, big, uh, bad, costly mistakes, uh, you know, politically, um, uh, politically volatile mistakes, and then they're learning from them from the, from the down the line. So does that deviation from original, original purposes, um, but a conclusion that, that produces something else, which is maybe even better? How do we sort of deal with that in this schema? Um, right. And then, you know, what do we, <laughs> those of us in, 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 in Berlin, um, might think about, you know, when, when I, someone says to me, infrastructure failure, the, the thing that jumps around to me is the, is the Berlin Brandenburg Airport, right? We have it, uh, but man, it was expensive, and man, it took, took, took a long time. So how do we deal with sort of cost um, overruns, um, um, uh, big, um, uh, or do those count as, as, as failures? Um, and it strikes me that coming back to what I think may have been a sort of new framing of things in your, in your presentation. I think in the, in the presentation you were sort of suggesting that infrastructure failures are one, uh, projects that never came into existence, or two, ones that kind of died an early death, right? Um, your example of Nord Stream 2 sort of um, uh, goes in that direction. So that's the, that, that you know, uh, if that's the, the um, direction that things are going, that sort of changes things. But I think it is really, really important to, 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 to focus here. And then another thing is about, um, and I keep coming back to, to Beryl's comments, but um, to think about, you know, um, failure might be something um, in the eye of the, of the beholder, right? Um, so if you are one of these um, kind of winners in this particular region of, of Georgia where the road is being built and you're going to set up a stand and uh, make yourself a nice, a nice life, right? Maybe you view it as a success, but if you're one of the people who are displaced, um, upset by this uh, infrastructure project, then, then maybe you view it as a failure. So sort of, I don't know if we can make objective judgments, calls on, on, on success or, or failure, but maybe that's not your purpose. Um, one useful literature that you might tie into that um, I tried to find this morning, but I couldn't, um, but I will, a student is working with this con concept, so I would, um, if you're interested, try to dig it out for him in case you don't know about it. It's actually people in um, business who are thinking about um, the essential disrupt, the inherent disruptiveness of infrastructure projects as a big determinant of kind of blowback that particular projects um, generate. So that, you know, um, a, a dam or a road, right, um, which creates a, a small cast of winners, but also many, many losers, is sort of, you know, doomed to contestation and, and, and pushback and debate and discussion. Whereas more um, modest kind of infrastructure aims are, infrastructure projects are, you know, don't necessarily um, encounter that kind of um, pushback. So there might be something about the nature of the projects themselves, right, that, that would be worth taking account in. Okay, good. But I think um, I look forward very much to the, to the special issue, and I think that's really, really great. Um, Having talked so much about uh, Beryl's uh, project already, I actually don't have much in the way of uh, sort of critical comments here because I just think I just love uh, this kind of. Um, I think that that's that's exactly what's what's needed to um, understand um, the BRI in, in more depth. Um, you know, focusing on these 51 kilometers of road is, is is really really wonderful, and I really look forward to seeing the publications that that come out come out of this. Uh, you know, really interesting off the top to see that. Um, there are different sort of um, development actors, governments um, in there trying to claim it for themselves. Um, and that's your kind of interim conclusion that this is not anyone's project. It's a sort of combined Eurasian endeavor. I think that's really, really um, interesting. Um, I guess one question I'm, I had, um, and I have a better sense of this having heard the presentation, but it would be good to maybe push you a little bit on this. Uh, in the in the abstract, you talk about moving beyond uh, realist uh, geopolitical discourses on global infrastructure initiatives. Our situated approach allows for a relational understanding of connectivity infrastructures. Okay, what's the so what there? I mean, let's just push a little further. What do you? What's again? Sort of the question that I put uh, put to, to to Valentin, right? What's the what's the? How does this help us um, overturn some conventional wisdom? And I think you know, in in both of your projects, there's that capacity is there, but um, you know, being a little bolder and <laughs> getting out there and uh, and and, and uh, maybe formulating it a little bit more directly is um, would be great. Uh, but again.
I'm, I'm super excited about these projects and I'm really honored to have the chance to, to comment on them and I'm sure there's a million questions from the audience, so I will sit down. Wow, that was that was really inspiring to listen to. Not every not every disc discussion and discussion uh, can receive the same, I think, sentiment. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to read the paper and to comment on um, on my part. Lousy presenters without papers. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it a lot. Um, you think we are behind time, but we are not because you all came 15 minutes later. So we will claim that time. And I would like to hear a bit of, about your questions. Uh, there might be simple purposes of clarification or comments and teasing. I see the first hand, Leila. Hi, I'm Leila. I'm a researcher from Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography. And first of all, warm thanks for this marvelous panel and the commentary on it. It was already very, very inspiring. I had a couple of small questions and also comments, if I may. Um, I had two for Valentin. Uh, first, I was wondering how, what kind of empirical base do you have when you look into impl implementation, both in terms of you know, the regions or countries or cities, uh, and also in terms of uh, what kind of projects would you look at? Because on the one hand, BRI is a very infrastructural project and EU policy is really much more comprehensive. So were you comparing in the sense like EU-led infrastructural projects with BRI? Um, and the second question, what I wanted to ask about your um, paper is how do you conceptualize their um, multilateral development banks whose role is really driving in, in making the large infrastructural projects and um, you were talking about these overlaps and then you ha do have EBRD, EIB, but on the other hand, ADB and recently this China's um, Infrastructure Investment Bank, right? Um, and how do you see then overlaps and collaborations there, which is also uh, very much Beryl's question, right? In the making of Georgia's highways, you also see this uh, east-west uh, based um, uh, MDBs uh, really collaborating. And then the comment that I had was, especially when you look at EU and when we say that EU has no willingness or capacity um, to to push for, you know, the, the norm-driven aspect of its con con conditionalities, especially like kind of political aspect of it. Um, if, if I look or if I recall the examples that I know from Georgian large-scale infrastructure projects, I don't think it's just lack of willingness, but the very projects that are designed by European actors or at least European uh, development banks are contradictory in themselves. Like there is this large dams being constructed in Georgian mountains where, where with the, large, like, the largest stakeholders are certainly... EIB and um, EBRD and also Asian banks are collaborating at points. And what do you see there? Because, I mean, the, the contracts were classified for long. Once they were declassified, you can see that these banks have taken part in de-risking these projects to the point that all sorts of, I mean, these would be private projects w implemented by private companies and entire burden of fiscal risk would be taken by the state. And then also the same institutions would encourage the state to discuss this with the population. If you actually show the population this contract, you can never have participation on this, right? So the very principle of you know, democratic participation can really not be enacted mm. if the banks will be pushing through the projects that are not defendable democratically in front of the populations because it won't benefit not only local populations but also like country populations. These are deeply controversial projects that are shaped by European institutions. So it's really, how do I say, it's not just unwillingness but the very design of the developmental offer with which Europe comes um, to, to uh, peripheral countries like Georgia that, you know, Play, make it play out that democracy will not materialize for such projects. Um, 
sorry, if I'm talking too much, I will stop here. I would have uh, far more to say, but uh, you, you would get the kind of thing. And just to make a minor comment, I don't think that it's played differently by China. Mm. Uh, and Beryl's comment, uh, or Beryl's, I think, research also shows this. I mean, the whole idea of Chinese construction companies being involved in building this um, is in itself a disaster. And not because Chinese are bad or anyone else would be bad, but because local companies and local labor force finds no benefit from these large debt-driven projects. And this is, I mean, this is a very controversial thing. Again, very hardly defendable. I think um, after 8 p.m. we have drinks and food. And I think we will have a lot of fun, Leila, talking sorry, about these sorry. things. No, I, I, I immensely appreciate your, your, your comment. Um, uh, just very quick uh, re-comment. <laughs> this research is joint research with uh, Valentin. He's dancing on a couple of weddings. And, um, and and beyond that, uh, I think lack of willingness, you know, can be uh, just a nice way of saying vested interest and, and the European uh, business lobby. But I will just parent is that one out. And I would like to take uh, two more questions, perhaps, or comments before coming back to the panel. Otherwise, I see a hand. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, the presentations. My name is Claudia. I'm here from Zeus. Uh, working in a research project, but um, my question is very brief and goes to Samuel, mostly because you were saying in the very beginning that you actually want to go beyond this success and failure dichotomy and uh, like introduce a new narrative here and also a new concept actually, like a concept that can be applied to different contexts. And um, I just have the sense that this is this is very much still result oriented. So you are looking for a way to conceptualize, if I understood you correctly, infrastructural failure. So there is still the term of failure, which you actually wanted to go beyond. So I was wondering how taking up again Beryl's notion of infrastructure as a process, uh, this is where I can see that things really go beyond this like success failure story. But I wonder where it plays out in your research. Thank you, Claudia. Is there, um, I'm willing to take one more, qu yes, I see a hand. Uh, Alexander Usipian, Osteuropa Institute. So uh, uh, my question is also to Samuel, uh, but others are uh, free to answer as well. So uh, I remember seven years ago, uh, I met uh, some scholars from Ethiopia and Sudan, and they told me about the great construction infrastructure, railways, airports in their countries conducted by China. And uh, recently, we know the story about uh, airport built in uh, Sri Lanka in Indian Ocean by China, and this airport never operated. And then recently there was financial collapse in Sri Lanka, followed by political collapse, and who knows what will happen. So uh, actually we see in one case this uh, success story when the locals in Africa, East Africa, they are quite happy with Chinese investment and infrastructure when in Sri Lanka it led to uh, financial and political collapse. So uh, I'm not expert in this field, I just make in comparison uh, that, for instance, uh, China is getting uh, more of uh, its oil from uh, Persian Gulf by uh, Indian Ocean through Strait of uh, Malacca and then through South Chinese Sea. Uh, at the same time, we know that China is building a uh, road through Pakistan again to the Persian Gulf. So could it be, for instance, that uh, in case of military conflict, when Malacca Strait will be blocked by American Navy, for instance, uh, in that case, uh, China will get oil from Persian Gulf through this new infrastructure in Pakistan. So why I'm uh, making this comparison, trying to explain this strange case with airport in 
uh, Sri Lanka. So it looks like infrastructure failure from economic point of view. Could it be that this airport in Sri Lanka was built for military purposes to be used by China in case of military conflict somewhere in future? So what looks like uh, infrastructure failure from economic point of view could be uh, military success in future. Thank you. Do you agree with this point? <laughs> yes, uh, as scientists, we're in the business of saying yes and no. Well, I will, uh, I'm coming back to the panel and would like to give Samuel and Valentina a chance for response and perhaps concluding remarks. Sarah, you're also free to <laughs> jump in. Yeah, so um, for the question concerning the empirical base of the BRI and the EU, EU development model so and its implementation, so for, for the BRI, I think our, our focus, because in, in, in Europe there, haven't been, there hasn't been as much BRI activity as in, as in other um, areas of the world, um, but our, so our empirical base for describing the BRI model, I'd say, is more based on Chinese activities on a global scale, but also large, also, also to a st stronger degree on, on Serbia, which is a country with, where there has been um, a large number of Chinese um, projects under the BRI banner um, in the infrastructure sector as well, um, projects funded by Chinese policy banks and built by Chinese um, SOEs. And, and for the EU, um, our, our, our paper doesn't really go into, in, into, into concrete examples um, other than um, the Western Balkans. Um, and, and in that sense, it builds on, on research by, by, um, by Yulia um, for the, for the um, empirical base, which is, is built on, on, on the processes of, from the Eastern enlargement and also um, um, the Western Balkans and their, and their candidacy. Um, then concerning the how multilateral development banks fit in, I think th this is it's perhaps a little bit ambiguous, um, and it's different from from bank to bank. So with, with the EIB, for example, which was also one of the funders of the of the Ricotti Highway, it, it it's a it is an arm of the European Union, so it does implicitly carry that EU script with it. When we look at other banks like the AIB, um, which is, is also active in Georgia, they're a little bit different. They depart. They think, yeah, they, they subscribe to, to the majority, I'd say, of principles of most um, large legacy MDBs. But they also have they also have some uh, more nuanced changes, like um, w which reflect um, ch ch Chinese Chinese policy norms, such as. Um, saying that they're open to um, in, in, that they're making investment decisions on economic grounds alone, and then and that political um, processes and political structures in recipient countries don't have any effect on loans. So, so there is some level of, of Chinese script or BRI or however you want to phrase it reflected in in that particular MDB. Oh, well, thank you very much for the questions. Um, well, first thing to say is um, it's not a narrative, but a research agenda, uh, which is what I'm, tr I'm trying to push at the moment. And um, yeah, I understand that the word failure is, uh, is quite a loaded term. Uh, however, I left it in there purposefully uh, to create kind of questions like this. So I'm glad it has, that has kind of worked out. But rather, it's, what we want to do is just keep that as a kind of marker we don't necessarily mean it's the kind of dictionary definition of failure, but rather interrogate that term uh, as we as we see it, because we, we do think it's uh, inadequate as, as a as a heuristic device and as an adjective. So um, it's it's definitely important that we uh, try and uh, well we want to kind of push this research agenda, as I said, across these across these uh, scholarly boundaries to really interrogate this term. Um, 
Yeah, again, with the, with the second question, um, I'm a, I don't know much about that particular airport, I'm afraid. Um, but as I said in, in the talk, um, you know, we want to uh, look at these infrastructure projects across their life cycle. Uh, so whether or, or not that particular airport was designed for military purposes or, or commercial purposes is something that uh, we encourage uh, people to, to think about. Um, you know, just to be, uh, well, a bit extreme, but, you know, at, at the risk of sounding a little bit absurd, the, you know, the ancient pharaohs of, Egy of Egypt did not envisage the pyramids of Giza to be a tourist attraction in the 21st century, but nonetheless, that's what they've become. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, there's, there's, an, there's an example, uh, a contemporary example, at least in, in Greece, which is part of our research. Um, there's, an, there's an old military airport near Athens uh, called Hellenikon. And um, this closed about 20 years ago. And um, the idea was that the Greek government invited bids to uh, re redevelop the site. Uh, to make it what they call a city within a city. You know, one of these classical grandiose um, office-filled areas. Um, it was going to be financed by Chinese and uh, Emirati capital, uh, but then the Greek government decided to overturn that and recalibrate the capital into national hands. So it's now a domestic Greek effort, and this will be at a cost of 8 billion euro. Uh, so for the Greek GDP, uh, the number of which escapes me, there's quite a significant percentage, whereas in Germany it would not be. So, you know, coming back to the description of, um, you know, what uh, uh, Sarah mentioned during the, uh, the comments, you know, and interrogating, you know, what uh, infrastructure failure means, that's, that's also what we want to, we want to do. Um, I kind of kept this definition as simple as I, as I could in order to kind of uh, broaden the land, so to speak, for wider uh, theoretical methodological uh, engagement. Uh, with that, and, and of course, pluralism, as I mentioned. Um, but again, you know, the, the, the theoretical approach I just alluded to, at least in my talk, was this uh, Jesopian, uh, if I can call it that way, um, um, you know, geographical approach towards scalarity, uh, temporal and spatial uh, simultaneously, which would then perhaps uh, allow for researchers to go ahead and, uh, you know, better understand that particular airport you mentioned. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you uh, so much for the speakers, for Sarah, your thorough, um, critical, constructive comments, uh, the audience, and um, one um, woman's panel uh, success might become next panel's failure. We are running behind time, and I would like to still keep my colleagues as my colleagues, so uh, you have 10 minutes to get coffee and other refreshments, and see you here. Thank you so much.
Cześć. Halo, halo. Halo. Tak. Ok. Słyszymy Cię. Ok. Halo, Karolina. Hi, how are Hier ist you? Anna aus der Technik. Um, gib uns noch einen kurzen Moment Zeit und dann checken wir deine Präsentation, ja? Okay. Danke sehr. Du kannst uns gut hören, ne? Wunderbar, wir dich auch. So at this moment it's just coming from the, from the I'm good, how are you? <laughs> Fine, thank you. Może chcesz, Karolina, spróbować dzielenie prezentacji? Mm -hmm, super. To możesz spróbować zrobić share screen. Aha, widzimy. Ok. Tak, Dobra. jest ok. Dobra, super. Tak, jest ok. Trochę ciebie słyszymy e, cicho, wiesz? Uh, ok, uh, okay. A teraz? Teraz lepiej, tak. Ah, okay. Yes. So we need to mute that. Przepraszam. Nie i tak nie widać. OK. And where is the camera? Ah, in the back. OK. Yes, we see her, but does she see us? Uh, yes, I can, I can see you and ah, I can okay, hear cool. you. <laughs> OK, good. Ah, muscle tough. And there are so many lights here. It's like I'll be back in a second. I wanted to point out one. Thing. I want. Mm? No. Now we press something that is right. Okay. Durably. Carolina? Yes, hello. Um, I thought we could start with you. So I'm, okay. I'm Irina, 
Sorry. Hi, Elena. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I, I would suggest we start with you. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay. That's perfect. And how much time do I have? Is it like 15 minutes? Yeah, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, great. Ah, yes. Maybe we could try sharing your screen with your presentation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so it looks fine for us if it's all right for you. Yes, it is. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Maybe would you want to change the slide just to check that this is working as well? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looks good. Perfect. On our side. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. great. Wonderful. Awesome. Okay, great. Vielleicht, nee, oh, ist okay. Nee, ich glaube nicht. Also die anderen beiden haben noch keine Gläser, aber das ist wahrscheinlich nicht meine Aufgabe. Hmm. 
Karolina, możesz na chwilę przestać szerować swój screen? Ekran, tak, tak, mogę. Mhm. Ok, dzięki. Da haben wir ein Karolina, słyszysz dźwięk z wideo? Nie, w tej chwili nie słyszę. A, a teraz? Nie. A teraz? Mm -mm. Nie. Teraz słyszę tylko, że z echem. Completely fine. It's not that crucial. The sound of this video is. Big thanks to everyone for coming. And we are just checking how much echo we have. A lot. One, two, three. One, two, three. We destroyed the entire sound system. Now it's good. There is no echo. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you again for coming and big thanks for Irina, to Irina for taking over the chairing of the session. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Piotr. <laughs> so now we have two moderators. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah.
Um, so welcome to this panel, East European Migration and Migrants Activism. So you're probably starting to get a little bit sleepy after lunch and all these panels. So um, the first riddle for the audience is what's wrong with this panel? Uh, so maybe some of you realize that two people are missing and one person is on the panel who is not supposed to be there. That's me. Um, so, Tsipilma um, Darieva was supposed to be here. She organized this panel. She was supposed to be the chair of this panel, but she got ill. And um, Sabrina Zayak was supposed to be the discussant, and she also got ill both this morning. Um, so there seems to be some kind of pandemic ongoing. And um, so um, I'll do my best to replace them. <laughs> Um, so, I'm Irina Mützeburg, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at SOIS, and uh, so I've worked on migration and migration policies in uh, Eastern Europe uh, for the last 10 years, and uh, now I work on displaced Ukrainians and their uh, education situation when they arrive in Germany. Um, so, this panel is about the question of how different actors in Central and Eastern Europe deal with migration. So I guess I don't have to stress how much migration as an issue has polarized in the region over the last decades. And with the recent full-scale Russian invasion in Ukraine, this issue has become even more uh, prevalent in the region in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, but also the increasing authoritarianism of the Russian Federation has caused migratory movements. So we will look at uh, practices in the host countries, practices that can be supportive or hostile towards migrants, um, but we will also look at migrants themselves and also other actors, state and non-state ones. So we will discuss activism among migrants and activism um, by other actors related to migration. And we'll try to understand how this activism may affect uh, policies regarding uh, migration and also how the recent migratory waves or movements differ from previous ones and how the treatment of these groups differs uh, from previous groups. Uh, so, we will start with our guest who is with us via Zoom, Karolina Vukasiewicz. Um, so, uh, she is a research assistant professor and Marie Curie fellow at the Center for Migration Research at the University of Warsaw. And her research focuses on immigration integration and poverty policies in urban contexts. So she has studied these policies for over 15 years in European and American cities using both qualitative and quantitative research methods. And in addition to her academic work, she has been involved as an evaluation consultant for NGOs and centers who supported immigrant communities. So uh, Carolina, thanks a lot for joining us online. Uh, she's going to um, give a talk on the topic of forced migration governance in Central and Eastern European cities in a crisis context. Thank you, Carolina. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Welcome, uh, like, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, in organizing this uh, very much needed uh, panel discussion and inviting me. Let me uh, show you my um, my slides. Um, okay, so uh, uh, today uh, I would like to uh, present pre preliminary research results from my Horizon 2020 funded project on migrant integration governance in Central and European cities following the 2015 uh, crisis. Um, and uh, I will analyze the role played by different public and private local actors involved in uh, integration governance. Um, and I will use uh, results from my research, including 
uh, desk research, official documents, and also uh, qualitative interviews with different uh, stakeholders that I'm currently conducting in four Polish and um, and two Hungarian uh, Hungarian cities. Uh, so first of all, I will start with a little bit of context. Uh, so the governance of migrants integration in cities occupies a vital role in public discourse, uh, political and academic debates, and it also mobilizes various sometimes adverse uh, responses from states and non-state uh, actors, and specifically since the 2015 crisis. Um, um, migration became uh, became on on the agenda, uh, especially in uh, in the central and eastern European countries. Um, and the well established scholarship of local immigrant integration provides multiple evidence on, on cities responding better to the local migrants' needs, governing governing integration in a more innovative way. Uh, than at the central level and also being more efficient. Yet the existing studies usually use the evidence from the top scale immigrant uh, destination cities and the perspective of central Eastern European cities is often missing. And also little is known about the local level migration uh, policy making in a crisis context. And the crisis context is, uh, is specifically what I will uh, focus on today. Uh, so crisis can be understood as a, as a sudden and severe threat to social structures that requires quick and urgent response under often uh, uncertain circumstances. Uh, but crisis also creates an opportunity for a policy change at central or at the local levels, and that can range from um, either restricting or enhancing migrants' rights. And public discourse and political and academic debates focusing on the governance of immigrant integration uh, in Central Eastern Europe specifically heated following the 2015 crisis. And during and after the crisis, crisis efficient governance of policies also at the EU level was much needed, yet at that time it was mostly the Central and Eastern European uh, countries that from the very early on refused different solutions offered at the EU level, such as the, the relocation mechanism. mechanism. Um, and it was interesting because um, specifically the uh, back then Hungary and Poland were affected differently while there were many migrants crossing Hungary during the crisis. There were ha hardly any coming to Poland, and yet the, the very strongly anti-immigrant and anti-refugee response was similar in both countries. So uh, in Poland, the back then elected Law and Justice Party uh, politicians, including um, two prime ministers and the president of the country, they refused the relocation and argued that Poland has already accepted 1.5 million refugees back then from Ukraine, even though they were mostly uh, coming not through uh, a refugee mechanism, but through the visa system. And um, at the same time, uh, Polish government was restricting uh, and starting pushbacks at, uh, at Polish borders, not allowing refugees to apply for asylum. And then uh, that situation didn't change even after the European Human Court issued an uh, interim measure prohibiting removing people who have ex uh, uh, expressed an intention to apply for asylum. And uh, additionally, Polish government changed the mechanism for distributing EU funds for NGOs serving refugees in such a way that they basically lost access to most of the funding uh, that they used uh, until then. And uh, um, again, also the, the, the crisis of COVID was used as another tool to restrict uh, migration and access to asylum procedure. And the situation has been escalating since then until, uh, until the crisis, the summer of last year, 2021, when, uh, when the crisis at the Polish-Belarusian border escalated. Um, um, uh, escalated in a way that uh, around a couple thousand, usually black, black and brown asylum seekers from Afghanistan, Syria, and uh, Central African countries seeking asylum 
uh, in Poland have been trapped between the borders, uh, Polish-Belarusian border. <coughs> and interestingly, the government's narrative was that Poland does, does not have an infrastructure to help that many migrants. Let me remind you, the couple thousand uh, people back then at the border. And um, and back then, the government started building similar Polish government, similarly to what has already been going on in Hungary, has uh, started building the the wall on on the border. Uh, and the project was worth uh, had a budget of one point six billion zloty to prohibit entering uh, to migrants. And this whole um, whole. Um, uh, situation shifted on February 24th when the crisis, uh, when Russia attacked uh, Ukraine and the crisis started with um, millions of people crossing Polish border. So within only two months, Poland turned from being a country of 38.5 million to over 40 million people. And since February 24th, Polish border have been crossed 5.8 million times from Ukraine and over 1.3 million Ukrainians have already received in Poland temporary protection. And uh, among them, uh, with over representation of children and women and elderly. Um, and uh, well, the, the, the response was massive uh, with the support of government and also uh, with massive budget spending. Well, basically, uh, it has been recently estimated that Poland spent for almost 4.5 billion euro, uh, which is like 1% of Polish GDP on, on the support uh, for, um, for refugees. Uh, so ma majority of people entered Polish cities and, um, and naturally cities were the force, first to have to respond uh, uh, to the crisis. So just to give you an example of the capital city of Warsaw, which has uh, a population of 1.8 million people, uh, between February 24th and May, uh, and end of May, 800,000 people crossed the city, some 300,000 stayed in the city for more, more than three days and um, around uh, uh, 170,000 uh, registered to receive temporary protection in the uh, area of Warsaw and uh, already back uh, in spring, 10,000 Ukrainian children joined Warsaw schools. Uh, so the, um, well, the response happened at various level. First, uh, the government uh, set up the temporary protection um, legislative, uh, um, which has created a uh, quick and easy to obtain alternative to the lengthy and specifically difficult in Poland to obtain asylum status. Yet, this framework provided weaker legal and social protection with no path to citizenship, in, insufficient financial and housing assist assistance, no access to integration program. And given the predicted long-term forced migration from Ukraine to Poland and the demographic structure of, of the migrants overrepresented by women and children, the, the protection gap, gaps will soon be more, uh, more problematic. And in, in practice, since the initial days of the crisis, it was the civil society and increasingly local governments that stepped in to offer actual response. And then again, an example from Warsaw, the capital city offered 160,000 beds in temporary housing, engaged 14,000 volunteers, and um, 36 of people registered in um, already in 36% uh, of the refugees already registered uh, in employment offices around the, uh, around the capital city. <coughs> and um, Yes, the volunteers. Uh, the volunteers started the uh, uh, the the response from the from the first days, but naturally they they experienced uh, many problems. These initial efforts were poorly coordinated, and right now, specifically, we know that more professionalization of the initially volunteer-based ad hoc aid is needed. 
um, which was to some extent offered by local administration and also multiple international organizations that stepped in, but then the mm, uh, 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 non-profit run support has also some uh, risks uh, such as sustainability over time um, and coordinating of uh, various support. Um, so, um, so local governments that became much more active than uh, than than the central government um, got engaged uh, in all all sorts of support from housing, uh, offering housing, uh, through addressing other basic need need healthcare and so on. But uh, in many cases they did not receive uh, sufficient funding uh, to do so. And um, and all the issues that existed in Poland prior to the crisis, such as missing national level or even often local local level, some kind of integration plans or or structure was uh, became uh, uh, very problematic uh, problematic right now. So um, the response across the country varied and. Uh, bigger cities, which in Poland are usually opposition run, uh, they uh, they had more experience, more resources to respond to migrants' need. In many cases, they had before the crisis established networks of cooperation with NGOs and migrant communities. They had some legal policy tools. Uh, uh, to to address migrants' needs, that uh, like for example in 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 the capital city there are like social dialogue committees that um, include representatives of uh, NGOs, immigrant communities, and the local administration. So all sorts of tools. Or Krakow has a program called Open Krakow. All these kind of tools were used right away to start the response and are, and are keep on being used right now but they all struggled with underfunding and the underfunding interestingly is a bigger issue among the opposition run cities unlike the uh, cities which are run by law and justice which received more funding so smaller right-wing governed cities received better funding from the government and better financial support but on the other hand, they were missing the structures of cooperation and not just that, like in the case of um, a small Polish city of Womża, which is the, uh, run by, uh, by law and justice. So there is not just lack of cooperation between local NGOs supporting migrants, but there are even um, like um, 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 lack of cooperation and uh, and the conflict which make the uh, the uh, city administration to organize their own response without the using the expertise of Im local immigrant service providers and obviously this response was problematic in uh, in when uh, in many ways there were also polish border transit cities such as uh, przemysl or, or uh, Rzeszów, which first time con were confronted with a massive migrant uh, migrant flows and just had to uh, come up with with new solution the hungarian cities were in a very different situation than poland because as I, I've, I've been talking a lot about civil society and NGOs supporting migrants which suffered in poland since 2016 but they exist there are many of them and now they are also receiving a lot of uh, international funding Unlike in Hungary, in Hungary, the the civil society um, has been consequently reduced uh, uh, since uh, since the 2016. So the crisis created some opportunities, such as for the first time, forced migration become on a public agenda and not just in a kind of hostile anti uh, uh, migrant language, but as as um, as something that we need to respond, we have to create plans. So the the crisis, not that much on the central level, but on a local level, on a city level, created a sort of momentum to actually come up with migration governance framework, start planning. And in fact, many Polish cities such as Wrocław, Poznań, or regions uh, such as Pomerania, or even the small uh, uh, city of Rzeszów are actually right now developing their mig migrant integration framework. At the same time, there are certain risks of that process because it's so much 
dominated by the arrival of Ukrainian uh, refugees. So often cases, the tools are developed for Ukrainians, as if there were only uh, Ukrainian migrants in Poland. So uh, there has been like, uh, for example, in the city of Wrocław, an ombudsman for migrants but not for migrants, for Ukrainian mi migrants selected. or So, so that's the, the kind of risk. And over the time, there is also a risk of a growing xenophobia unless addressed by Polish uh, by policies. So, so to sum up, these various types of responses that we can observe around cities in Central and Eastern Europe um, uh, depend or, or are shaped by like three groups of factors. So first of all, the, the, the central level factor uh, and the pre-crisis migration governance framework, such as overall hostility towards migrants, but not all migrants, mostly the black and brown asylum seekers. And at the same time, being very positive and welcoming toward, toward Ukrainian migrants. And uh, also on a macro level, the crisis has exacerbated all pre-existing challenges, especially in Poland, such as, such, such as inefficient policy making in terms of healthcare, education, all the problems that we have seen in Poland throughout the uh, pandemic, for instance, with the healthcare system. Now with entering the over 1.3 million Ukrainian refugees are exacerbating. And then on a city level, the uh, the the response dependent on this political uh, first of all on, on political representation whether the cities are opposition or um, or in Polish case the law and justice run uh, also local labor market condition or housing condition but also the pre-crisis governance uh, tools that existed or did not exist and of course the grassroots networks uh, that uh exist or not exist and many of them actually um, uh, were uh, established after the 2016 and uh, and ba and finally it's not neutral who are the migrants and especially in polish case it's very visible how the ukrainian migrants uh, or or how the government responds to their needs versus how the government responds to the needs of asylum seekers at the polish uh, belarusian border uh, and i think i will finish here thank you very much Thank you, Carolina. Um, so we'll have the questions at the end of the of the panel. So um, the next speaker will be Tatiana Golova. She's a sociologist, and her research interests include civic and political activism, migration, and communication on social media. Um, and she focuses on Russia and Germany, and also on some transnational spaces in between. Uh, so she's part of the research cluster Societies in Stability and Change at SOIS. And before joining SOIS as a researcher, she worked at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Magdeburg and at the Institute for East European Studies at the Freie University in Berlin. And in her research, she combines Interpret interpretative qualitative research methods and social network analysis, as well as natural language processing methods. And today she's going to give a talk on recent political migration from Russia to Germany, and in principle also to Georgia, though uh, this was the part that Tsipilma was supposed to talk about, so she will focus on the migration to Germany. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rina. And it's a pity that Tsipilma couldn't join us um, at the session because we were both very much, looking, very much looking forward to discussing first insights from a pilot project at SOIS, which is dedicated to political migration from Russia and Azerbaijan. And we started the project quite recently in March of this year. And it deals with political migration uh, since uh, 2012 in Russia and uh, 2014 in Azerbaijan, which marks the most, um, uh, before, before um, this year maybe most um, 
for the first in the series of very, uh, of very um, important authoritarian shifts. So in this project, we want to understand the process of migration as individual and also collective experience, and to analyze transnational politics and everyday activism by migrants. By comparing these both cases, Russian and Azerbaijani cases, we intend to identify similarities and differences across both post-Soviet authoritarian countries in terms of uh, trajectories of movements by migrants, forms of transnational engagement and motivations behind them, and migrants' resources and capacities to deal with multiple challenges they actually meet. So we are asking what makes migration political or uh, how um, do migrants make this their movement political. And within this project, we apply several methods, including semi-structured qualitative interviews with migrants, expert interviews, social media analysis, and participant observation on selected places. And in terms of uh, theoretical framework, my special thanks goes to um, go to uh, Felix Kravacek, because they use um, the, <laughs> the concepts of political remittance uh, as um, uh, acts of transferring political principles and practices between two or more places to which migrants as their descendants share connection with. And what's attractive for us in this um, a definition, a this interpretation of the concept of political remittances, that they are considered as multi-directional. So it's not so that the people um, who, live in, who left uh, Russia and now live in Germany, they would act towards Russian society, but it's multi-directional and we also use an interpretation of political remittances by Joanna Fomina, who published a book recently on Russian political migration. And um, it's important that the audiences in, um, in the home country are targeted directly or indirectly. So if it's about diasporic self-organization, it's about political remittances as well. And um, in this presentation, I'm focusing on the post 24th February, migration from Russia. So while authoritarian shifts in Russia and the Russian regime were followed by intensifying migration from the country in the past, the newest wave in difference in terms of its mass character, of relevant push factors, of how people lived, and which countries they are going to. So with some post-Soviet countries and Turkey becoming a major destination. And um, more specifically, I will talk about um, what happens with so-called political migrants in this context. As political migrants, we use a rather narrow definition. We understand political or civic activists or other actors of public fields, such as journalists, scholars, human rights defenders, and so on, who leave their home country as a reaction to direct repression, including political legal persecution, prosecution, and second, the same types of actors who leave the country in general context of their professional or public activities. For example, if offshore journalists are leaving the country um, by, because they hope to work more freely from abroad. And these political migrants might be a minority, but it's a vocal minority and they're very important for national and transnational public discourses on the newest war-induced Russian migration. Excuse me. It's important. And the second important um, restriction uh, of, um, of focus of my presentation it's about Germany and Georgia, because these two countries became an important destination, if for different reasons, for political, active and socially engaged Russian citizens. But these both countries provide very different migration regimes for Russian nationals in general and for political migrants more specifically. So we deal with two different destination countries and two different legal frameworks to explore a diversity of circumstances and how they affect migrants' political remittances. In what follows, we will, fo uh, we will identify, try to identify the interconnections between national legal relations and transnational activism performed by migrants 
and also by other civil society actors. And um, now, I, well, I would love to introduce the comparison and dimension of comparison, but now, as Tipel is not there, I will focus on German case only. So dimensions for, dimensions for description of this case are first migration regime, specifically for Russian nationals, political migrants, then migration-related activism, and two aspects. First, um, activism around restricted entry and visa politics, which can be addressed as um, visa activism, and second, other, other forms and fields of political remittances. Um, migration regime to, to, uh, for Russian citizens in Germany. Before the war, they needed a visa. They couldn't enter the country just so. What, by the way, is different to, uh, to uh, um, Georgia. But they, after 2007, until actually last week, um, an agreement between the EU and Russia, special visa regime, made it easier for travelers and uh, cheaper, actually, to obtain visas. But now this regulation has been suspended. And another important general factor, not specific for political migrants, is that um, between 2020 and this June, entry to Germany was restricted due to COVID-19 related limitations on non-essential travel. But for now, this kind of restriction has been lifted. And what happened to political migrants who would want to come to Germany before the war started? Um, even those who would be um, able uh, to apply for asylum and to Germany as asylum seekers, uh, they would prefer mostly to enter Germany through job offers, educational opportunities, language courses, research offers, and so on and so on, because this position of asylum applicants is very an attractive one in terms of social rights and social integration. And um, after Russia started the full-scale war against Ukraine, the immigration to Germany from post-Soviet space and the composition of post-Soviet migrant communities here changed completely. These Ukrainian refugees arriving in the country in large number, if by no means comparable to Poland. For Ukraine residents, the European humanitarian solution has been found very soon and implemented in Germany via Paragraph 24 of the Residence Act. And um, so far, there is no legal solution for the Russian nationals who intend to leave a country and seek protection in Germany because of their anti-war stance, which could lead to a real threat to their well-being. But since the beginning of the war, the, uh, a new solution, legal solution, was developed from Interior and Visa according to paragraph 22.2 of Res German Residence Act. It's not a general solution because it's, it's aiming at specific groups. So journalists, opposition and civic activists, scholars at risk, human rights defenders and so on. And um, they have to, to show at least one depends on group which, what um, following, um, excuse me, they have um, to, to express their anti-war position very publicly and uh, being under threat in this relation, or they have to demonstrate special relation to Germany. Because this paragraph 22.2 is actually regulating entry to the country to safeguard the political interests of Germany. What's the problem? What are problems with these humanitarian visas? First, as already mentioned, it's a group-specific solution and political persecution in Russia is not restricted to specific groups. And the problem, which was mentioned by all people we spoke to so far, is that the path to this visa, to getting this status, it remains unclear and includes long, long waiting times, which leads to financial strains, to so people who maybe entered Germany before with some kind of Schengen tourist visa, they had to leave to apply for this humanitarian visa because you can't apply to 22 
being in Germany, and then they want to come back, but they're waiting for the visa. And they're running out of money, and the situation of waiting we can, can be seen as a position to agency, as a process of engagement. So uh, the very active people are put in a situation of disengagement. And now, um, an except from an interview with an activist, you already have a PowerPoint, and this person um, I spoke to, she's from a large city, and civic and political activist, and she went to Germany first, very fast, and then had to, had to leave to apply, and now she's waiting. So, and after I'm asking her, how does it work? What have you done so far? Referring to this paragraph 22. She really has problem to create this narrative flow. So, there are lots of poses and sighs, and um, after all, it's quite a longer um, segment of the interview about this Yohyota situation. Outside, um, something in the middle. At some point, we were off the list, apparently because the first were on a German list, as they thought it would be possible to get this while being in Germany. And then we moved to Montenegro. And we moved from one list to another. That's when we got lost, I suppose. And so we were out of this process for a month. So, what are these lists, actually? And lists are, well, list of cases, list of people who are verified, have been verified, and who are considered as eligible for getting this humanitarian visa. And what's interesting about the German case, that the lists are compiled not by official agency, but by activists and NGOs. And first type of actors are actually formal, registered NGOs, focusing on human rights, in general, on supporting specific public uh, professionals groups, like journalists, or on transnational civil society cooperation, like Deutsch-Russ Austausch, German-Russian exchange. But this includes also informal networks of migrant volunteers connected to, to uh, Berlin organizations or initiatives, Berlin anti-war initiatives, and Solidarus. And the implementation of this 22-2 humanitarian visa solution and construction of political interests of Germany, which this 22-2 paragraph is referring to, um, it depends on the activists. Um, so, I'm afraid we have to. Um, so what about other kind of political remittance not related to visa activism? So recent migrants are involved in diasporic political activities to different degrees, or maybe not at all, because they're rather involved in getting their new lives in Germany or somewhere else organized. But networks involved in the kind of visa activism I described, they overlap with diasporic pro-democracy and anti-war initiatives, including feminist anti-war groups or such pro-democracy groups like Demokratia in Berlin, and they're organizing anti-war picnics, that networking events, political demonstration performances, and so on. What you hear are pictures which are taken at um, an action um, anti-war rally before Russian embassy in Unter der Linden at the beginning of March. But in general, um, civic and political activism among Russian immigrants in Germany is directed less or addressing less um, homeland recipients and more their own diasporic networks. It's about diasporic networks and getting together and getting something done on the level of Russian migrants and pro-democratic Russian migrants in Europe. So now it would be the time for Georgian case, but we have to postpone it to another conference, I'm afraid. And um, so what I offer now is some kind of shadow case comparison, because we didn't have the chance to discuss Georgian case in detail. In terms of entry regulations, there is a huge, huge difference between Georgia and Germany. So in Georgia, there is a 
visa-free entrance for one year. There are freelance programs for people who want to stay longer. But it's, on the one hand, it enabled people to flee to Germany, uh, excuse me, to Georgia, and um, without much of resources, have to, without have to apply to visa. And on the other side, and that's what we call this migration regime to our Russian citizens as neoliberal, it's a free country, but you have no guarantees. And there are reports about people who would be living in Georgia and they would left for to Armenia or to Turkey and they won't come back and they wouldn't be let in because they have no guaranteed rights. And the, um, so this kind of visa activism, it's only developing in Germany and it's greater potential of cooperation of migrant self-organized diasporic networks with other NGO and other civil society networks without migration background. And in terms of political remittance, what we see here, and the activists in both host countries are addressing mainly diasporas and not the home country directly. And on the printed out um, PowerPoint, you can see some more theoretical informed outlook, but maybe we'll postpone this point for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, so the next presentation will be by Piotr Goldstein, um, the social scientist working at the intersection of social and visual anthropology, sociology, and political science. He received his PhD from the University of Manchester. And at SOIS, he works in the project uh, Mobilize, and he has two projects one on everyday activism in Central and Southeastern Europe, and one on invisible migrant activism. And since June, he has also worked at DITSIM on visual ethnography. And indeed, he's also the author of two ethnographic documentaries, and he's the author of the pieces, the excerpts of documentaries that you can see in the room next door. So, Piotr, I hope your technology works. This is what I wanted to say, that I need a microphone. Okay, so uh, just wanted to say that this is not all terribly new data, but it is for me a new way of thinking about it. So uh, it's very much work in progress and any feedback will be very much welcome. So I will talk about grasping the opportunity and long time engagement with the, film, with the field. And this presentation has four acts, sorry, four parts. Uh, the first one is on slow activism and fast research. And uh, my adventure with slow activism has started uh, in this coffee bookshop in Novi Sad, Serbia, which was called Knižara Gradska. Uh, and uh, in my previous work, I uh, argued that bookshop cafes in Serbia are very much activist institutions. That's because they operate as businesses, but because of the ambitious choice of books they tend to sell, they have little chance of becoming success successful in economic terms. This is not because people do not read in Serbia, but because, among other things, books are very expensive. So if you live in the UK or Germany and you want to buy yourself a copy of Plato's Republic, you need to work one hour on a minimum hourly wage. In Spain or Poland, you need to work two hours, but in Serbia, you need to work entire day to buy yourself a copy of Plato's Republic or another similar book. Uh, and these bookshop cafes, in contrast and in opposition to chains which sells books two for one and which concentrate on the things which are easy to sell, guidebooks, cookbooks, and so on, with all respect, they focus on uh, difficult books like why do people make war, they sell poetry, they sell classics of literature, and things which, in principle, do not sell too well. Uh, they do it because they believe that by doing that, they raise future generations. Another thing that they do is that they, uh, knowing that books of ethnic minorities are hardly ever bought because 
local Hungarians, for instance, in Novi Sad, most of them do not speak Hungarian anymore, and if they do, they buy books directly from Hungary. And knowing that these books will not sell, they still sell them because that's the right thing to do. They want this language of local minority to be present in the public space. And some of them make a statement by choosing a central location by which they want to break the dominance of banks and hyper-expensive shops against common business sense. They say center is the place where the books should be and not only this uh, restaurant for the richest. And this is one of the reasons why, uh, why I'm talking here about uh, not only slow uh, activism, but also fast research. So Knizsa Ragracka, this very particular place where I got the idea of researching bookshop cafes, uh, I spent in it a big part of the summer one year, and in October I put it in my grant proposal saying that I will come there in January and research in this place. But when I came in January, the place was already closed because it already went bankrupt. And then I started to research in another place, Serendipity, another bookshop cafe in the very center of the city, uh, which also went bankrupt after a couple of months. I started with them in January, and by April they were closed. Uh, and, oh no, there was another one. Never mind. And in another one, which had uh, a combination of second-hand uh, bookstore and uh, and a lesbian reading room and an event space, and they also went bankrupt after a couple of months. Uh, and all of these bookshop cafes, one thing that they have in common, they choose ethos over profit. So I researched also another one, which was in a way bookshop cafe, because you could drink coffee and buy books there, but you would not pay for the coffee, against, again against the common business sense. That's the one with the lesbian reading room and, uh, and event space. So this was very much slow activism for them, and this was fast research for me. It was very much like trying to research an egg which is falling and which would break in any second. Let me now move to slow activism and slow research. And this is a moment in which I would love to give three minutes to my anthropological self and bring in ethnographic vignette. So this part starts at a funeral. In Warsaw, Poland, around 40, 50 people in their 30s and early 40s stand in a circle and sing in Hebrew to a slow melody. But what they sing is not a prayer for the deceased. It's a song for Havdalah, a short Saturday evening prayer to close the Shabbat and start the new week. That is because the funeral at which they met is not of a person. They met on a warm Saturday evening to commemorate the passing away of two Polish Jewish organizations, the Polish Union of Jewish Students and the Polish Jewish Youth Organization, Zoom. While Zoom was formally dissolved just a couple of months before the event, Push has been dead for several years. But was it really dead? Although the organization has officially ceased to exist, its former members remained a community often in touch with each other and joining forces for smaller and bigger joint projects, sometimes within new organizations and often informally without any organizational structures. Albert Hirschman published in 1984 a short book, Getting Ahead Collectively, collectively based on his research in Latin America a year earlier. In the book, he argues that people who engaged in different social projects or movements often kept the social energy developed in these projects and movement, even after this ceased to exist. Same here, we could say that the social energy which PUSH and Zoom members developed in the organizations stayed with them to be taken on in new, not necessarily formalized projects. At the same time, the funeral uh, brought together not only the former members, but also people who have not had the chance to join these organizations. It was not only social energy, but also a certain legacy spreading beyond the former membership. And the similar is the story of this theater, independent theater, Ogledalo, which I studied in Serbia in 2011. And at that time I went to research it because I was trying to see if it has any impact. You know, there's this, there are these political science theories that people who work in associations, they are more active and the, the associations make them more active. And I made a short survey with the, with the association and I made interviews. And it seemed that it's not really what it should be, it seemed that uh, 
it's not that people become more active in the organization. I checked, uh, checked whether people who belonged for a long time to organization are more active than those who just joined. Uh, and this was not the case. Like it appeared that some people join and are very active at the point of joining, some others don't. And thus the association does not have much impact. But I came back to the association last year, so 10 years after I took the interviews, I interviewed the same people. Uh, this year, so 11 years after I worked with the association, I, uh, I interviewed some of its former members. The organization has already been dead for eight years now. Uh, and I was really impressed. It was really incredible how much impact that organization had. It really changed people's lives. It really uh, impacted on what they do now. And many of them were really capital A activists. Okay, now a very short part, everyday migrant and minority activism. Uh, it is intuitive in a way, if we want to research migrants or minorities, to start with migrant or minority institutions. So if you go to Manchester, where I lived for 10 years, and want to research Polish people as I wanted, you go to a Polish parish and you will see that it's not only a Polish parish, but it's also a Saturday school. Uh, they have this Polish folk ensemble, they have Polish Alcoholic Anonymous, they have Polish Scouts, they have all different of Polish organizations. Uh, and similarly, you want to study Roma people in Serbia, you, go to, you can go to Roma event like that, and you do have Roma organizations which do Roma dancing, you have uh, Romani Students Union and other Roma NGOs. Uh, what I was really intrigued and what I find much more interesting in my research is when uh, ethnic minorities and migrants engage for activism outside their community organizations and for causes which, causes which are important for all. So I was really fascinated when I found that in critical mass in Novi Sad, which is a really big local event with several thousand people cycling every week, the, most of the informal leaders are local Hungarians. Uh, I was intrigued to hear about this activist for animal rights in Manchester who came from Poland. Uh, I was fascinated by this cooperative in Manchester, which, which is a cooperative. What they do is they, uh, they promote uh, cyclist rights. They say that they promote alternative economies, uh, and they're all Polish. Or uh, like this man in, from a refugee from Kosovo living in northern Serbia, who you can see in the room next door in the installation and about whom I will talk in a second again. So now is the question of visualizing all of that visualizing the invisible. And I will allow myself to show you one minute from one film of pieces of one film and one minute of a trailer of the other film. Oops, sorry. Hi. Hi. Okay, maybe I will read the subtitles because they won't be visible from that far anyway. So I will read the subtitles from you. They are not that important, but let me read. Come on, come see that. Come on, come here. Everybody come here for a kiss. Come on. Come on. Bye bye. That is going to work now. Bye. Okay, bye. So this is Driton, and Driton, uh, my colleague Jan Lorenz and I, we filmed him in half a day. We spent a very, very intensive half a day with him in uh, Novi Sad, Serbia, cycling and in a way collecting garbage with him. He makes his living collecting garbage, he collects paper and metal. And the essence of the film is now like, he makes his living collecting paper, but when he sees that it's very messy around the bins, he takes the garbage and he puts it inside of the bin. And this is not his job. He's not working for a municipal company. He does it exclusively because he feels responsible for the city. It's his micro act of activism, something that he can afford. And the second film, was all the opposite in the terms of making it. The film was filmed across five years, and it's the film about the Polish cooperative in Manchester.
I will read the subtitles for you for in a second. I know how it is in the economy that often people are underemployed. You know, they have skills, talent, for instance, for something. But their skills, talent, and aspirations are not fully used in the community. And it's not true that it's coming soon because it has already been released. And uh, now you can turn off Facebook on your mobile phones. No, nobody does it. But you can take out your phones and scan the code and then you will see the full version of the film. Or you can approach me later and I will send you the link. Okay, so this raises some open questions. And as I told you at the beginning, I have more questions than answers at the moment. One question is how to show ideas and visions beyond people talking about them. And this sounds at first as a question of visual anthropology, but in fact, it's not only a question of showing on film. It's when we do other types of research, we also very often talk with people about what they do, and uh, it's a you know it's a question of how do we how do we show ideas and visions that people do and not only talk about. Another thing, and this is a struggle for me, I have to say it was a big struggle in both films. It's hard to show hard and often boring day-to-day -day work without boring the spectator. This is a visual anthropology question. Uh, one thing when I was showing first version of Spugelnia Cooperative, many people were telling me that this is such a hipster, uh, hipster activism, because when you see people selling organic fair trade coffee from a bicycle, it looks very hipster. But the truth is that it's much less hipster if you stand on the, stand on the other side of the coffee machine. And if you do the 500th coffee on a day, standing in cold, it's not hipster at all. It's very hard work. And, uh, I remember when I did the first, uh, when I first screened a rough cut of Spugelnia, some people asked me, okay, but why do they have to make this coffee all the time? Uh, but this was the idea that like, you know, the, it's boring for them, it could be at least a bit boring for you also. <laughs> Another question is how to show, talk about activism of people who do not consider themselves activists. Many of these people who I'm, who I'm showing, who I'm considering activists myself, I consider them activists because they do things which NGOs could do, which, uh, which organizations could do, which charities could do, but they don't uh, usually do not consider themselves activists. And another question is how to balance truth that lies in details and an engaging story. And it's a question of, of researching for a long time. The longer you research, the more, the more you learn, and it's not always as fancy as it was at the beginning. And another question related is how do we merge several di different versions, stories, understandings into one storyline? This is something that was a challenge for me when I was uh, putting together Spugelnia uh, Cooperative. We had different protagonists and they had their own uh, visions and stories to tell. And the question is when does the story finish? Uh, it's very tempting to, to, to study forever and it's also tempting to finish very fast. So I leave it as an open question. Some of these questions I did try to uh, answer to a small extent in the short essay that I published last year in uh, Entanglements Journal, so you can check on that. It was called Visualizing Invisible Migrant Activism. But many of these questions remain open. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Piotr. Um, so, for those who are following online, you can uh, ask your questions also in the chat or, yeah, I think probably the easiest is if you write them in the chat. Um, so, maybe I'll ask a question for all three of the panelists and then we'll open up the discussion to the rest of the room. So, um, you all uh, showed some cases of activism. Uh, some were migrants themselves uh, being activists for their own cause. Some were activists, um, migrants being activists for a broader cause. And some were activists uh, for migration related questions without being migrants themselves. Um, is there any, are there any patterns that we could somehow find between these different types of activist groups of who activists are among people who exist in society, are there some patterns we can find of 
who become activists and who doesn't. Um, and then another question would be if we can observe some temporary patterns. So over time, some of you followed activism uh, over time. Um, is there any pattern you can observe, uh, for example, in terms of relation to migration movement? Um, so we have seen a high rise of uh, migration activism um, right at the beginning of an influx of people and then a decrease again. But then we also have cases of activism that last over a long period of time. So what kinds of patterns can we see in terms of intensity maybe of activism or types of activism over time? If you have any answers on that. If not, no problem, then we move to other questions from other people in the room or in the chat. Um, Diana, would you like to start or shall I start? Yeah, okay, I start. Okay, so, uh, or sorry, Carolina, <laughs> did you want to start? Um, I, I, yeah, I can, I can start, okay. Uh, so uh, thank you for this question. This is uh, uh, indeed who the migrant activists are that uh, excellent question um, and uh, uh, in the current crisis uh, in Poland uh, uh, I just want to remind we had like over a million and a half uh, Ukrainian di diaspora in Poland and that was the group that was naturally the most uh, uh, engaged in in support um, of the uh, forced migrants coming from Ukraine, including by offering housing, translation if needed, and um, help with getting job and so on. And some of these uh, efforts were actually institutionalizing into some formal organizations, or in other cases, organizations which were predominantly focused on promoting some Ukrainian culture turned into being like a um, humanitarian aid. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one aspect of, of that. But another interesting aspect um, is, um, is the representation of, uh, of Polish born uh, people in, in the activism. Uh, I mentioned in the relation to the current crisis, there was a massive uh, uh, engagement, uh, in fact, uh, um, at, at some point, even 80% of representative sample of Polish society declared that someone in their household is engaged in, uh, um, in supporting refugees. Uh, there are different forms of the support from like donations to actually hosting uh, migrants uh, in their apartments, but but some some kind of uh, form of activism. And interestingly, this activism is also, like you mentioned, decreasing um, for the last couple months. Uh, it's dropped by 10 percent uh, percent points in how many people declared that they are supporting um, refugees. But anyway, in Poland, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see the, the groups that are actually helping. So, for example, during the crisis, first of all, the 2016 and then at the Polish Belarusian border, there are different groups of activists. Um, some of them are over, there's probably a over representation of, um, uh, on the one hand, left, um, uh, left wing activists, uh, in, in that, which we can see in, uh, board, a so-called Grupa Granica border group, which is, uh, uh, supporting migrants at the Polish Belarusian border. But on the other hand, they're just simple residents of this. Uh, border area who are actively uh, engaged in in supporting migrants, um, including uh, representatives of local administration that sometimes are conservative people themselves and just cannot uh, cannot accept. Uh, and I'm I'm quoting from the from my memory um, um, a, a president of one of the border towns. Uh, who who um, who said that he just cannot 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 watch mother and and children freezing to death in in the in the forest nearby his house, so that's uh, like an, another uh, population. 
but then interestingly in uh, when when we look at the survey results from who is helping right now with the current uh, current crisis so then uh, there is more uh, more conservative people on 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 this side or people who are like uh, there is a um there is research that uh, uh checks the the religious um uh, views and actually there is a correlation between people being more religious uh, more uh, catholic uh, and then going uh um, and then helping the the level of engagement in helping the ukrainian refugees so in Poland, there is, or taking the Polish case, there is no one answer who the activists are. And in fact, this answer is tied to who the migrants are and to whom do we want to help. And um, uh, and, 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 and definitely there is more um, engagement on the kind of left wing, uh, left leaning people into helping different groups of migrants and um and more engagement on the of the more conservative people helping the white christian migrants coming um coming from ukraine and and to your second question about the decrease and the increase uh, in in the engagement so as i mentioned in poland it's already it is decreasing there is less uh less engagement but on the other hand they are looking at uh, beginning with the 2016 crisis there has been networks created um, among activists that maybe are not very large but are still going on and being active through the crisis at the Belarusian border and now they are also used in support of Ukrainian refugees such as uh, for example families without borders and and other um, and other groups that uh, so not it's definitely not going to be moving moving forward it's definitely not going to be a massive engagement of of people o over the time but uh, but a smaller and uh, uh, but smaller group remains that also kind of formalize more uh, more more over the time and that's what we see in Poland thank you thank you um piotr do you want to yeah, continue sure Okay, so uh, the question about relationship between different uh, different types of migrant activism, activism for migrants and on behalf of migrants and so on. Uh, yes, I mean, I don't think it always happens, but I think it does happen and it's very often entangled. The, it is, for instance, not at all uncommon for uh, migrations to work for, uh, for migrants or minorities to work for refugees. So, for instance, in the, uh, in, in, uh, Late February, March, we had specific telegram groups for Polish people who were volunteering at train stations, bus, bus stations in Berlin, helping refugees from Ukraine. There were, uh, I did started but haven't finished making film about Hungarians in north of Serbia helping refugees going with the, with the Balkan route. Uh, there was another activist in Manchester, uh, a Polish woman who was doing, who have organized an entire program of doing piro different types of pierogi. Uh, with uh, with uh, refugees uh, and asylum seekers while providing English lessons, so uh, it's not that it's always entangled, but but it is. It is in the same way as the as different forms like the more formalized and less formalized activism are entangled. Very often, people, and this relates to the second question. So, so you asked about change in time. One thing that I see very much, uh, that I see a lot. Uh, are changes in personal time. So in people's lives time, people engage in different types of activism. So people, for instance, belong to an NGO or a charity, then they have, and go to protest movements, then they have children, they have less time for that, so they involve, get involved in more informal activism, yet in another point of their lives they do individual activism, then again they join, join some kind of a group. So I think this is very entanglement, and this changes a lot in personal time and um, because of personal circumstances. Thank you. Tatiana? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, start um, adding to the point what um, Pyotr just mentioned about um, the relation of uh, migration-focused activism and another activism by migrants. And that's what we, the, what we see in the case of um, Russian migrants um, and political migrants involved in help to um, 
other people helping other people come to uh, Germany and um, being integrated um, here. It's not just about um, this visa activism uh, directed towards Russian citizens, but there are very active networks involved in helping Ukrainian refugees as well. So it's not just uh, migration-related uh, activism for migrants. Um, it's not just about their own um, group. It may be directed towards other groups. And of course, especially in case of, of Ukrainian and Russian um, communities, there are kind of tangents and are directly influenced by, uh, by the war and the developments of the war. Um, um, and about temporary patterns. Um, it's actually um, so that uh, people uh, who are really active in uh, Russia, if they move to Germany um, or to other countries as Georgia or some countries in South, South Eastern Europe, they, um, they have to uh, deal with a lot of very practical questions. So they actually don't have so many time for, for activism. And even the situation of the waiting, uh, the situation can be debilitating. It's not uh, activating. But there are some, some actors who are actually managed to become really um, engaged in the migration situation. And those are these recent, active recent migrants, I think from what we have on data so far, there are people who are kind of professionalized they dealing with migration. For example, if, uh, um, if someone, an activist um, from um, related to FBK and Navalny headquarters in Russia, he uh, moved to Georgia and um, he actually became a migration specialist. He professionalized it. So he helps people to leave Russia and um, he gets money for some of them because he not only deals with uh, political migrants but with other kinds of people, he helps to organize moving to the US or UK or Europe like and, and getting a job offer and so on. And But he also have helped other political migrants who actually um, are in acute situation of legal prosecution other kind of persecution. So this, I think this question of how recent migrants, how far they are involved in politics, we, we need well, more information. <laughs> we will obviously talk to more people in different countries and I think we need more differentiated view on it. So it's not so like political active people move to another country and stay political active. So, thank you. Thank you. So, um, are there any questions either in the chat um, or in the room? Um, there, maybe I'll first take uh, those from uh, people outside of uh, Zeiss. So there are two people in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had actually two questions, but the first question has been answered by Carolina. So then uh, my second question, or two questions uh, still, will go to uh, Tatiana. Uh, I'm Sergei Tsyoshenko of uh, eu Russia Civil Society Forum, a network of NGOs uh, from Russia, EU member states and uh, Great Britain. Um, uh, well, uh, the humanitarian visa is, of course, uh, a pain in the neck uh, for Russian and I think also for Belarusian nationals. Uh, and uh, we at our organization also get uh, at least two or three uh, letters from different people every, every week about so whether we would uh, be able to give them a letter of support for applying for the humanitarian visa. So, but there are, um, uh, and, uh, and once, uh, so two, two months ago, so I was told uh, at the German Federal Foreign Office uh, that when I, when I said, okay, so please, uh, maybe you would publish uh, a list or whatever. So just, and they said, no, so it is all right that we just uh, said it, uh, said it in public, so then the procedure is there. Um, but my, uh, my two questions. Uh, so the first, uh, the first one is that uh, 
in this debate about uh, about Russians applying for humanitarian visas, uh, we also uh, forget about uh, Belarusian activists, for example, or the people from Belarus. Uh, but uh, as far as I understand, so they are uh, they are also applying so in the same procedure. Do you have any data on this? How successful they are? Um, in this procedure, and another thing, a kind of a devil's advocate, so that, uh, um, well, so there is a, uh, an asylum system. Yes, so, and I understand that uh, not uh, each and every person would like to apply for an asylum uh, for uh, obvious reasons. So, but then there was no special procedure for, for the people uh, fleeing the war or fleeing uh, the political regimes uh, in uh, 2015 or later uh, for other countries and uh, shouldn't uh, be the same procedures applied uh, to the people all over the world, not only to Russians or Belarusians or to whoever. Thank you. Thank you. The, let's collect a few questions. Thanks, uh, and thanks for the entire panel. I had a, also a brief question, I would say. Um, I was curious if uh, Tatiana, you and uh, Tsiplima have any, either you have or you have heard that there is any data on what are the other destinations of uh, Russian political migrants after the war, because just in terms of rumors of her, not rumors, but like more informal, low-key, um, discussions and research, I've heard that a lot of people are going also to Yerevan, to Bishkek, to Almaty, uh, also to other European uh, EU member countries. So I'm just curious if you have something of an overview data on this. Uh, and then the next question to that is then why would you pick on Germany and Georgia? Are they particularly important in terms of the volume of refugees or in some other way, let's say? Thank you. Gwendolyn? Okay, thank you. Um, Piotr, something you said that really made me think, and this is the way you put the question, uh, how do we show or visualize ideas? And I think you probably were thinking about it in a, in a visual documentary type way, but also I think it's a broader question. We always, or often, I think, in our research try to show um, ideas. No? Even if you ask somebody about attitudes, um, about democracy or something, that's also an idea in a way. So I was curious, although you put the question there, if, I mean, reflecting upon your own work, and that's how I understood the question, kind of what, what ideas do you think you can capture with those methods? I mean, either in a film or maybe with the ethnographic methods you use along the way. Uh, and I now don't mean, and I don't think you meant um, sort of activism that you show, but behind that, sort of what ideas do you think you captured and which ones are hard or maybe impossible to capture? So basically the answer to that interesting question that you asked. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's take one more by Tatiana. I have uh, a question or maybe comment to, to the first presentation. I wanted to ask Carolina, you emphasized this um, race and religion in your presentation. Uh, which make difference between, so to say, two refugee crises. And my question would be, is it like other factors, like, uh, I don't know, cultural proximity between Poles and Ukrainians, language proximity, the experience of living like uh, hand in hand with Ukrainians, millions of, of whom like worked in, in Poland, but also like historical memory, which allows uh, Poles identify with the Ukrainian situation. Uh, do you think this th does this maybe also matter? Thank you. Uh, all right, then uh, maybe st we'll start with you. Thank you, and thank you for excellent questions. Um, I start with a question by Sergei. Um, of course, um, people who are um, political migrants from Russia who seek protection in Germany, they not only apply to this um, humanitarian visa solution, for this humanitarian visa solution, there are different ways to come uh, to Germany for stipends, like stipends and uh, job offers uh, and so on. But, um, um, and you mentioned the asylum procedure, um, 
and I think the kind of public debate, because you mentioned public debate, what's so relevant right now, and not only in Germany, but on the EU level, is uh, about a tourist visa. Because um, if a person couldn't wait or wouldn't want to wait for the humanitarian visa, and you can apply for it only outside of Germany, um, they could come to Germany and apply here for asylum. And, but you have to be in Germany first. So actually, the people who are maybe um, under acute threat because of the anti-war stance were recently um, a story about a teacher from very far away from Siberia who um, was denunciated by the uh, parents and by her school and had to leave, uh, was under um, acute uh, threat of legal prosecution. She had to leave the country and she could go to the Schengen zone and now she's a German because of having this visa and she applied for asylum. And it wouldn't work with humanitarian visa. And you mentioned Belarusian, Belarus, um, Belarusian cases. We are not aware that this solution would be some kind systematically applied, but the problem is with this whole humanitarian visa. It's very intransparent. So there are some cases of 22 uh, used by Belarusian activists, and there are some cases of um, people who would um, be from Russia, activists from Russia, and who would get this 22 to, to last year, actually, or before the starting of the war, before this solution was. And um, now to the second question, why Russians? Actually, Russians are the second um, 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 group which, um, for which this regulation was applied to some kind of mass character. The first were Afghan um, refugees, of course not all of them, but they, those who had to flee Taliban and were working for Russia, uh, for, excuse me, <laughs> for German governmental organizations before. And um, so it would be the first large group. And um, I think it's about how political interests of Germany are defined. And it's not just something around their legislation, it's part of this paragraph, according to political interests of Germany. And that's, uh, if Germany has no political interest, then this solution wouldn't be applied to different groups. So, that's not, uh, it's how I see the reality, not my, what I want to see, but well, that's how it looks for me. <laughs> And um, moving on to your questions, um, um, which countries are uh, people going to? Of course, um, and it's actually related to the second question why Germany and Georgia. So Georgia is a very much a, a very important country in terms of quantities and qualities, and Germany, there are not so many going to Germany. But actually, for political activists, it might be easier to come to Germany in the long term and stay in Germany because if they get this humanitarian status or asylum status, they will be provided for, they would give social rights. So this country is a spe special interest for activists themselves. So, and I, I think what we have to include in our study more, um, it's interconnections between different destinations country. I already mentioned this arrangement where people come to Germany first and then have to leave and they're waiting in other countries. But it can be other way around. People are coming to Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan or Georgia first, and they are moving towards West. So, thank you. Thank you. Carolina? Yes. Uh, so so I'll, I'll respond to the, uh, to the question on the cultural uh, d d differences versus similarities. Uh, so, so yes, this is uh, um, definitely the culture, shared history, shared enemy in the current situation, uh, or, or this is how it's also framed by uh, framed in the media discourse, um, is, uh, is is are definitely factors that have in common um, that Polish society have in common with Ukrainian society and which makes it easier for people 
to get engaged um, in some sort of help or activism uh, to support refugees. Um, that that that's definitely the case. Uh, at the same time, when you look at it from from purely legal or human rights perspective, so that is striking the the, the institutionalized difference with the Polish Belarusian border being uh, entirely sealed, like literally sealed with the with the with the wall uh, to protect uh, not so much from uh, Poland from the Belarusian regime, but to protect from uh, from people crossing uh, the border and trying to apply for asylum. And it is a striking difference with how how the government uh, responded uh, and society as well. Uh, to the crisis at um, at the Ukrainian border and in and in Ukraine. So yes, probably all of all of the factors uh, uh, contribute here with the culture, history, um, and common enemy uh, uh, on the one hand, but then also uh, race and religion on on the other. Thank you, Piotr. Thank you very much for the question, Gwen, and. Uh, yeah, I must say it's a question which I keep asking myself, and I wonder whether it's a question which does really have answer. It's a question, the kind of question that we need to keep asking ourselves and and adapt to to its specific piece of research and its specific situation. In the case of uh, of uh, my research with Driton, for instance, this was a challenge, and this was a question which I was asking myself from the very first cut of the film. How do I show this activism, which shows in 50 seconds of 30, 30 something? minutes long film. One answer is the installation next door, where activism is given a separate screen. Uh, so this was a way, this was a way to, to overcome the challenge. But for instance, in the, in the other film, in Spuchelnia, the activism is much, much, much more spread in time. It's not something that I can show with a finger. It happens here. Uh, it happens in the monotonity of everyday work. It happens in the fact that the guy runs the cooperative, but it's so, so unprofitable that he goes to work in McDonald's in the evenings to make his ends meet. So, uh, in a way, it's a, yeah, perhaps it's a question we just need to keep asking. All right. Um, yeah, actually, looking at your faces, I think it's time to let you have some coffee. <laughs> um, so, um, I think we'll stop here and... Um, I think you could ask your remaining questions to the panelists later. And uh, thanks a lot to all three of you and um, have a nice rest of the day. Thank you so much, Irina, for stepping in. Thank you very much.
Hello, Frau Richardson. Hello. Hi, here is Anna from the technic technicians. Hi, Anna. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear That's me? Good. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. And you should see, like, the room with only a few people people in it. That's right. Yeah, I can see Perfect. the the uh, po uh, the the place with empty chairs exactly. and the podium. Yeah, great. Maybe yes, I'm gonna yes. go into the camera. You might see yes. me now. <laughs> okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. Okay. Yes, perfect. I see you. So we will start soon. Okay. Um, and then and then this will be our situation. All right. Okay. That's great. And then um, and then is is it? I'm able to. Did you make me co oh, co-host so that I can share my screen? Or? Would you want to share something? I got um, the information you don't have uh, any any presentation, but it's it would be no problem if if you would like to do so. Can I? Can you make me co-host to see if I can manage it? Uh, I do have a couple of things. It's not essential. Uh, um, uh, it's just a couple of photos, uh, so it doesn't really matter if I show yes. them or not. But um, if I can see if I can manage, yeah. that would be good. sure. I just did. I just okay. uh, made you co-host. Okay, so let me see, um, just hang on a second. Um, great. Okay, I might not actually do this. <laughs> I'm, no reading from my, I'm reading from my screen and trying to show uh, PowerPoint, so it might be too complicated. Just let me just try though, to see if it works. Sure. Uh, uh, so you have to stop sharing yours. Oh, is... All right, sure. Um, give me one second, though. Hmm. I think I, it allows me to stop you, so I can try, um, and then uh, see. Wait a if... minute, just just one second, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, this works fine on our, our side, if you want to know. Okay, um, I think though, uh, so do you see the um, presentation mode or do you see the, the, like all the slides? No, you, uh, you need to, to, uh, to use the presentation mode, please. Right, okay. Um, right. Exactly, then we see it in full screen. That's okay. perfect. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the problem is, though, I don't have a printout, so I think I won't bother with the slides um, because I... You won't. I, okay. Yeah, I have to read from my screen, just, so no, just, don't worry about the slides. Okay. Then. So um, I'm going to put in my slide again, like we share yep. the screen again, and if Great. you would want to share the, the photos, you can just uh, kick me out and... and do it how you did it right now, okay? Okay, that's right. I think I'm just gonna keep it All right. bit simple because um, the, I, yeah, I didn't manage to print out my presentation, so I'm reading from the screen. Okay, so that's great. <laughs> okay, okay great. Okay, see you in a bit. Thanks. Bye.
one for you. One for you. Don't think about it. Only use it. Don't. <laughs> Так, я, я обычно... Okay, I think most of you found your way back to our conference room. Well, actually, this is a library. We have books, so it must be a library. Um, thank you all who have stayed through throughout the day um, and those who have been following us online or maybe hopping on and off. This is the final panel of TOYS annual conference. And I do hope that you're all quite tired, but not completely exhausted. <laughs> Why do I want you to be tired? Because I want some of your, some of all of our layers, filters and facade to peel a little off and use the space for some frank conversation. Doesn't mean that we have not been having those but we will try something else with this, with this panel. And um, for which I was trying to prepare yesterday and I, and I had a grand strategy. Um, and now um, listening to the panels and interesting conversations and challenging questions and more questions, I have a mess of notes. So um, we'll see as we go. <laughs> and um, yeah. Also, I have to say I'm very impressed by the research that my colleagues are doing. Um, it's just really, really impressive. I've been, I've not been here for a long time since March, and I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this crowd. But okay, well, um, so we have been talking all day long our, uh, about our research uh, on different topics, uh, about researching young, researching um, activism, migrants. Um, talking about everyday geopolitics, geopolitization. We have talked about China in a more reflected way. And um, we have also talked about the kind of questions we are asking and kind of answers these questions lead to, our modes of uh, inquiry, the vocabularies we are using, or we should be using the lenses that we are, um, through which we are um, looking at the, the questions we are pursuing, whether or not they are productive, not productive, reductive. And um, what all of this foregrounds or sidelines, what we conceive as peace or violence, right or left, failure or success, violence and injustice, and what we might also, in, in um, unconscious ways, might be inscribing, writing into our research, maybe perpetuating uh, 
uh, unknowingly um, some of these um, problematic uh, processes. And to cite Piotr, uh, it is a challenge. Um, how do we show ideas and visions and which ones we show and which ones we, we give more space to? How do we balance um, the sense of urgency um, that this war heightens? before which it was the pandemic urgency, before that it was the climate crisis. I think we all forget about that. But how to balance the sense of urgency we have um, with our long-term commitment to matters of concerns of activists with whom we work, our interlocutors and our broader network, basically. So we have touched all uh, upon all of these issues and um, in, uh, in, in between different panels. So you might ask, why have a standalone panel that is entitled How to Study Ukraine and East Europe before and after war? Well, um, the reason is that we want to reflect, uh, continue the reflections that we have started, but we want to, we want to continue these reflections in a um, much more personal way, a critical way and, damn it, emotional way. And we want to reflect upon our research, but do that within the context of academic hierarchies, expectations. We want to reflect upon research in connection to identity politics, but also our identities and positionalities as researchers, also in connection to power inequalities. Some of the research we have spoke about um, has been there uh, before the war. Some of it has emerged um, in the wake of the war. But for sure, all of it has been affected, influenced by, by the ongoing um, aggression. So, let me sort my notes. These are really messy. It's my honor to be on this uh, stellar panel. And um, I'm joined today, tonight actually, by Tatiana Zhurjenko, Guzel Yusupova, and Tanya Richardson. Tanya, I, I hope you're still here with us. She was? Okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, we will talk about together, we will critically reflect about all of these things that I just, I just tried to sketch out in connection to borders, biases, and bees in times of war. Allow me to present a little bit more in detail my speakers. Tatiana Zhurchenko is researcher at Soyuz Berlin. Uh, since 2005, she has been teaching East European politics at the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna. She graduated in political economy and philosophy at the Karazin Kharkiv National University in Ukraine, where she also taught uh, as associate professor. Since 2002, Tat uh, Tatiana has continued her academic career in Austria. Her research focuses on memory politics, borders and borderland uh, identities, with a focus on Ukrainian-Russian borderlands, as well as gender politics, um, specifically in Ukraine, but also beyond that in the broader post-Soviet space. Um, how much do we hate that word, right? Okay. From 2014 to 2018, Tatiana was a research director of the Ukraine and Russia programs at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Tatiana, welcome. Guzel Yusupova is a research fellow at Scripps Cluster of Excellence at uh, Free University Berlin. Until uh, April this year, uh, she was a lecturer and senior researcher at Northwest Institute of Management, Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. Before that, she, was, uh, she had several research uh, fellowships and positions, uh, including at Durham University. Um, and uh, Lowborough University in the UK, as well as uh, Sweden and Austria. Her broader research interests include nationalism studies, sociology of ethnicity and equality, migration and Islam, Russian politics and society, qualitative and digital methodology. Guzel, a hearty welcome to you too as well. Tanya Richardson is an environmental anthropologist and associate professor at Wilfrid Laurier University, Canada. Uh, 
She has carried out ethnographic research about modern human practices and politics of placemaking in Ukraine, in the Danube Delta, along the Black Sea coast and in the Carpathian Mountains. Her recent publications attend to the force of water and sediments in disputes about shipping and irrigation infrastructure in shaping Delta residents' desire and ability to live amphibious lives and in the emergence of a herd of feral cattle. She is currently working on a multi-species ethnography of honeybee conservation in Ukraine. Tanya, we regret you're not here with us, but we still uh, are very happy that you can somehow be part of this panel. Uh, I myself, uh, Berlo Jaklu, uh, development practitioner turned uh, academic uh, researcher uh, at uh, SOIS. Uh, I study infrastructural processes, extractivism, and authoritarian governance and the role that China um, may or may not play therein. Tatiana, if that's okay, I would like to start with you. Um, how has the war challenged you and your research as a Ukrainian scholar of East European studies. Thank you, uh, Beryl, for this question, because I actually was going to start with the uh, notion of positionality. Um, in the 90s, when I still was based in Ukraine, the acquaintance with uh, feminist literature taught me the importance of reflecting on my social position as a, as a scholar, where I'm speaking from. And uh, in feminist uh, perspective, pos positionality means that uh, personal values, views, locations in time and space uh, influence how we see the world and how we reflect on the world. And it also means reflecting on scholars' uh, gender, race, and class privileged positions. And in the last half a year, um, being invited to events like that, I ask myself this question uh, more than more often than, than ever, actually. And the question. Am I speaking here as a Ukrainian scholar, as a member of SOIS, um, a Western research institution, or rather as a Ukrainian affected by the current events? And if yes, does it mean that my voice, my perspective is more legitimate or maybe less so because I cannot avoid being biased in this context? And what about... Um, my Ukrainian colleagues who don't have the privilege of being based in the West and whose experience of this war has been very different from mine. Yeah. Doesn't this make their voices more authentic, uh, hence more legitimate, or the other way around? So to simplify, I believe that it makes a difference speaking from a bomb shelter uh, Zoom or speaking from a cozy conference room um, and this is not just uh, about personal traumatic experience that some colleagues have experience of violence, destruction, losing home, flight, but it's just about trying to keep up uh, um, and keep cool, remain professional when your country is being destroyed on day-to-day -day basis. So I would like to emphasize here that my position is somehow in between being based in Austria for years and working now for a German academic institution. I'm privileged to be safe, yet at the same time uh, coping with what is happening now to my country is uh, the biggest professional challenge in my life. So one of the first issues I wanted to address is the issue that the war actually um, affected our, the accessibility of our research field. And um, uh, as a scholar doing, doing research on borders, I have seen many of them in our region being, uh, becoming harder to cross. Uh, and this is something we can talk about, but it's actually not about borders 
and about crossing borders, but about whole territories or countries getting less and less accessible. Think about Belarus, for example. Um, a Belarusian colleague based in the UK recently told me that it, it was her, her conscious choice uh, to avoid political engagement, to being able uh, to, to go to her country and doing research there. It's a kind of dilemma I'm sure many uh, of us know. Since 2014, I have to cope with the fact that as a Ukrainian scholar, I cannot go to Crimea, for example, unlike some of my Russian colleagues who are doing research there. And February this year actually brought this problem to a new level. Kharkiv, which is the site of my research for many years, is now a war zone, officially, uh, as scholars employed in a German institution, we are not uh, allowed to go to do research, uh, to do research, to do research uh, in Ukraine. Some of these uh, actually aspects of the situation are not new. So we know that that since the uh, beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, field work had has become very difficult. Crossing borders, even inside Europe, has become somehow difficult. And many of us face this problem of how to do field work during the lockdown. Additionally, growing bureaucratization of academic life, like ethical commissions, risk assessment procedures, data protection formalities, also have complicated access to the research field. Of course, we cannot totally dismiss the, the need in these procedures, but still, and of course, this is not the guilt of the academic institutions, which are under the pressure of governmental regulations. And yet we face uh, this uh, dilemma that, that um, there is an, an imperative, imperative of risk aversion. Uh, and at the same time, we are expected to deliver professional and timely expertise. And so we are left with difficult choices to go to the field as private persons or maybe involve like local scholars, local researchers, and this raises also the question uh, of double standards and hierarchies, because if this is not safe enough for us, still it's, um, um, it's safe for, for, for local uh, researchers, for our colleagues there. So this brings me to the next point, namely, uh, academic hierarchies and inequalities. This is not a new topic uh, for the academia, of course. We are socialized with, with the utopia of the international academia as a kind of republic of letters with equal rights of its citizens. But in fact, we know that academia is a bordered space. We talked about it today uh, in this section on migration. And it's a hierarchical space. And uh, in the last months, uh, I often observed that on panels, Ukrainians as victims of aggression were symbolically given the first word, but then the discussion continued just between the Western experts. And one, of course, can criticize certain hypocrisy behind this uh, pattern, but at the same time, there is still a question where are those Ukrainian experts who can talk in foreign languages about other topics than Ukraine? And this is, of course, part of a bigger question, who is entitled to study whom? And why Germany needs an expertise on post-Soviet societies, and Ukraine, it seems, does not need like first-hand research on European countries. So I think the war made somehow many of these questions obvious. And inequalities, or some would say imperial hierarchies, also exist in the field of Eastern European studies. Uh, and, and the Russian uh, poor in Ukraine made them especially visible. Like post-Soviet studies is first and foremost Russian studies. Um, and some would say that this is understandable because of Russia's political and economic weight and on the academic market until today, expertise on Russia offers better chances. But the problem is that the research perspective inherent in this... Uh, uh, the problem is the research perspective which is inherent 
inherent in this uncritical acceptance of Russia's priority. And I have observed since 2014 when Russia's centered uh, frames um, were applied to Ukraine, multiplying uh, semi-academic stereotypes about Ukrainian nationalism, Russian speakers as a minority group, divided society, failed state, you name it. So do we need more research on Ukraine? Certainly, especially now when the country undergoes such dramatic transformations. But to study the country in the state of war brings a lot of challenges from the difficulty of conducting sociological research in a society on the move to um, a country under martial law and with 25% territory being occupied to difficulties of studying certain topics like nationalism or far right, which play in the hands of Russian propaganda. Uh, so my last point, like two minutes. <laughs> okay, so my, my last point is actually, so despite all this, we, we have to continue somehow as, as experts and uh, my last point is actually about being an expert in times like that. Uh, what does it mean? Is it really different from normal times? <clears throat> and this is, uh, so as I have time, I have to drink some water. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so this was also my paradoxical experience of 2014. Uh, when you are expected uh, to be an expert um, and your expertise is needed badly, <laughs> exactly in this moment you kind of lose your distance to your topic. Yeah? And, and being an expert requires both distance uh, and proximity to the object of your research. So um, I can tell you when I was doing research in Russia back in 2013, I was based in Alexander Institute and I was going to Russia <clears throat> and it felt like a perfect combination of both proximity and distance. I spoke the language, I shared with the Russians the system of cultural references and, and the, the experience of Soviet socialization, but the Russian problems were not my, my problems. And it did not hurt me the same way um, as, as addressing these problems in the Ukrainian context. So in comparison, doing research on Ukraine always felt more than that, more than just a kind of professional activity, but some kind of mission, some kind of a mission, um, a devotion, I don't know, a moral duty. And I can confess that, that separating both has become more dif difficult since 2014 and almost impossible after February this year. Does it mean that Ukrainians are worse experts on Ukraine in times of war when Western scholars, uh, than Western scholars because they are inevitably biased and involved? Personally, I think being biased does not make you a worse scholar if you are able to reflect on your biases and ready, ready to, if you are aware and ready to reflect on them. And in this respect, I would like to address the question of emotions. Since February 22, many of us are overwhelmed by anger, grief, despair, and of course, hate, All, also, also um, we do not admit it publicly and we are, as experts, we are supposed to hide our emotions, especially negative emotions, we are supposed to stay cool, we are supposed to stay rational um, and distanced. And actually students nowadays, um, are taught how to do research on emotionally sensitive topics. So how to do research without avoiding like uh, being traumatized or to burn out. So emotions from this perspective is something uh, you can manage um, 
like anything else. And I did not have such a training. <laughs> and actually, I did not choose conflict studies for my research. It's like the war came to my research. And I was not at all prepared for this. And I think this is what actually happened to, to many of us. We did not uh, cho <laughs> choose to study the war. Yeah? The war happened to us. So do emotions affect our research? Um, we are supposed to leave them outside, of course, but how can we do it? And can we do it at all? So I was thinking about it, and I thought maybe we can transform them into something productive, like anger and outrage into the will to record and document what we uh, observe and grief and compassion, compassion into the ability to hear people's voices. Um, there were days uh, during this difficult half a year when I asked myself how long I can endure reading and writing on Ukraine, about Ukraine, like full time. And, um, but I also think that, that emotions, even negative ones, can help uh, and actually helped me to uh, become a kind of motor for keeping up doing research and, and writing. So, um, um, I don't know if, if this uh, kind of uh, rather personal and psychological comments uh, helped to open this discussion, um, but um, this is what I can offer at the moment. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much. Without, without commenting, I want to continue because if, if I start, I don't think I can pick my pieces together. So, Guzel. And I quote, Guzel says, the war provides an opportunity to reveal one's biases fully and to reflect about them at every stage of the project, starting from when formulates the questions and ending that making sure that readers are aware of it too. Guzel, can you tell us a bit about some of the toth and frustration processes that are behind this statement? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this conference and especially at this um, discussion. And uh, I also would like to thank you, Tatiana, for being brave um, to raising of such important issues. Uh, and um, um, despite the fact that uh, I actually can use the opportunity or luxury or opportunity of um, changing my identification to a Tatar who also suffered from uh, colonialism of Russians, uh, I am still a Russian citizen. And uh, in past six months, I reflected um, all, every day on... Um, Am I responsible? How I am responsible? What I could have done to um, uh, um, like to predict or to stop what is going on right now? And um, um, uh, what I came um, in the conclusion, I came that, um, and also maybe my, many of you also noticed that, uh, in the conclusion I came that maybe I should have um, done more um, um, research on inequalities and promote critical approaches. This was a was, uh, bottom line of my today's presentation until yesterday evening, until I talked to my, some of my colleagues during reception. But then I realized that actually my background of uh, my, my mix of my, my experience of being part of Western academia and more recently of being part of Russian academia mixed up in my mind and um, state of arts in Russian academia, Russian studies in Russia and state of art in uh, Western, um, Western academia on Russian studies are slightly different, but um, actually they still have something in common, especially in political science, in my view. Uh, in my view, there are... Uh, 
just a few uh, focuses that we are preoccupied because political science uh, dictates us to be preoccupied with uh, protests and elections and uh, quantitative methodology, uh, or maybe previous Sovietology now dictates us to, pre to be preoccupied with crim criminology, but um, ongoing war has shown us that um, actually society also matters and uh, complexity of the Russian society also matters. And um, this complexity, in my view, is under-researched and uh, I would like to go for, uh, and I also myself reflecting that I should have uh, and will be in the future, will be more focused on various inequalities that uh, um, constitute Russian society. Um, and we have suddenly realized that Russia is um, uh, ethnically and racially diverse only uh, after following the media discourse about uh, poor soldiers from ethnic regions who go to the war because, because of their poverty or because of uh, their uh, specific characteristics, depending on discourse, of course. Or when we started to evaluate how such sanctions would affect uh, Russian society, the response of ordinary Russians to the war, we suddenly realized that Russian society is highly hierarchical and deeply unequal economically. Uh, in my view, it wouldn't be less of a surprise if um, greater varieties of approaches and greater variety of research topics would be represented within uh, Russian studies and also post-Soviet studies more generally. Um, and the focus on criminology may be has taken us away from the significant aspects of Russian reality that shape uh, in my view, only visibly, uh, support for the war. And uh, here I would like to highlight uh, some important um, inequalities that remain uh, under research and uh, needs to be uh, researched more. I would like to start with ethnic and racial diversity because research on cultural diversity of the Russian Federation was um, in recent years, largely, largely, largely neglected or deemed unimportant, um, and also the dangerous of, of aspect of it also played role. Uh, it was easy to miss the slow turn of the government to nationalist or even imperialist ideas, uh, and critical approaches uh, to cultural diversity uh, would have pointed out this racist and nationalist discourses and practices that became widespread uh, so fast among the Russian population, uh, also arguably uh, widespread. Uh, but <clears throat> for example, the recent amendment to the Russian constitution highlighting the state-forming uh, character of ethnic Russians is only one step towards a nation, like towards the um, uh, construction of ethnic and racial hierarchies within uh, Russian society. There were also other steps that remained under-researched. The next is uh, regional and uh, otherwise special diversity associated with different types of um, economic developments. Also, this was uh, scrutinized comparatively well uh, by Alexander Lipman, for example. Its effect on other layers of inequality remained under research. And current discussion of various success of recruiting soldiers, um, Russian soldiers, depending on the region, associated within ethnic inequality as well. But there is so little reliable data for exploring this link further. And among other re reasons, in my view, this is due to lack of previous research on this uh, in this direction. And economic inequality and the mechanism of structure of the social structure reproduction um, are also under research in my view, uh, despite the fact that Russia is highly unequal and um, one of the most unequal uh, countries in the world. And this results that in that we do not have enough data, data to understand incentives for popular mobilization, pro-war mobilization and um, 
against uh, and mobilization against the regime uh, depending on the social status that you um, part of also we have enough statistics on people um, occupations and even dynamics of their income over time there is lack of uh, qualitative or archival research showing how social mobility works uh, in russia and how does it result in political attitudes also quite recently a few research uh, uh, have been done in this direction, but it's just the beginning in my view. And this is perhaps, this is why many observers were surprised by the fact that um, the strata that supports uh, the war <coughs> are actually uh, well off people. <coughs> Surprisingly so, uh, gender inequalities are best studied through the um, uh, perspective of um, um, critical studies through critical perspective, uh, <clears throat> but uh, as Marina Yusupova, um, uh, we are not sisters, but uh, we are both from Samara, uh, argues that intersection of these gender inequalities and uh, other inequalities are rarely taken into the focus of sociological research on the Russian society. And finally, uh, the recent research on economic inequality world war worldwide um, highlight that generation, generational divides are important um, due to larger role of capital accumulation resulting in reproduction and deepening economic inequalities today. And this is also true for Russian society uh, and not just in terms of um, effect on, of age on one's wealth, but also in terms of other types of capital, uh, including human capital and digital li literacy, if you like, as a part of it, which is arguably a crucial factor for predicting the public attitudes to the war. Um, overall, all these inequalities that I have mentioned, of course, were under scrutiny of some scholars of Russia, of course, there was some of research on it, even before the war, but they were um, hardly mainstream, and uh, some of them were even marginalized and as research topics. Um, and now, um, I think um, it's important to give more attention to these um, directions. It's also important, in my view, to legitimize critical approaches towards studying these inequalities, because unlike Latin America or African studies, critical voices in Russian studies are often uh, stigmatized as biased. And what um, Tatiana just told, and um, um, the current war doesn't give us a chance to sta stay unbiased, and we shall acknowledge that uh, more than ever. And uh, moreover, this marginalized place of critical approaches in Russian studies reveal, um, in my view, an other, another level and final level of inequality that I will be talking about. It's in a con econ um, academic inequality. When voices of researchers from the, uh, the and this perhaps I will be, w w was addressing more Russian academia than <coughs> Western academia that voices of researchers from capital to Russian capitals and focus on the fields, on two capitals as field sites um, uh, are disproportionately higher than those from Russian regions. Also, of course, protests in Russian regions still is very well researched topic. And also this creates uh, pause, and this also creates um, paucity in the academic literature in Russia and results in many blind spots. And I am aware that I'm being naive <laughs> raising, by raising these questions, uh, calling for broadening our perspective and so on, but uh, I still think that it's important to um, address these issues anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Guzel. Tanya. Tanya was conflicted between staying true to her long-term commitments to her research in the wake of the war. Can you reveal, Tanya, some of the deliberations in this regard? What happened to you? What happened to your research, your interlocutors, your honeybees and beekeepers? Thank you. Um, 
<clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation and thank you, um, Tanya and uh, Guzel. So good evening from Bessarabiaska, which is a Moldovan town a few kilometers from the border with Ukraine. Uh, both Tanya and Guzel have stressed the importance of uh, being explicit about one's positionality and speaking as an expert and in doing research. Uh, so I'd like to clarify mine. I speak today as a Canadian and British trained social anthropologist of Ukraine. My responses to the war are shaped by commitment to centering Ukrainian expertise and reinforcing Ukrainian sovereignty and by a professional uh, positionality that I would characterize as simultaneously privil privileged and peripheral. Privileged because I'm a tenured faculty member at a Canadian university and therefore have stable employment. Peripheral, both because my institution is renowned neither for anthropology nor Eastern European studies, and because the topics that I've researched have been on the margins of the fields in which I'm located. I also don't have the same pressure of metrics measurements that scholars in other countries or at elite institutions have. As Tanya indicated, being explicit about one's positionality has been central to the practice of anthropology since at least the 1980s, although with varying uh, significance and success. Um, and so it, is, it, it was actually really surprising for me to hear both uh, Tanya and Guzel stress the importance of this in, in, in the field. And I think as they've, they've kind of suggested in questions that I had about it is that because of the dominance of political science, uh, wedded to positive subjectivity? Is it because of regional or global scale colonial or imperial knowledge politics? After the Russian invasion, I faced the choice of whether to continue research on a project about honeybee conservation in Ukraine or switch to a topic more directly related to war. Um, and so I kind of like to use my experience of um, deliberating on this and um, my recent experiences doing field work with Moldovan um, Bridnisnrovian, Transcarpathian, and Canadian beekeepers to make a couple of points. So I wanted to stress the value, or I'd like to stress the value of continuing research uh, topics framed before the full-scale invasion, even if pursuing them has become more difficult and they are not immediately about war. Uh, second, I would like to advocate for leaving room in our work on the war for less spectacular and more everyday topics related to how people maintain relationships, including interspecies ones that make their lives and their livelihoods possible. So in, the, in 2018, I began research about Transcarpathian honeybee researchers and uh, honeybee queen breeders from Ukraine's Prokopovich Beekeeping Institute, whose task is to conserve Carpathian honeybees as a distinct and commercially viable breed. The loss of locally adapted honeybee populations and genetic diversity is one of the many causes of honeybee declines globally. And honeybee diversity is a concern in Ukraine, uh, a country that before the war was home to, numbers vary, but at least 100,000 beekeepers and was one of the world's largest exporters of honey. Ukraine's beekeeping law recognizes and calls for the conservation of three Aboriginal honeybee breeds, one of which is the Carpathian. Ukraine's Carpathian honeybees were formally identified as a distinct population in the 1960s as a result of collaboration between Transcarpathian animal technicians, Ukrainian and Russian researchers from Moscow's Timidazov Agricultural Academy, and Ukraine's honeybee research station. A state queen breeding farm was created from which bees were sent to apiaries in Russia, Kazakhstan, and elsewhere in Ukraine and the Soviet Union. This honeybee population is a transboundary one, and breeding has also been conducted in Romania, where Carpathian bees are also formally recognized in law. In 1989, Ukrainian researchers from the state farm became part of Ukraine's Prokopovich Institute. In the 90s, Ukrainian researchers created a novel selection program by adapting an approach from the United States to the distinct features of the bees and topography of the Carpathians that exist to this day. With no resources except for subsistence level salaries for decades, they've used their own private apiaries to fund the research and selection work required to preserve the bees. Markets for Carpathian queens in countries such as Moldova, Romania, Hungary, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Canada, and until February 24th, Russia, have thus enabled this population of bees to be conserved, and hundreds of queen breeders in Transcarpathia and thousands of beekeepers elsewhere to earn substantial incomes. 
something that's very difficult to do in rural areas in this region. One of the many goals of my uh, one of the goals of my research uh, was actually to make Ukrainian expertise visible to the world because while the bees may travel, the story of the decades of intellectual and physical lab human labor uh, that enabled them to exist or that enables them to exist is not. And that's particularly true when they move outside of Eastern Europe. So for the first month or so after February 24th, I did not think about research. Um, my focus was on using what I knew to educate my university community where I'm the only scholar who studies contemporary Ukraine and that we don't have other people who study contemporary Eastern Europe either, with the exception of the former Yugoslavia. To support you, and I also tried to support Ukrainian students and do what I could to support Ukrainian colleagues and friends who stayed in Ukraine who had to leave financially, practically, and morally. I tried to amplify the voice of Ukrainian experts, in my case, by organizing one of the first panels about the war's environmental impact at uh, the University of Toronto. When in mid April, I began to think about what research I should do during my upcoming long delayed sabbatical, I considered a couple of directions. As a Ukraine scholar, at first, my inclination was to do something about what was happening in Ukraine about the direct impacts of war. I considered a couple of issues, the impact of war on beekeepers who lost apiaries or access to them, the impact of war on protected areas and protected area staff, both of which related to my recent research. Such research would need to be virtual because as Tanya pointed out, Western universities don't allow field research in any part of Ukraine and, but then I came to realize that the colleagues that I would need to rely on to do this work and to put me into contact with people were overwhelmed with keeping their own work going while dealing with the stress of war. At the same time, I listened to panels where Ukrainian researchers gave their opinions about doing research in times of war. One was organized by the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies and featured Ukrainian ethnologists who study traumatic experiences of other wars. They warned of the potential harm caused by hastily, hastily conceived research and unprepared researchers. At another event, Ukrainian historian Galinada Galichenko, who left Kharkiv for Poland, said, don't make your scientific reputations on other people's pain. My discomfort burdening colleagues in Ukraine and cautionary words about the need for care and research in wartime trauma pushed me to think of ways to continue my project about Carpathian bees because there were ways to do this outside of Ukraine while remaining connected to the Ukrainians who were at the center of it. This corresponded with listening to a virtual conference organized by the Prokopovich Institute and the Foundation of Women Beekeepers about the challenges of beekeeping in wartime and writing a summary of it for the journal called Bee Culture. What stood out was the way in which honeybee scientists, queen breeders, and beekeepers kept going with their work in spite of losing access to labs and apiaries. And this led me to think about the importance of research that tracks what enables people to keep their work going. I chose to prioritize Moldova for a few reasons. First, it imports 100,000 queens from Ukraine each year and specifies in law that Carpathian bees should be used by beekeepers. Second, in November 2019, I visited some Moldovan beekeepers with Transcarpathian breeders and had a good contact uh, in the country. Lucky for me, um, this uh, couple, uh, highly respected and well-connected beekeepers, agreed to host me and I'm speaking to you from their home. Uh, they and others in Moldova play interesting roles in connecting Ukrainian and Romanian beekeepers, um, both of whom share this population of Carpathian bees because they're bilingual and familiar with beekeeping in both countries. Uh, the fact that Russian is widely spoken in Moldova is relevant as well, and I've been able to pivot without learning a new language or working as, with a translator. Thanks to my host, I was able to make a trip by bus to, with Moldovan, Pritnistrovian, and Transcarpathian beekeepers and queen breeders to the International Abimondia Beekeeping Conference in Istanbul. It was supposed to be held in Russia, but because of the invasion, it was switched to Istanbul. En route, 24 hours each way, I learned about the way a Pridnistrovian queen breeder cooperates with Moldovan and Ukrainian queen breeders, the ways in which they share bees and techniques, and witnessed the Ukrainian breeder advise the Pridnistrovian breeder on a particular detail that she was struggling with. In Istanbul, I had the chance to speak with some members of the Ukrainian de delegation. The words of a researcher from the Prokopovich Institute stood out. 
It is important for us to be here to show the world we exist, that we continue our work, that we make connections so that we can develop this sector in spite of and after the war. In the two and a half weeks I've been in Moldova, I've witnessed my host's role in enabling Transcarpathia breeders to expand the sale of their queens in Moldova this year to compensate for the loss of the Russian market. In May and June, the busiest time of the year, my host traveled twice a week to Chanel to meet buses from Chernivtsi, carrying queens, and then help distribute them to buyers. They then played the role of collecting the money from the Moldovan buyers over the course of the season, and last week made a trip to Transcarpathia to deliver the money to the breeders. While in Moldova, my hosts, uh, meanwhile in Moldova, my hosts are waging a battle against some other queen breeders who wish to change the country's beekeeping law to allow breeds other than the Carpathian to be imported and sold in Moldova. My presence as a foreign researcher knowledgeable about Carpathian bees may hopefully help them in making arguments against such a move. Uh, meanwhile, I've heard from my colleagues in Ukraine that they do want me to continue this research. And the fact that I'm based in Canada, where Carpathian bees are now being imported, enables me to both educate Canadian beekeepers about the history of the bees and their researchers, and funnel Canadian experiences uh, with the bees back to Ukrainian breeders. The spectacular violation of Ukrainian sovereignty, the massive scale of human displacement, and ecological and infrastructural ruin caused by the war have rightfully drawn the bulk of attention in panels and commentary about Russia's war on Ukraine. I do not wish to say that such issues should not be a central focus of researchers' attention. However, while 12 million people have been displaced in Ukraine, inside and outside the country, if the math is right, then that means that more than half the country's people remain in their villages and cities. And they're doing important work to keep economies, ecology, social relations, and political life going in ways that will facilitate reconstruction after the war. But they do need support to do so, support that is attentive to issues of equity and that does not deliver support only to leading sectors, leading institutions, and leading researchers. So to echo what uh, Tanya, and, and, uh, Tanya said, Ukrainian academic institutions in Ukraine need broad sectoral support, uh, support for individual Ukrainian scholars abroad is good, but more scholars remain in Ukraine. And with respect to support for scholarly institutions, I would emphasize the need to support smaller non-elite institutions. For example, Canadian Canada's Social Sciences and Humanities mm -hmm. Council on a large chunk of money to support scholars at two elite institutions in Kyiv, Kyiv Mohila Academy, Kiev School of Economics, institutions that many researchers are, are, many institutions are funneling money into. Meanwhile, other smaller institutions get nothing. So elite, uh, non-elite institutions and non-elite researchers have important roles to play in local economies and communities, such as the Prokopovich Institute that I've described. And um, while Ukrainian researchers, um, including uh, ones and poorly funded ones, like the Prokopovich Institute, have been creative in finding ways to keep their work going with little funding for decades, there are limits to what um, they can do so, and it's possible the war will be a kind of breaking point. The Ukrainians I met traveling to and at Apimondia said multiple times, life continues, and it's important that it does. Learning how it does and how to support it in different sectors in a more equitable way, attentive to issues of fair distribution, is an important topic for researchers and policymakers. Thank you. Tanya, thank you so much for this contribution yesterday. We didn't know if Tanya would be able to join us um, due to internet connections and um, if not I would have to read it and then I, I thought maybe I should just at least read it once and um, <laughs> that uh, culminated in a very emotional evening and to hear it again from your words is, is quite powerful and um, painful all the while. Um, I have a proposal, um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a fully fledged one, I think First of all, I also have to come clean about my uh, some of my position positionalities and hats because all of you have done rightfully so, and I have not. Um, and um, then I have I have a question, just one question. It might not have, um, yeah, one final answer. And then I would like to directly actually 
involve all of you in this conversation. This is a room full of people who work in and on um, East Europe, South Caucasus, Central Asia, have um, experienced um, or studied or experienced people who have experienced different wars, visible, um, some more um, invisible. If that's okay for you, that's as well. I accept alternative uh, proposals. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I um, am. I was born in Ankara to um, Cherkessian and um, Las grandparents. So from um, from today Georgia that were also that had to leave their homelands uh, a couple of years ago. Well, hundred some hundred years ago. Um, I <laughs> the same empire we're talking about. Yeah, and. Um, I came to uh, Central Asia when I was 11 years old, so I, I, I was also raised up in Bishkek. Uh, my connections both to Central Asia and South Caucasus um, go deep and far. And um, so, so that's that. I will leave it at that. But if, if you find me asking uh, some questions that are not directly related to uh, war in, in Ukraine, that's where I'm coming from because there are so many other wars we are unfortunately not um, talking about. Today is 117th day of resistance in the Pamirs, Gornavodakshan Autonomous Region. In Tajikistan, the people there are, um, they have to live with state uh, violence uh, day to day. But I will leave it at that. So that's that. So the question. <laughs> um, Guzel, in in your um, in your contribution, you were uh, you shared some of the some of the yeah tough conversations you you have had with yourself. Have you done enough? Did you live up to your responsibility? And um, I, I would like to uh, pick that up and turn into a, into a question. But I also was very relieved uh, hearing the way you talked about positionality and responsibility. And um, as Tanya says, the questions about. Um, impartial knowledges as being the only way of finding objective uh, objective knowledges and uh, situating knowledges and places and coming from places but not but not nowhere is is part of the process of standing up the claims we make because what is positionality it's about taking responsibility because what are these claims about claims are about people's lives so um thank you thank you very much for that and taking co-opting that reflection um and connecting to um uh, Ivan Krastev's comment yesterday that the only thing surprised him was how how surprised Europe was um have we have we done enough researchers, academia, have we asked uh, the wrong questions? Have we chased the wrong data sets? Um, I'm aware of the, of, of the nature of this question, right? But we have to start somewhere. And um, connected to that, how do we uh, compromise the, the sense of urgency and our commitments to researching places and peoples like drivers we were talking about you know that they're embodied geopolitics or about beekeepers how do we balance this out and how do we at the same time you know okay we are all biased but um refrain ourselves from becoming twitter analysts because we are all experts on twitter right um what are your thoughts <laughs> about this two-part classic researcher question Guzel, you want to start? <laughs> uh, yes, this is a very good question. Um, and also we have to balance between um, other aspects of our life, uh, right? To keep uh, hunting for jobs, for example, and uh, uh, also to be engaged in uh, like mainstream discussions in academia uh, uh, to show our ability. Uh, uh, so th th this is really very tough, but I think, um, and why I am staying, uh, being a social scholar, that uh, we have to acknowledge that we have some uh, freedom. Uh, we have to be entrepreneurial uh, to use freedom. Uh, we have to be entrepreneurial in... Um, 
um, positioning our que research questions, uh, I think. And also, when we do research, um, we also um, inevitably collect more, more data than um, we initially um, wanted. And we also can uh, approach this data from different per perspective again. Of course, it's also balancing time between life and work and many balancing on many levels. But uh, my answer would be um, to be as honest uh, as possible and to be entrepreneurial as possible in this balancing. Uh, like <laughs> I think uh, we, we are pushed to become entrepreneurs now in this neoliberal academia. We, we have to search more, do this, do that, but less money. So I think we are getting better and better at that. Tanya. I don't know, on the first part of your question, I think, of course now we can start like looking back and reflecting what somehow we could have done or, uh, as a collective subject, I don't know, or some of us in, in certain positions, right? What issues were somehow probably did not get enough attention, which stereotypes we did not fight uh, hard enough. What, um, yeah, I don't know, but I think you, it does not help because I, I don't think any kind of academic discussion or debate or I don't know, could have prevented what, what happened. I, I don't know. So I think we should not also, we should not underestimate our role because um, it's just, yeah, we, we cannot, we are just people like others caught in the middle of historical, um, Call it turbulence, to, call it tragedy, call it disaster, depends where you are in this um, situation. So I don't know, we should, I think, rather look forward instead of reflecting on uh, the past and talk about um, what should we do now and what, <laughs> yeah, what should be um, our response and I don't know, again, each of us institutionally, um, collectively, in the field, uh, in our research field, in our discipline. I don't know, what, what is left to us is, is just to, I think, not just, but this is what, what our profession is, is try to be honest and to think and to communicate even if Sometimes it's uncomfortable because you, yeah, because you have to cross certain mental boundaries to share positions with people who have different views. But this is, I think, what is, I don't know, it all sounds so trivial, I'm sorry. Tanya, do you have um, any initial answers or even more questions, deliberations, confusions? Yeah, I, I, the question of, 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 of urgency versus um, sort of continuities is the, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a really a, a resolvable one. I, I sort of, I, I kind of raised it because I kind of feel like in, in the panels that I've seen and in, including in my fields, it's, 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 kind of been centered on on crisis and presumably rightfully so but I and particularly in the first uh, months but um, and you know I guess it, it now this far in it's sort of it, it seems I feel like just my experiences have been um, you know in doing this 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 work um, make it seem important to not forget about this, these 
these everyday relations that that uh, that that work to sustain uh, to sustain folks and to you know bring those. I mean, some of those stories have been told, but the more mundane ones, right? Sort of the kind of livelihood-based ones, maybe um, maybe haven't, right? And 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 you know, drawing drawing attention to 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 some of them is sort of can then help with the looking forward uh, towards that, that that Tanya is 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 talking about. And I think I would put myself with Tanya in saying that, you know, when has social science ever been good at predicting? <laughs> like I, I I mean it hasn't usually, right? So um so um so I think I would say and analytically that effort should go maybe more to 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 thinking to asking questions about you know, you know how to how, how to respond in, in in the present, but you know I you know as a as an ethnographer who's focused not on not on um, not on protest or not on you know immediate politics, but on the everyday right. Um, I often feel like I don't really have much to contribute when in the crisis mode right so i think you know this i think this was kind of mentioned that there are you know different re kinds of researchers have different sorts of 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 skill sets and and abilities to uh to to take up certain questions and 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 problems and you know my position is just that leave leave room for some variety uh and leave space for different kinds of, of discussions about uh, what is going on, because it often seems that, you know, crisis kind of draws all the attention and, 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 and the, dis and the discussion and the, and the, and the focus of research. So attention to the, the other might be, is, can be productive site too. Thank you, Tanya. Um, from now on, I would say, no rules, except, of course, show respect and, co and compassion for, for one another. But um, I would like to really op open the space now for uh, questions of all sorts, uh, reflections, uh, experiences you want to share. Felix. Felix. Yeah, thank you very much to, to all four of you. I wanted to build on the last point that was made and the fact that we as social scientists are really good at predicting what happened once it had happened and explain afterwards why it needed to happen the way it did. But obviously in the moment itself, we are fairly useless. Um, and I asked that question because I think it brings us to a really difficult situation um, given where we are at the moment about the nature of academic knowledge and the position that we have as expert in as experts in that in that discourse, and I wonder how all four of you really um, kind of have been managing that demand for entrepreneurship of contributing to public and policy debate, and at the same time knowing that we as social scientists are really bad at predicting in the present moment of crisis um, when that expertise is, is demanded. And I'm asking that question because I think there's a certain threat to us who are involved in producing academic knowledge rather than producing policy recommendations in how we engage in that public discourse. And whilst on the one hand, there's obviously a certain desire and a justified need for us intervening and kind of enlightening to some extent political and public discourse, I'm always a bit worried when we go on um, radio and TV and so on that our authority as experts might become kind of a threat to the type of knowledge that we produce in the academy by being unvalidated two weeks after we had said something. And I was on, you know, the week of the Russian invasion, I was on Arte, and I said on Monday or Tuesday, they'll be extremely surprised if there were a full-scale attack on, on Ukraine. And man, how much I regret it, having been drawn into that statement on TV. And, and that's exactly what I meant. When you are in that situation, as an academic expert, you've got the authority but actually that is not the knowledge that we produce as researchers. That's not that we have authority over because our explanations are much more limited. Our scope is very narrow when we've got research questions, but, but still we want to yeah, contribute to that debate. So sorry for this rambling question, but also trying to kind of sort my mind in that regard. And I'd be very interested to know what all four of you, um, how you have been approaching that tension really that, that we all in 
Thank you. I think um, I think I, w I would like us to, if that's okay for you, actually uh, think about this question and try answer it, because then that might lead to new uh, questions in the in the public and the audience too. So, who would like to go first? I cannot abuse again my power, so. So I mm, totally understand what you mean because eight years ago, when uh, there was this crisis uh, around Crimea, and uh, I don't know, an Austrian journalist asked me, um, uh, "What is what is it going to happen now? Are Russians really going to annex Crimea?" And I said, it, "No, it's just I cannot imagine this." I, so my kind of interpretation was, okay, they will occupy Crimea, but then they will start like negotiating and bargaining with Ukraine, and so they would uh, try to keep Sevastopol forever, so to say, but then concede the rest. So this was my kind of naive um, thought, and since 2014, I learned that actually everything can happen, so in all these discussions, if the war will start or not, I was like always thinking about this experience and about our limited, I don't know, maybe Ivan Krastev cannot be surprised, but <laughs> um, yeah, um, I am not Ivan Krastev in this sense, so I, I try to keep low profile in, in such like big predictions or prognosis because, um, uh, yeah. I think history just can o easily overrun us as people. So we, we are limited in our kind of way to for f interpret things, for foresee things, and history just happens. And like the Soviet Union collapsed, it was more or less the same, nobody except for Ivan Krastev <laughs> I'm joking because uh, we are friends, so I... Hi, Ivan, if you're watching us. <laughs> Jose, would you like to? Uh, I am lucky. I am not so popular among journalists <laughs> uh, on my expertise, but uh, I have a big issue with related questions. Question because um, um, big issue with related issue. Um, I am pressed to give my expertise on will Russia disintegrate or not, and how it will disintegrate. And uh, I'm limited on it on so many levels. Um, first of all, I think the, any elaboration on it just contributes to the Putin propaganda and its success. Uh, even if I am, an, as an expert, uh, will comment on it. Um, like saying um, it will not, or saying anyway, it creates uh, in a, another vicious cycle of discussing of it. This is why I'm very hesitant to speak about it. Nevertheless, I gave one um, interview on this, uh, and uh, it took my all of my energy to speak about it peacefully and uh, maybe to change direction of this very um, question on, on positioning of this very question on um, um, telling the very reason why this question is dangerous that uh, this cultural diversity of Russia in my opinion is uh, considered as a threat to the it's uh, it's a legitimization of the threat to the uh, Russian unity, and it's therefore it's legitimization of the Putin's uh, power among the Russian population. Uh, and uh, I'm limited on the also as a Russian citizen. We are talking about this about positionality. I'm limited uh, on discussion of it because it's criminalized in Russia, and it calls for separatism is criminalized. And if I would be a, an ethnic Russian, it would be completely different if I will give uh, my in interview on this or expertise on this. But I am ethnic Tatar and I am perceived or categorized like ethnic Tatar. And uh, my my interview on this topic would be could be like uh, considered uh, very differently uh, uh, 
by many. And uh, I'm also limited on the way that uh, I grew up in a region that would suffer of this disintegration because it's between of two um, rival republics. So uh, when I think about it, it makes me also uncomfortable and uh, stressed uh, as an mm, mm, uh, even if, even if I have some expertise and some thoughts and reflections on it. So this is another side of the same coin, let's say. Mm -hmm. Tanya? So I, I, I'm a little, a little bit like uh, Guzel. I'm not super popular as the contact for, for media and commentary. There are quite a few people in uh, in in uh, in Canada who can do that commentary and I think the couple times that I've been asked to give media commentary I usually send them to political scientists <laughs> because what they what they're kind of the, the kind of the the information or the the kinds of questions that are asking are are not really my competence then they're, they're you know they're about you know national level um, issues or military kinds of issues and you know that's just you know, I might be, a, 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 you know, I might know a lot about Ukraine, but, um, but, but often what the what uh, what the media want on the on the on the issue of war is is not what I can say, right? On on the other hand, when you have multiple sort of areas of of expertise, so my early work was on Odessa. Now, then, the last ten years, I kind of been working in the field of environmental apology. So you kind of get the the effect that people want your your take on the old work that you've done. So I kind of got asked to write something kind of about Odessa, but you know, I felt uncomfortable doing that because it's not something I've, you know, even though I follow what has happened in Odessa and I didn't feel comfortable writing about it, not having been there, right? That's that's the authority, that's sort of for me as an, as an anthropologist, I'm not comfortable talking with authority if I haven't been there, if I haven't sort of spent time on the ground feeling what the place, what's happening. Like, you know, other anthropologists do, right? And, but for me, it, the authority comes from being there, being able to speak with some kind of authority. And, you know, that is, that is very limited now, right? So, um, so those are just a couple of thoughts on that. Thank you, Tanya. I will just make it very, Short, I see hands already, just very briefly. Um, I, I have the same uh, conundrum that you're mentioning, Tanya, but then do we not leave the platform uh, or a microphone for, for people who who don't know the regions, who don't go beyond capitals? You know, we also, through, through the standards that we set out for ourselves, you know, a minimum of 18 months, you know, name, you name it. But, and then you see, um, uh, yeah, desk analysts that that come and come in with predictions, and um, um, I think that's also that's also tricky. Um, in my case, Felix, well, uh, uh, after two years of economics, I I, I realize I'm going to fail uh, at being an economist as an orthodox one. So with that, I, I would also fail at the business of prediction. Um, and also, you know, the kind of talks I give, people usually ask, so where is the gold? Is China going to invade uh, Central Asia? Those kind of <laughs> things. <laughs> How are you going to predict these things? I mean, of course, now I know where the gold is. But the point is, I think our, I think our role in, in all of that is uh, to, you know, take the, take the caution, take the positions where we are coming from, where we are speaking from, the very long-term observations we have mean, and try to order the mess try to make sense of it and try to perhaps um, communicate across publics instead of um, giving, you know, yes and no questions and answers and stuff like that. Yeah, enough now, hands. Kerstin. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the panel and the, the great inputs or presentations. My question is, and maybe it's a little bit unfair to ask it in a room full of people who study Eastern, Eastern Europe, but since we were talking so much about being surprised as experts on, on Eastern Europe, I would like to raise the question of why we were surprised. So, um, and I only can speak for myself, I was also surprised by this in full-scale invasion, even though I had I always kind of in my work until that moment was 
kind of a little bit um, schizophrenic about my work with Russia and my um, activities in internationalization, which meant mostly uh, Russian-German cooperation. So, and I can look into my biography and kind of trace this naivety or this wishful thinking of Ro Russia going the, the correct way. But um, since we are here for a room full of diverse people, um, to some extent I would like to raise the question because I remember in the, um, before the war, the only person I was discussing about this invasion or the likeliness of this invasion and the only person who said that Russia is definitely going to invade was uh, people with the Russian citizenship um, with a diverse background. So he was the only one who was next to Ivan Krastyets not surprised. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you have an answer for this, and I think it's a long question, but I think I would be interested to, to hear your answers. Thanks. Yeah, well, I will take, thank you, Kerstin. One more question. There was a hand. Thank you. I'm Julie Willemsen from, from Norway. Um, I first had a, a comment to, uh, should we um, withdraw from the media scene? <laughs> Uh, and I, I think we, we shouldn't because we're living in a very politicized time and other people are really speaking in the mic and it, it means something for the politics which are made. Um, and I do think we can uh, be more strict with the journalists. I, at least I've started to be that and I think it works. We can say, I do not want to predict but then we can answer the, you know, and, and, and answer the question we want to answer. So that was just a comment for that. Um, and then uh, I, want, I had a question for Guzel. Um, because I uh, agree that in the study of um, Russia, we need critical perspectives and post-colonial perspective, but I'm also very acutely aware that we live in a time where um, phrases like decolonization are not only politicized, they are weaponized. Uh, and I study um, the North Caucasus also, uh, and uh, I was just at a, a conference where somebody showed me a picture of Dagestan and how uh, the Islamist insurgency, uh, not, which is now gone, or at least, you know, suppressed, now has reinvented itself <laughs> as a decolonizing force in Dagestan, and how Dagestan already is kind of split into different um, regions where they're organizing this, uh, this resistance in a very tangible way. So I'm, I'm afraid of that <laughs> when we are in a way pushing forward the decolonization um, discourse here uh, in Western acad academia. What are we in, uh, encouraging and what will be uh, the consequences? So I think that is something we need to really carefully balance now. So there are many just causes, but we're living in a time where those just causes very easily turn into uh, bloody conflict. Uh, so you might not get your right, <laughs> but you, um, you will at least maybe avoid war. And we need to think carefully about that. Um, before taking the last question, which is already has a name on it, uh, talking about balancing, I would like to balance some of the expectations towards my panelists. <laughs> these are uh, these are the last questions. They're big questions, so um, we will be able to tackle address some of them, and the rest uh, we can, you know, we have a place to go afterwards. Um, we can take it over there. So, you know, expectations management. Last question goes to Gwendolyn Zasa. All the expectations are large, but I just wanted to also add some personal reflections and it follows on from what Julie just said, because I'm, first of all, thank you because you've been so honest and there have been such personal remarks and they mustn't have been easy um, to formulate here this evening. So I haven't been part of public discussions like this, so thank you very much. Um, and I just wanted to, to add that I think everybody, every academic makes their own choices, obviously, how public they want to be in a crisis or in the midst of war. Um, and and that, that's fine like that. I just want to also share that 
I mean, we've got a because we think at Soyuz that we we are quite good at communicating research in such a situation. We get more attention, and we got more attention. And I personally did a lot of media work um, in the last few months. And actually, looking back, I'm not sure if it was always the right decision. But because it was also queries from media outlets that we don't normally communicate through, a lot of regional media, very also obscure media, but it highlighted to me the need for some sense of what's, to, some explanation of what's going on. So I don't think it's always about prediction. Unlike you, Felix, I was pushed into the uh, position on national television two days before the big invasion uh, with the last question. So do you think we can do anything to stop this war? And I found myself saying no. And then I was shocked by what I just said. And it was sort of the, oppos the opposite. No? So it's, uh, it, uh, it, was, it was equally horrible. Um, but then I think that there, was a, there is real demand. And I mean, who else can give some or an attempt to um, not predict what's going to happen next, but to, to put this in place for, for people who don't follow this at all. So I think that is, at least personally, I think that is the responsibility of researchers. And then it is what a few of you and us have said now. I think it's also, I mean, looking back, I mean, I, then on the one hand, I am surprised by how many people now say it was always clear that this had to happen, mostly people who never worked on Russia or Ukraine or the region. But then, the other way around, people seem to be very surprised by Ukraine's response. So that's equally surprising and needs correction. And so I think that's the stuff where we can, those are the questions where we can really add something. And of course it means, as you rightly say, and sometimes it works, sometimes often it does not work, one has to kind of try and open that space in the public debate and in, in the media for that. And, and get away from, I mean, how many times did I get the question, what's going on in Putin's head? I mean, that is, that, but then usually there is a possibility of saying, of course, I don't know, but what I really want to say is this. Yeah. So, um, but, so I think it's about sort of maybe trying to make some of these or create some of these spaces, but then, um, but, and also keep the attention on what's going on. So I think um, while the discussion is very quickly then moving on, I think in every national context outside Ukraine, sort of how does this affect us? <laughs> sort of to kind of keep the attention also on what, what's important. So I think we have the scope and each of us makes their own decisions, but, but I think there's both some problems, but also some responsibilities and chances we have to, at least in the moment, to correct certain things. Yeah, what's going on in Putin said so much about asking the right questions and interesting questions. But there have been asked some interesting questions. And um, dear panelists, whatever question and whichever part of it you want to answer, um, please go ahead. And uh, you may also use the opportunity to make a final statement or whatever you want to get um, off your chest. And then we will close. Maybe I start to... <laughs> <laughs> to be done. <coughs> so I think in the end it, it got really interesting, this discussion, and I almost felt like, wow, we needed this discussion a long time ago, also as a kind of self-help group, you know? Cathartic. <laughs> and it, it also felt almost like therapeutic for me to talk about these things with you, because in all these Zoom meetings, when we discussed like the our activities and so I often felt like I have to keep this facade, you know, as as I'm, yeah. Uh, but but what is inside me, I didn't know where to go with this. And of course, we we should not like turn our profession into self therapy, but um, sometimes we need it. So I think I just want to say thank you for this opportunity of this honest discussion. Um, and what else? Uh, uh, some very interesting issues were addressed here. And uh, on decolonization, I wanted to, to say I think it's a very important issue which will be with us for quite some time. In Ukraine, it's uh, like framing public discourse very much. And for me, it's like if you look back, like a couple of years back, it's, I mean, it was still like a, um, not a mainstream discourse, uh, this, this decolonization. So something has changed, and I think you are right, and we have to, to differentiate between, so what I define 
the need of critically approaching certain concepts and hierarchies and our stereotypes and uh, the discourse behind it differentiated from like waging culture war, uh, which it can sometimes it can happen, yeah. And in Ukraine, <clears throat> we have now very uh, um, now very kind of emotional discussion about the museum of Mikhail Bulgakov in Kiev. And in this discussion, you already see the, how things can go wrong. And um, so I stop here, I don't want to go into this direction. But um, why we were surprised? I think we were surprised because Russia acted irrationally, totally, for me, for, and I, I think for many of us, uh, Russia is losing so much in this conflict from it's like soft power in Europe, uh, something which uh, Kremlin built for, for many years, all these connections and, and groups um, uh, of like actors and, and of influence and um, not only that, but, but uh, still like in, in many countries, like the image that, that Moscow had, uh, even despite the, the annexation of Crimea and so on. So uh, I don't know, for me it was like totally rational and I think this, this and we as scholars, we are rational people, that's why we were surprised. Who is next? Yeah, I can be, uh, yeah. In my response, I will try to address everything. Maybe it will be chaotic, please forgive me. I am uh, also tired as we all, I guess. Uh, um, altogether, why I expected it, and it wasn't a surprise to me, it was a surprise for me that it wasn't surprised uh, it was a surprise to others, uh, and uh, it relates uh, to my research that I'm doing on minorities in Russia, I think, and it also relates uh, to why I think the critical approaches matters. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> three months before the war, I disappeared from Facebook, and only um, a day <laughs> before the war, I logged in and was uh, like running around, like why no one uh, is doing it, mm, like why we don't do anything about this? Because for me, it was so very clear that this will happen, and also I asked my colleagues, and I was no a little bit shocked that no, no like people do not react do not take it seriously this was, was my surprise and um, i think this is why um, because of my previous it was so obvious for me and also kind of irrational um, I, I saw that it is irrational decision in a way uh, if you consider the, this uh, internal politics uh, before the war and uh, um, for me even this current totaliz totalization of Russian uh, society it was uh, obvious long, a bit uh, longer before bec and I posted on Facebook about it and I didn't and I was didn't uh, get any comment or likes and maybe I was thinking uh, I was thought as a crazy lady because I did research on minorities in Russia who support uh, uh, minority languages and uh, this re repressive turn was so visible and uh, so terrifying, and uh, this turn on homogenization and nationalization and with a uh, really uh, um, to the ages, let's say, um, <clears throat> uh, was visible to me. And this is why, uh, because um, in response to this, my research, my presentations, all my worries about it, I got um, all um, very often responses, at least from my Russian colleagues, that um, in a way, of course, not direct responses, but I felt like I'm being accused in biases. I am like Tatar nationalist because I'm doing research on this languages and all this diversity and because I'm accusing um, like uh, 
society or maybe uh, government in this assimilationist politics, and it is no, it is clearly not because we see this diversity on the television and festival, folk festivals, uh, and so on. And this is why it's like I'm calling for this critical approaches. It's like my um, resistant reactions to, to the reactions to my research, let's say. Uh, and now I see that. Uh, kind of, uh, I was right, let's say, uh, I, I predicted this, uh, uh, I'm not, not that I predicted this, but I mean, um, now I see that um, this direction is uh, like correct, let's say, and it uh, should take more uh, attention from, from us and be legitimate, because I felt that, um, because of these responses, uh, I felt that it's less legitimate. But I absolutely agree that we should be very careful in this, with these ter terms and um, on decolonization and um, even post-colonialism, post uh, um, because it's highly weaponized. And I was hesitant to use these approaches before. But uh, now I think um, if you um, would be careful uh, in using them. They might bring uh, some useful perspectives. Mm -hmm. Thank um, I think decolonization, the colonial approaches, perspectives, talks, all of it, uh, successfully managed to jump scale. Um, it made it into mainstream, and now it's going through its colonization and cooptation. <laughs> Tanya, your last words. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, just just uh, since I sort of seem to have provoked a kind of like, oh, last scholars must be uh, publicly active uh, and, and engage in discourse, I was not saying that we shouldn't. And I just think that we should do it where we have ex expertise. And I felt like the ones, the times that I got asked to be on the media was about things that I really didn't have expertise about. And I did actually try to contribute at the level of my university in terms of giving interviews to student uh, radio and to student newspapers. So, you know, I was sort of working at that scale. And I think different scales of intervention are, are, are important. Um, and um, on the issue of, for example, you know, do you do you, sh you know, on the on the on the issue of Odessa, I mean, the thing was that actually there were a lot of journalists going to Odessa and writing about Odessa. They were there. I was not, so it didn't really seem to add anything to uh, to, uh, to for me to write uh, something sitting from far away. Um, I'd like to also add, uh, speak about the the piece about uh, decolonization and and decoloniality and 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 the sort of the profusion of of discourse uh, around that in Ukraine, the sort of explosion of public discourse around that. But again, I kind of want to draw back to Ukrainian expertise because there there are a young group, a dynamic group of art critics and uh, recently trained uh, PhDs who are well-versed in uh, decolonial theory and are using it in, in very interesting ways. And um, there have been a number of essa essays published um, in EFLUX, uh, an art criticism journal that, that in, in I think are very effective in using um, um, theory to analyze the, the current uh, situation. And so uh, again, I kind of draw draw attention back to Ukrainian analysts uh, who are who are um, really doing important intellectual work uh, on this and um, and not merely weaponizing it but using it as a critical analytical tool so I think I'll end there thank you Tanya um, for those of you who read the title of the panel how to and thought at the end of the session we would come out with a manual <laughs> and um, toolkit. Um, I'm sorry if we have disappointed you, maybe we confused you, and I think that's good. Now we have a lot of frictions with which we have to sit, live, and, and grow, I think. Um, so that was the one thing we knew when we started conversation about what, what are we going to do with this panel, that we are not going to give a how-to. But uh, we did not have any idea what we were going to talk about. I mean, we had many ideas, but where are we going to start? And then which issues, which, 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 which of those concerns 
um, anxieties, exigencies are we going to voice? Again, the choice of you know limited space and time and what are we going to talk about? And um, at the end of the day, um, I, I think uh, one one thing, the issue of honesty, maybe that that you know we got it right and op opened up a bit and talk about these things. Um, we are expected to, uh, yeah, keep a facade of, of uh, professional experts. We are all human uh, beings. We come from places. We go to places, and I think making these things more explicit and part of the research process w would make our research also more more interesting and honest in 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 some um, ways. And with that. Um, Thank you for actually coming alone, uh, Tanya, Tanya Kuzel, <laughs> and um, maybe at the beginning you didn't you didn't know what what does she want from us, but this is all I wanted really to open up these spaces because um, um, some of you had concerns. We are um, we will be speaking at a German academic institute. Are we? Should we? Are we? Should we not keep up? Should we not be professionals? And I said hell with it no just open up people have to hear these things these aspects and facets and thank you so much for for doing that um yeah uh, with that um thank you for, for all of you uh, that have stayed this has been a long day we uh, we all know that and those of um those of you who managed not to fall asleep online thank you so much as well we hope to see you next uh, year with us online hopefully uh, I have the very trivial task of finishing up the whole uh, conference, but uh, I will just say that uh, this has taken a lot of effort. Uh, all of my colleagues uh, have worked many, many months. Um, this is just me using the microphone, so thank you all. Um, but um, I also want to thank, with the power vested in my microphone right now, to thank for uh, thank to all the colleagues who have followed our work, uh, cooperated with us, uh, criticized us, and helped us grow. Um, hopefully, uh, you will be continuing to be on our side as we um, uh, co-think, co-labor some of these challenges. Uh, and age well and wise. Thank you very much. With that, have a wonderful evening, and the streaming will be ending in three, two, <laughs> one. Thank you so much.